Chapter One of With Her in Our Land. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Amelia Chesley. With Her in Our Land by Charlotte Perkins Gilman. Chapter One The Return. The three of us, all with set faces of high determination, sat close in the big biplane as we said goodbye to her land, and rose whirring from the level rock on that sheer edge. We went up first and made a wide circuit that my wife, Elidor, might have a view of her own beloved land to remember. How green and fair and flower-brightened it lay below us. The little cities, the thick dotted villages, the scattered hamlets and wide parks of grouped houses lay again beneath our eyes as when we three men had first set our astonished masculine gaze on this ultra-feminine land. Our long visit, the kind care and judicious education given us, even though under restraint, and our months of freedom and travel among them made it seem to me like leaving a second home. The beauty of the place was borne in upon me anew as I looked down on it. It was a garden, a great cultivated park, even to its wildest forested borders, and the cities were ornaments to the landscape, thinning out into delicate lace-like tracery of scattered buildings as they merged into the open country. Terry looked at it with set teeth. He was embittered through and through, and but for Elidor I could well imagine the kind of things he would have said. He only made this circuit at her request, as one who said, Oh, well, an hour or two more or less, it's over anyhow. Then the long gliding swoop as we descended to our sealed motorboat in the lake below. It was safe enough. Perhaps the savages had considered it some deadly witch work and avoided it. At any rate, save for some dents and scratches on the metal cover, it was unhurt. With some careful labor, Terry working with a feverish, joyful eagerness, we got the machine dissembled and packed away, pulled in the anchors, and with well-applied oiling, started the long-disused motor, and moved off toward the great river. Elidor's eyes were on the towering cliffs behind us. I gave her the glass, and as long as we were on the open water, her eyes dwelt lovingly on the high rocky border of her home. But when we shot under the arching gloom of the forest, she turned to me with a little sigh and a bright, steady smile. "'That's goodbye,' she said. Now it's all looking forward to the big new world, the real world, with you. Terry said very little. His heavy jaw was set. His eyes looked forward eagerly, determinedly. He was polite to Elidor, and not impolite to me, but he was not conversational. We made the trip as fast as was consistent with safety, faster sometimes, living on our canned food and bottled water, stopping for no fresh meat, shooting down the ever-widening river toward the coast. Elidor watched it all with eager, childlike interest. The freshness of mind of these Herland women concealed their intellectual power. I never quite got used to it. We are so used to seeing our learned men cold and solemn, holding themselves far above all the enthusiasm of youth, that it is hard for us to associate a high degree of wisdom and intellectual power with vivid interest in immediate events. Here was my wife from Wonderland, leaving all she had ever known, a lifetime of peace and happiness and work she loved, and a whole nation of friends, as far as she knew them, and starting out with me for a world which I frankly told her was full of many kinds of pain and evil. She was not afraid. It was not sheer ignorance of danger, either. I had tried hard to make her understand the troubles she would meet. Neither was it a complete absorption in me, far from it. In our storybooks we read always of young wives giving up all they have known and enjoyed for his sake. That was by no means Elidor's position. She loved me, that I knew, but by no means with that engrossing absorption so familiar to our novelists and their readers. Her attitude was that of some high ambassador sent on an important and dangerous mission. She represented her country, and that with a vital intensity we can hardly realize. She was to meet and learn a whole new world, and perhaps establish connections between it and her own dear land. As Terry held to his steering, grim and silent, 
that feverish eagerness in his eyes, and a curb on his usually ready tongue, Elidor would sit in the bow, leaning forward, chin on her hand, her eyes ahead, far ahead, down the long reaches of the winding stream, with an expression such as one could imagine on Columbus. She was glad to have me near her. I was not only her own, in a degree she herself did not yet realize, but I was her one link with the homeland. So I sat close, and we talked much of the things we saw, and more of what we were going to see. Her short, soft hair, curly in the moist air, rippling back from her bright face as we rushed along, gave the broad forehead and clear eyes a more courageous look than ever. That finely cut, mobile mouth was firmly set, though always ready to melt into a tender smile for me. Now, Van, my dear, she said one day, as we neared the coast town where we hoped to find a steamer, please don't worry about how all this is going to affect me. You have been drawing very hard pictures of your own land, and of the evil behavior of men, so that I shall not be disappointed or shocked too much. I won't be, dear. I understand that men are different from women. Must be. But I am convinced that it is better for the world to have both men and women than to have only one sex like us. We have done the best we could, we women, all alone. We have made a nice little safe, clean garden place and lived happily in it, but we have done nothing whatever for the rest of the world. We might as well not be there for all the good it does anyone else. The savages down below are just as savage for all our civilization. Now you, even if you were, as you say, driven by greed and sheer love of adventure and fighting, you have gone all over the world and civilized it. Not all, dear, I hastily put in. Not nearly all. There are ever so many savages left. Yes, I know that. I remember the maps and all the history and geography you have taught me. It was a never-ending source of surprise to me the way those Herland women understood and remembered. It must have been due to their entirely different system of education. There was very much less put into their minds from infancy up, and what was there seemed to grow there, to stay in place without effort. All the new facts we gave them they had promptly hung up in the right places, like arranging things in a large, well-planned, not overfilled closet, and they knew where to find them at once. I can readily see, she went on, that our pleasant collective economy is like that of bees and ants, and such co-mothers, and that a world of fathers does not work as smoothly as that. We have observed, of course, among animals, that the instincts of the male are different from those of the female, and that he likes to fight. But think of all you have done! That was what delighted Elidor. She was never tired of my stories of invention and discovery, of the new lands we had found, the mountain ranges crossed, the great oceans turned into highways, and all the wonders of art and science. She loved it, as did Desdemona the wild tales of her lover, but with more understanding. It must be nobler to have two, she would say, her eyes shining. We are only half a people. Of course we love each other and have advanced our own little country, but it is such a little one, and you have the world. We reached the coast in due time, and the town. It was not much of a town, dirty and squalid enough, with lazy half-breed inhabitants for the most part. But this I had carefully explained, and Elidor did not mind it, examining everything with kind, impartial eyes, as a teacher would examine the work of atypical children. Terry loved it. He greeted that slovenly, ill-built, idle place with ardor, and promptly left us to ourselves for the most part. There was no steamer. None had touched there for many months, they said. But there was a sailing vessel which undertook for sufficient payment to take us and our motorboat with its contents to a larger port. Terry and I had our belts with gold and notes. He had letters of credit, too, while Elidor had brought with her not only a supply of gold, but a little bag of rubies which I assured her would take us several times around the world, and more. The money system in her land was mainly paper, and their jewels while valued for decoration were not prized as ours are. They had some historic treasure chests, rivaling those of India, and she had been amply supplied. After some delay, we set sail. Terry walked the deck, more eager as the days passed. 
Elidor, I am sorry to say, proved a poor sailor, as was indeed to be expected, but made no fuss about her disabilities. I told her it was almost unescapable, unpleasant but not dangerous, so she stayed in her berth, or sat wrapped mummy fashion on the deck, and suffered in patience. Terry talked a little more when we were out of her hearing. Do you know they say there's a war in Europe, he told me. A war? A real one, or just the Balkans? A real one, they say. Germany and Austria against the rest of Europe, apparently. Began months ago, no news for a long time. Oh, well, it will be over before we reach home, I guess. Lucky for us, we are Americans. But I was worried for Elidor. I wanted the world, my world, to look its best in her eyes. If those women, alone and unaided, had worked out that pleasant, peaceful, comfortable civilization of theirs, with its practical sisterliness and friendliness all over the land, I was very anxious to show her that men had done at least as well, and in some ways better, men and women, that is, and here we had gotten up a war, a most undesirable spectacle for an international guest. There was a missionary on board, a thin, almost emaciated man of the Presbyterian denomination. He was a most earnest person and a great talker, naturally. Woe unto me, he would say, if I preach not this gospel. And he preached it in season and out of season. Elidor was profoundly interested. I tried to explain to her that he was an enthusiast of a rather rigid type, and that she must not judge Christianity too harshly by him. But she quite reassured me. Don't be afraid, my dear boy. I remember your outline of the various religions, all about how Christianity arose and spread, how it held together in one church for a long time and then divided and kept on dividing, naturally. And I remember about the religious wars and persecutions that you used to have in earlier ages. We had a good deal of trouble with religion in our first centuries, too, and for a long time people kept appearing with some sort of new one they had had revealed to them, just like yours. But we saw that all that was needed was a higher level of mentality and a clear understanding of the real laws, so we worked toward that. And as you know, we have been quite at peace as to our religion for some centuries. It's just part of us. That was the clearest way of putting it she had yet thought of. The Herland religion was like the manners of a true aristocrat, a thing unborn and inbred. It was the way they lived. They had so clear and quick a connection between conviction and action that it was well nigh impossible for them to know a thing and not do it. I suppose that was why, when we had told them about the noble teachings of Christianity, they had been so charmed taking it for granted that our behavior was equal to our belief. The Reverend Alexander Murdoch was more than pleased to talk with Elidor. Any man would be, of course. He was immensely curious about her, too, but even to impertinent questions, she presented an amiable but absolute impermeability. From what country do you come, Mrs. Jennings? He asked her one day in my hearing. He did not know I was within earshot, however. Elidor was never annoyed by questions, nor angry, nor confused. Where most people seem to think that there is no alternative but to answer correctly or to lie, she recognized an endless variety of things to say or not say. Sometimes she would look pleasantly at the inquirer with those deep, kind eyes of hers and ask, Why do you wish to know? Not sarcastically, not offensively at all, but as if she really wanted to know why they wanted to know. It was generally difficult for them to explain the cause of their curiosity, but if they did, if they said it was just interest, kindly human interest in her, she would thank them for the interest and ask if they felt it about everyone. If they said they did, she would say, still with her quiet gentleness, And is it customary, when one feels interested in a stranger, to ask them questions? I mean, is it a what, what you call a compliment? If so, I thank you heartily for the compliment. If they drove her, some people never will take a hint, she would remain always quite courteous and gentle, even praise them for their perseverance, but never say one word she did not choose to. And she did not choose to give to anyone news of her beloved country until such time 
as that country decided it should be done. The missionary was not difficult to handle. Did you not say that you were to preach the gospel to all nations, or all people, or something like that? she asked him. Do you find some nations easier to preach to than others, or is it the same gospel to all? He assured her that it was the same, but that he was naturally interested in all his hearers, and that it was often important to know something of their antecedents. This, she agreed, might be an advantage, and left it at that, asking him if he would let her see his Bible. Once he was embarked on that subject, she had only to listen and to steer the conversation, or rather the monologue. I told her I had overheard this bit of conversation, begging her pardon for listening, but she said she would greatly enjoy having me with her while he talked. I told her I doubted if he would talk as freely if there were three of us, and she suggested in that case that if I was interested, I was quite welcome to listen as far as she was concerned. Of course, I wasn't going to be an eavesdropper, even on a missionary trying to convert my wife, but I heard a good bit of their talk as I strolled about and sat with them sometimes. He let her read his precious, flexible Oxford Bible at times, giving her marked passages, and she read about a hundred times as much as he thought she could in a given time. It interested her immensely, and she questioned him eagerly about it. You call this the word of God? Yes, he replied solemnly. It is his revealed word. And everything it says is true? It is truth itself, divine truth, he answered. You do not mean that God wrote it. Oh, no. He revealed it to his servants. It is an inspired book. It was written by many people, was it not? Yes, many people, but the same word. And at different times? Oh, yes. The revelation was given at long intervals, the Old Testament to the Jews, the New Testament to us all. Elidor turned the pages reverently. She had a great respect for religion and for any sincere person. How old is the oldest part, she asked him. He told her as best he could, but he was not versed in the latest scholarship and had a genuine horror of the higher criticism. But I supplied a little information on the side when we were alone, telling her of the patchwork group of ancient legends which made up the first part, of the very human councils of men who had finally decided which of the ancient writings were inspired and which were not, of how the book of Job, the oldest of all, had only scraped in by one vote, and then, with a rather malicious relish, of that most colossal joke of all history, how the Song of Songs, that amorous, not to say salacious, ancient love lyric, had been embraced with the others and interpreted as a mystical, lofty outburst of devotion, with that black but comely light of love figuring as the church. Elidor was quite shocked. But Van, he ought to know that. You ought to tell him. Is it generally known? It is known to scholars, not to the public as a whole. But they still have it bound in with the others and think it is holy. When it isn't. Yes, I grinned, the joke is still going on. What have the scholars done about it? she asked. Oh, they have worked out their proof, shown up the thing, and let it go at that. Wasn't there any demand from the people who knew to have it taken out of the Bible? There isn't one edition of the Bible now printed in all the separate books, a whole shelf full of little ones instead of one big one. I should think that would be much better, she said. But the other one is still printed and sold? Printed and sold and given away by hundreds of thousands, with the joke going right on. She was puzzled. It was not so much the real outside things we did, which she found it hard to understand, but the different way our minds worked. In her land, if a thing like that had been discovered, the first effort of all their wisest students would have been to establish the facts. When they were sure about it, they would have then taken the rather shameful old thing out of its proud position among the sacred books at once. They would have publicly acknowledged their mistake, rectified it, and gone on. 
You'll have to be very patient with me, Van Dearest. It's going to take me a long time to get hold of your psychology. But I'll do my best. Her best was something amazing, and she would have come to her final conclusions far earlier, but for certain firm preconceptions that we were somehow better, nobler, than we were. The Reverend Murdoch kept at her pretty steadily. He started in at the beginning, giving her the full circumstantial account of the temptation, the fall, and the curse. She listened quietly with no hint in her calm face of what she might be thinking. But when he came to the punishment of the serpent, Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dost shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. She asked a question. Will you tell me, please, how did the serpent go before? Mr. Murdoch looked at her. He was reading in a deep, sorrowful voice, his mind full of the solemn purport of the great tragedy. What was his method of locomotion before he was cursed? asked Elidor. He laid down the book in some annoyance. It is believed that the serpent walked erect, that he stood like a man, that he was Satan himself, he replied. But it says... Now the serpent was more subtle than any of the beasts of the field, doesn't it? And the picture you showed me is of a snake in the tree. The picture is, as it were, allegorical, he replied. It is not reverent to question the divine account like this. She did not mind this note of censure, but asked further, As a matter of fact, do snakes eat dust, or is that allegorical too? How do you know which is allegorical and which is fact? Who decides? They had rather a stormy discussion on that point. At least the missionary was stormy. He was unable to reconcile Elidor's gentle courtesy with her singular lack of reverence for mere statements. But our theological discussions were summarily ended, and Elidor reduced to clinging to her birth by a severe storm. It was not a phenomenal hurricane by any means, but a steady lashing gale, which drove us far out of our course, and so damaged the vessel that we could do little but drive before the wind. There's a steamer, said Terry, on the third day of heavy weather, and as we watched the drift of smoke on the horizon, we found it was nearing us, and none too soon. By the time they were within hailing distance, our small vessel ran up signals of distress, for we were leaking heavily, and we were thankful to be taken off, even though the steamer a Swedish one, was bound for Europe instead of America. They gave us better accommodations than we had had on the other, and eagerly took on board our big motorboat and biplane. Too eagerly, I thought. Elidor was greatly interested in the larger ship, the big blonde men, and in their talk. I prepared her as well as I could. They had good maps of Europe, and I filled in her outlines of history as far as I was able, and told her of the war. Her horror at this was natural enough. We have always had war, Terry explained, ever since the world began. At least as far as history goes, we have had war. It is human nature. Human? asked Elidor. Yes, he said, human. Bad as it is, it is evidently human nature to do it. Nations advance, the race is improved by fighting. It is the law of nature. Since our departure from her land, Terry had rebounded like a rubber ball from all its influences. Even his love for Alima he was evidently striving to forget, with some success. As for the rest, he had never studied the country and its history as I had, nor accepted it like Jeff, and now he was treating it all as if it really was what he had often called it to me, a bad dream. He would keep his word in regard to telling nothing about it. That virtue was his at any rate. But in his glad reaction, his delighted return, a man in a world of men, he was now giving information to Elidor in his superior way, as if she was a totally ignorant stranger, and this war seemed almost to delight him. Yes, he repeated, you will have to accept life as it is, to make war is human activity. Are some of the soldiers women? she inquired. Women? Of course not. They're men, strong, brave men. 
Once in a while, some abnormal woman becomes a soldier, I believe. And in Dahomey, that's in Africa, one of the black tribes have women soldiers. But speaking generally, it is men, of course. Then why do you call it human nature? She persisted. If it was human, wouldn't they both do it? So he tried to explain that it was a human necessity, but it was done by the men because they could do it, and the women couldn't. But women are just as indispensable in their way. They give us the children, you know. Men cannot do that. To hear Terry talk, you would think he had never left home. Elidor listened to him with her grave, gentle smile. She always seemed to understand not only what one said, but all the background of sentiment and habit behind. Do you call bearing children human nature? she asked him. It's woman's nature, he answered. It's her work. Then why do you not call fighting man nature instead of human? Terry's conclusion of an argument with Elidor was the simple one of going somewhere else. So off he went to enjoy himself in the society of those sturdy Scandinavians, and we two sat together discussing war. To be continued. End of chapter one. Chapter two of With Her in Our Land. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Amelia Chesley. With Her in Our Land by Charlotte Perkins Gilman. Chapter 2. War. For a long time, my wife from Wonderland, as I love to call her, used to the utmost the high self-restraint taught by her religion, her education, the whole habit of her life. She knew that I should be grieved by her distresses, that I expected the new experiences would be painful to her, and was watching to give what aid and comfort I could. And further, she credited me with a racial sensitiveness and pride far beyond the facts. Here again was one of the differences between her exquisitely organized people and ours. With them, the majority of their interests in life were communal, their love and pride and ambition was almost wholly for the group. Even motherhood itself was viewed as social service and so fulfilled. They were all of them intimately acquainted with their whole history. That was part of their beautiful and easy educational system, with their whole country and with all its industries. The children of her land were taken to all parts of the country, shown all its arts and crafts, taught to honor its achievements and to appreciate its needs and difficulties. They grew up with a deep and vital social consciousness, which not one in a thousand of us could approach. This kind of thing does not show. We could not see it externally, any more than one could see a good housewife's intimate acquaintance with and pride in the last detail of her menage. Further, as our comments on their country had been almost wholly complimentary, they had not heard Terry's, we had not hurt this national pride, or if we had, they had never let us see it. Now, here was Elidor, daring traveler, leaving her world for mine, and finding herself not as we three had been, exiled into a wisely ordered, peaceful, and beautiful place, with the mothering care of that group of enlightened women, but as one alone in a world of which her first glimpse was of hideous war, as one who had never in her life seen worse evil than misunderstanding or accident, and not much of these, one to whom universal comfort and beauty was the race habit of a thousand years, the sight of Europe in its present condition was far more of a shock than even I had supposed. She thought that I felt as she did, I did feel badly and ashamed, but not a thousandth part as she would have felt the exposure of some fault in her land, not nearly as badly as she supposed. I was constantly learning from her to notice things among us which I had never seen before, and one of the most conspicuous of my new impressions was the realization of how slightly socialized we are. We are quite indifferent to public evils, for the most part, unless they touch us personally, 
which is as though the housewife was quite indifferent to having grease on the chairs, unless she happened to spoil her own dress with it. Even our reformers seem more like such a housewife, who should show great excitement over the greasy chairs, but none over the dusty floor, the grimy windows, the empty coal bin, the bad butter, or the lack of soap. Special evils rouse us, some of us, but as for a clean, sanitary, effortless housekeeping, we have not come to want it, most of us. But Elidor, lovely, considerate soul that she was, had not only the incessant shock of these new impressions to meet and bear, but was doing her noble best to spare my feelings by not showing hers. She could not bear to blame my sex, to blame my country, or at least my civilization, my world. She did not wish to cast a reproach on me. I was ashamed to a considerable degree. If a man has been living in the pleasant atmosphere of perfect housekeeping, such as I have mentioned, and is then precipitated suddenly into foul slovenliness, with noise, confusion, and ill will, he feels it more than if he had remained in such surroundings from the first. It was the ill will that counted most. Here again comes the psychic difference between the women of her land and us. People who grow up amid slang, profanity, obscenity, harsh contradiction and quarreling, do not particularly note or mind it. But one reared in an atmosphere of the most subtle understanding, gracious courtesy, and a loving use of language as an art, is very sharply impressed if someone says, Hold your jaw, you son of a plank! or even by a glowering roomful of silent haters. That's what was heavy on Elidor all the time, the atmosphere, the social atmosphere of suspicion, distrust, hatred, of ruthless self-aggrandizement and harsh scorn. There was a German officer on this ship. He tried to talk to Elidor at first merely because she was a woman and beautiful. She tried to talk to him merely because he was a human being and a member of a great nation. But I, watching, saw how soon the clear light of her mind brought out the salient characteristics of his, and of how, in spite of all her exalted philosophy, she turned shuddering away from him. We were overhauled by an English vessel before reaching our destination in Sweden, and all three of us were glad to be transferred because we could so reach home sooner. At least that was what we thought. The German officer was not glad, I might add. Elidor hailed the change with joy. She knew more about England than about the Scandinavian countries, and could speak the language. I think she thought it would be easier there. We were unable to get away as soon as we expected. Terry indeed determined to enlist, or to join the service in some way, and they were glad to use him and his aeroplane. This was not to be wondered at. If Terry had the defects of his qualities, he also had the qualities of his defects, and he did good work for the Allies. Elidor, rather unexpectedly, asked to stay a while. It is hard, she said, but we may not come again, perhaps, and I want to learn all I can. So we stayed, and Elidor learned. It did not take her long. She was a rapid reader and soon found the right books. She was a marvelous listener, and many were glad to talk to her and to show her things. We investigated in London, Manchester, Birmingham, were entertained in beautiful country places, went motoring up into Scotland and Ireland, visited Wales, and then, to my great surprise, she urged that we go to France. I want to see, to know, she said, to really know. I was worried about her. She had a hard-set fixity of expression. Her unfailing gentleness was too firm of surface, and she talked less and less with me about social conditions. We went to France. She visited hospitals, looking at those broken men, those maimed and blinded boys, and grew paler and harder daily. Day by day, she gathered in the new language, till soon she could talk with the people. Then we ran across Terry, scouting about with his machine, and Elidor asked to be taken up. She wanted to see a battlefield. I tried to dissuade her from this, fearing for her. Even her splendid health seemed shaken by all she had witnessed. But she said, 
It is my duty to see and know all I can. This is not, they tell me, exceptional, this war? Not at all, said Terry. It's only bigger than usual, as most things are now. Why, in all our history, there have only been about 300 years without war. She looked at him, her eyes widening, darkening. When was that, she said. After Jesus came? Terry laughed. Oh, no, he said. It wasn't any one time. It's 300 years here and there, scattering. So you see, war is really the normal condition of human life. So, she said, then I ought to see it. Take me up, please. He didn't want to, said it was dangerous, but it was very hard to say no to Elidor, and she had her way. She saw the battle lines of trenches. She saw the dead men. She saw and heard the men not dead, where there had been recent fighting. She saw the ruins, ruins everywhere. That night, she was like a woman of marble, cold, dumb, sitting still by the window where she could rest her eyes on the far stars. She treated me with a great poignant tenderness, as one would treat a beloved friend whose whole family had become lepers. We went back to England, and she spent the last weeks of our stay there finding out all she could about Belgium. That was the breaking point. She locked the door of her room, but I heard her sobbing her heart out. Elidor, who had never in all her splendid young life had an experience of pain, and whose consciousness was mainly social, we feel these horrors as happening to other people. She felt them as happening to herself. I broke the lock. I had to get to her. She would not speak, would not look at me, but buried her face in the pillow, shuddering away from me as if I, too, were a German. The great sobs tore her. It was, I suddenly felt, not like the facile tears of an ordinary woman, but like the utter breakdown of a strong man, and she was as ashamed of it. Then I had enough enlightenment to see some little relief for her, not from the weight of horrible new knowledge, but from the added burden of her self-restraint. I knelt beside her and got her into my arms, her head hidden on my shoulder. Dear, I said. Dear, I can't help the horror, but at least I can help you bear it, and you can let me try. You see, you're all alone here. I'm all you've got. You'll have to let it out somehow. Just say it all to me. She held me very close then, with a tense, frightened grip. I want, I want my mother, she sobbed. Elidor's mother was one of those wise women who sat in the temples and gave comfort and counsel when needed. They loved each other more than I, not seeing them always together, had understood. Yet her mother had counseled her going, had urged it for the sake of their land and its future. Mother, 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 she sobbed under her breath. Oh, Mother, help me bear it. There was no mother and no temple, only one man who loved her, and in that she seemed to find a little ease and slowly grew quieter. There is one thing we know more about than you do, I suggested. That is how to manage pain. You mustn't keep it to yourself. You must let it out. Let the others help bear it. That's good psychology, dear. It seems so unkind, she murmured. Oh, no, it's not unkind. It's just necessary. Bear ye one another's burdens, you know. Also, we have a nice proverb about marriage. It makes joy double and haveth trouble. Just pile it on me, dearest. That's what a husband is for. But how can I say to you the things I feel? It seems so rude so to reflect on your people, your civilization. I think you underrate two things, I suggested. One is that I'm a human creature, even if male. The other, that my visit to her land, my life with you, has had a deep effect on me. I see the awfulness of war as I never did before, and I can even see a little of how it must affect you. 
what I want you to do now is to relieve the pressure of feeling which is hurting so by putting it into words, letting it out. Say it all. Say the very worst. Say, this world is not civilized, not human. It is worse than the humble savagery below our mountains. Let it out, dear. I can stand it and you'll feel better. She lifted her head and drew a long, shuddering breath. I think you are right. There must be some relief. And here are you. Suddenly she threw her arms around me and held me close, close. You do love me. I can feel it. A little, a very little, like mother love. I am so grateful. She rested in my arms till the fierce tempest of pain had passed somewhat. And then we sat down close together, and she followed my advice, seeking to visualize, to put in words, to fully express the anguish which was upon her. You see, she began slowly, it is hard for me to do this because I hate to hurt you. You must care so, so horribly. Stop right there, dear, I told her. You overestimate my sensitiveness. What I feel is nothing at all to what you feel. I can see that. Remember that in our race traditions, war is a fine thing, a splendid thing. We have idealized war and the warrior through all our history. You have read a good deal of our history by now. She had, I knew, and she nodded her head sadly. Yes, it's practically all about war, she agreed. But I didn't... I couldn't visualize it. She closed her eyes and shrank back, but I went on steadily. So you see, this is not to us wholly a horror. It is just more horrible than other wars on account of the infamous behavior of some combatants and because we really are beginning to be civilized. Now this pain that you see is no greater than the same pain all the way back in history, always. And you are not being miserable about that, surely? No, she admitted. She wasn't. Very well, I hurried on. We, the human race, outside of her land, have been fighting one another for all the ages, and we are here yet. Some of these military enthusiasts say because of war. Some of the pacifists say in spite of it. And I'm beginning to agree with them. With you, Elidor... Through you, and because of you, and because of seeing what human life can be in your blessed country, I see things as I never did before. I'm growing. She smiled a little at that, and took my hand again. You are the most important ambassador that ever was, I continued. You are sent from your upland island, your little hidden heaven, to see our poor blind, bleeding world and carry news of it to your people. Perhaps that vast storehouse of mother love can help to set us straight at last. And you can't afford to feel our sorrow. You'd die of it. You must think and talk it off remorselessly to me. You amazing darling, she answered at last, drawing a deep breath. You are right, wholly right. I'm afraid I have a little underrated your wisdom. Forgive me. I forgave her fast enough, though I knew it was an impossible offense, and she began to free her mind. First, as to Christianity, she said. That gave me great hopes at first. Not the mythology, of course, but the spirit. And when the missionary man enlarged on the spread of Christianity and its countless benefits, I began to feel that here was a lovely thing it would do us good to know about, something very close to motherhood. Motherhood, always reverently spoken, was the highest, holiest word they knew in her land. But as I've read and talked and studied all these weeks, I do not find that Christianity has done one thing to stop war, or that Christian countries fight any less than heathen ones, rather more. Also, they fight among themselves. Christianity has not brought peace on earth, not at all. No, I admitted, it hasn't, but it tries to ameliorate, to heal and save. 
That seems to me simply foolish, she answered. If there is a house on fire, the only true way to check the destruction is to put the fire out. To sit about trying to heal burned skin and repair burned furniture is foolish especially when the repaired furniture serves as additional fuel for more fire i added you see it she exclaimed joyfully then why don't you but i see you are only one you alone cannot change it oh no i'm not alone in that i answered cheerfully there are plenty more who see it then why she began but checked herself and paused a little, continuing slowly. What I wish to get off my mind is this spectacle of measureless suffering which human beings are deliberately inflicting on one another. It would be hard enough to bear if the pain was unavoidable. That would be pure horror, and the eager rush to help. But here, there is not only horror, but a furious scorn, because they do not have to have it at all. You're quite right, my dear, I agreed. But how are you going to make them stop? That's what I have to find out, she answered gravely. I wish mother was here, and all the over-mothers. They would find a way. There must be a way. And you are right, I must not let myself be overcome by this. Put it this way, I suggested. Even if three-quarters of the world should be killed, there would be plenty left to refill as promptly as would be wise. You remember how quickly your country filled up? Yes, she said, and I must remember that it is the race progress that counts, not just being alive. Then, wringing her hands in sudden bitterness, she added, But this stops all progress. It is not merely that people are being killed. Half the world might die in an earthquake and not do this harm. It is the hating, I mind, more than the killing. The perversion of human faculty. It's not humanity dying. It's humanity going mad. She was shivering again, that black horror growing in her eyes. Gently, dear, gently, I told her. Humanity is a large proposition. You and I have a whole round world to visit. As soon as it is safe to travel. And in the meantime, I want to get you to my country as soon as possible. We are not at war. Our people are good-natured and friendly. I think you'll like us. It was not unnatural for an American in war-mad Europe to think of his own land with warm approval, nor for a husband to want his wife to appreciate his people and his country. You must tell me more about it, she said eagerly. I must read more, too, study more. I do not do justice to the difference, I am sure. I am judging the world only by Europe and see here, my darling, do you mind if we see the rest first? I want to know the world as far as I can, and as quickly as I can. I'm sure that if I study first for a while in England, they seem so familiar with all the world, that we might then go east instead of west and see the rest of it before we reach America. Leave the best to the last. Except for the danger of traveling, there seemed no great objection to this plan. I would rather have her make her brief tour and then return with me to my own dear country at the end than have her uneasy there and planning to push on. We went back to a quiet place in England where we could temporarily close our minds to the horror and Elidor, with unerring judgment, found an encyclopedic young historian with the teaching gift and engaged his services for a time. They had a series of maps from old blank terra incognita ones with its bounding ocean of ancient times, to the spread of accurate surveying, which now gives us the whole surface of the earth. She kissed the place where her homeland lay hidden, but that was when he was not looking. The rapid grasp she made at the whole framework of our history would have astonished anyone not acquainted with her land brains and her land methods of education. It did astonish the young historian. She by no means set herself to learn all that he wanted to teach her, on the contrary, she continually checked his flow of information, receiving only what she wanted to know. A very few good books on world evolution, geological, botanical, zoological, and ethnic, gave her the background she needed, 
and such a marvel of condensation as Winwood Reed's Martyrdom of Man supplied the outline of history. Her own clear, strong, uncrowded, and logical mind, with its child-fresh memory, saw, held, and related the facts she learned with no apparent effort. Presently, she had a distinct view of what we people have been up to on earth for the few ages of our occupancy. She had her estimate of time taken, and of the rate of our increased speed. I had never realized how long, how immeasurably long and slow, were the years before progress, so to speak, or the value of each great push of new invention. But she got them all clearly in place, and rigidly refusing to be again agonized by the ceaseless wars, she found eager joy in counting the upward steps of social evolution. This joy increased as the ages came nearer to our own. She became fascinated with the record of inventions and discoveries and their interrelative effects. Each great religion, as it entered, was noted, defined in its special power and weakness, and its consequences observed. She made certain map effects for herself, washing in the different areas with various colors according to the different religions and lapping them over where they had historically lapped, as, for instance, where the manana of the Spaniard marks the influence following Oriental invasion, and where Buddhism produces such and such effects according to its reception by Hindu, Chinese, or Japanese. I could spend a lifetime in these details, she eagerly explained again. But I'm only after enough to begin on. I must get them placed, so that I can understand what each nation is for, what they have done for one another and for the world, which of them are going on and how fast, which of them are stopping or sinking back, and why. It is profoundly interesting. Elidor's attitude vaguely nettled me just a little. In that earlier consciousness, I was really outgrowing so fast. She seemed like an enthusiastic young angel slumming. I resented a little this cheerful and relentless classification, just as poor persons resent being treated as cases. But I knew she was right, after all, and was more than delighted to have her so soon triumph over the terrible influence of the war. She did not, of course, wholly escape or forget it. Who could? But she successfully occupied her mind with other matters. It's so funny, she said to me. Here in all your history books, the whole burden of information is as to who fought who and when, and who reigned and when, especially when. Why are your historians so morbidly anxious about the exact date? Why, it's important, isn't it? I asked. From certain points of view, yes, but not in the least from that of the general student. The doctor wants to know at just what hour the fever rises or declines. He has to have his chart to study. But the public ought to know how fever is induced and how it is to be avoided. People in general ought to know the whole history of the world in general and what were the most important things that happened. And here the poor things are required to note and remember that this king came to the throne at such a date and died at such another. Facts of no historic importance whatever. And as to the wars and wars and wars and all these decisive battles of history... Elidor had the whole story so clearly envisaged now that she could speak of war without cringing. Why, that isn't history at all. Surely it's part of history, isn't it? I urged. Not even part of it. Go back to your doctor's chart, his history of the case. That history treats of the inception, development, success or failure of the disease he is treating to say that at 4.15 p.m. the patient climbed into another patient's bed and bit him is no part of that record of tuberculosis or cancer. It would be if it proved him delirious, wouldn't it? I suggested. Elidor lifted her head from the chart she was filling in and smiled enchantingly. Van, she said, I'm proud of you. That's splendid. It would then appear, she pursued, glancing over her papers, as if the patient had a sort of intermittent fever from the beginning, hot fits of rage and fury, 
when he is practically a lunatic, and cold fits, too, she cried eagerly, pursuing the illustration. Cold and weak, when he just lies helpless and cannot do anything. We agreed that as a figure of speech, this was pretty strong and clear, with its inevitable suggestion that we must study the origin of the disease, how to cure, and still better, prevent it. But there is a splendid record behind all that, she told me. I can't see that your historians have ever seen it clearly and consecutively. You evidently have not come to the place where all history has to be consciously revised for educational purposes. Ours is more complex than yours, isn't it? I offered. So many different nations and races, you know? But she smiled wisely and shook her head, quoting after her instructor, and history, with all her volumes vast, hath but one page. They all tell about the same things, she said. They all do the same things, and not one of them ever sees what really matters most, ever gives the history of the case correctly. I truly think, dear, that we could help you with your history. She had fully accepted the proposition I made that day when the horror so overthrew her, and now talked to me as freely as if I were one of her sisters. She talked about men as if I wasn't one, and about the world as if it was no more mine than hers. There was a strange exaltation, a wonderful companionship in this. I grew to see life as she saw it, more and more, and it was like rising from some tangled thorny thicket to take a bird's eye view of city and farmland, of continent and ocean. Life itself grew infinitely more interesting. I thought of that benighted drummer's joke, that life is just one damn thing after another, so widely accepted as voicing a general opinion. I thought of our pathetic virtues of courage, cheerfulness, patience, all so ridiculously wasted in facing troubles which need not be there at all. Elidor saw human life as a thing in the making, with human beings as the makers. We have always seemed to regard it as an affliction or blessing bestowed upon us by some exterior force. Studying, seeing, understanding with her, I grew insensibly to adopt her point of view, her scale of measurements, and her eager and limitless interest. So when we did set forth on our round-the-world trip to my home, we were both fairly well equipped for the rapid survey, which was all we planned for. To be continued. End of chapter two. Chapter three of With Her in Our Land. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. With Her in Our Land by Charlotte Perkins Gilman Chapter 3 A Journey of Inspection It was fortunate for Elidore's large purposes that her fat little bag of jewels contained more wealth than I had at first understood, and that there were some jewel-hungry millionaires left in the world. In India, we found native princes who were as much athirst for rubies and emeralds as ever were their hoarding ancestors, and who had comfortable piles of ancient gold wherewith to pay for them. We were easily able to fill snug belts with universally acceptable gold pieces, and to establish credit to carriers wherever there were banks. She was continually puzzled over our money values. Why do they want these so much? she demanded. Why are they willing to pay so much for them? Money, she understood well enough. They had their circulating medium in her land in earlier years, but it was used more as a simple method of keeping accounts than anything else, like tickets, and finally discontinued. They had so soon centralised their industries that the delay and inconvenience of measuring off every item of exchange in this everlasting system of tokens became useless to their practical minds. As an incentive to industry, it was not necessary. Motherhood was their incentive. When they had plenty of everything, it was free to all in such amounts as were desired. In scarcity, they divided. Their interest in life was in what they were doing, and what they were going to do. 
not in what they were to get. Our point of view puzzled her. I remember this matter coming up between Elidor and a solemn college professor, an economist, as we were creeping through the dangerous Mediterranean. She questioned and listened, saying nothing about her country. This we had long since found was the only safe way, for the instant demand, where is it, was what we did not propose to answer. But, having learned what she could from those she talked with, and sped searchingly through the books they offered her, she used to relieve her mind in two ways, by talking with me and by writing. I've simply got to, she told me. I'm writing a book. In fact, I'm writing two books. One is notes, quotations, facts and pictures. 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 This photography is a wonderful art. She had become quite a devotee of said art and was gathering material right and left to show her people. We'll have to go back and tell them, you know, she explained, and they'll be so interested. I shall have to go about lecturing as you men did. I wish you'd go about lecturing to us, I told her. We have more to learn than you have, of the really important matters in living. But I couldn't, you see, without quoting always from home. And then they'd want to know. They'd have a right to know, or else they wouldn't believe me. No, all I can do is to ask questions. To make suggestions, perhaps, here and there. Even to criticise a little, when I've learned a lot more, and if I'm very sure of my hearers. Meanwhile... I've got to talk it off to you, you poor boy, and just write. You shall read it if you want to, of course. Her notes were a study in themselves. Ships and shipping interested her at once, as something totally new, and her first access to encyclopedias had supplied background to what she had learned from people. She had set down, in the briefest possible manner, not mere loose data as to vessels and navigation, but an outlined history of the matter, arranged like a genealogical tree. There were the rude beginnings, log, raft, skin boat, basket boat, canoe, and the line of paddled or oared boats went on to the great carved war canoes with outriggers, the galleys of Romans and Norsemen, the delicate birch barks of our American Aborigines, and the neat manufactured ones on the market. A bare sentence covered it, and another the evolution of the sailing craft, then steam. Navigation is an exclusively masculine process, she noted. Always men, only men. Oared vessels of large size required slave labour, status of sailors still akin to slavery, rigid discipline, miserable accommodations, abusive language, and personal violence. To this, she added in parenthesis, same holds true of armies. Always men, only men. Similar status, but somewhat better provision for men, and more chance of promotion, owing to greater danger to officers. Continuing with ships, she noted, psychology, a high degree of comradeship, the habit of obedience, enforced. This doubtless accounts for large bodies of such indispensable men putting up with such wretched treatment. Obedience appears to dull and weaken the mind. Same with soldiers. Study further. Among officers, great personal gallantry, a most exalted sense of duty, as well as brutal and unjust treatment of inferiors. The captain, in especial, is so devoted to his concept of duty as sometimes prefers to go down with his ship to being saved without her. Why? What social service is there in being drowned? I learned this high devotion is found also in engineers and in pilots. Seems to be a product of extreme responsibility. Might be developed more widely by extending opportunity. She came to me with this, asking for more information on our political system of rotation in office. Is that why you do it? She asked eagerly. Not so much as to get the work done better as to make all the people, or at least most of them, Feel greater responsibility, a deeper sense of duty? I had never put it that way to myself, but I now agreed that that was the idea. That it must be. She was warmly interested. She said she knew she would love America. I felt sure she would. 
there was an able Egyptologist on board, a man well acquainted with ancient peoples, and he, with the outline she had so well laid down during her English studies, soon filled her mind with a particularly clear and full acquaintance with our first civilizations. Egypt, with its one river, Asia Minor, with the valley of the two rivers, and China, with its great rivers. She pored over her maps and asked careful, eager questions. The big, black-bearded professor was delighted with her interest and discoursed most instructively. I see, she said. I see. They came to places where the soil was rich and where there was plenty of water. It made agriculture possible, profitable, and then the surplus, and then the wonderful growth, of course. That German officer, who had made so strong and disagreeable an impression while we were on the Swedish ship, had been insistent, rudely insistent, on the advantages of difficulty and what he called discipline. He had maintained that the great races, the dominant races, came always from the north. This she had borne in mind, and now questioned her obliging preceptor with map outspread and dates at hand. For all those thousands of years, these Mediterranean and Oriental peoples held the world, were the world. Yes, absolutely. And what was up here? She pointed to the wide vacant spaces on the northern coasts. Savages, barbarians, wild, skin-clad, ferocious men, madam. Elidor made a little diagram, a vertical line with many ages marked across it. This is the year one. As far back as you can go, she explained, pointing to the mark at the bottom. And here we are, near the top. This is now. And these eastern peoples held the stage and did the work all the way up to here, did they? They certainly did, madam. And were these people in these northern lands there all the time, or did they happen afterward? They were there. We have the bones to prove it. Then if they were there, and as long as... And of the same stock, you tell me that all these various clans streamed out westward from a common source and became in time Persians, Hindus, Pelasgians, Etruscans and all the rest, as well as Celts, Slavs, Teutons? It's so held, roughly speaking. He resented a little her sweeping generalizations and condensations, but she had her own ends in view. And what did these northern tribes contribute to social progress during all this time? Practically nothing, he answered. Their arts were naturally limited by the rigours of the climate. The difficulties of maintaining existence prevented any higher developments. I see, I see, she nodded gravely. Then why is it, in the face of these facts, that some still persist in attributing progress to difficulties and cold weather? This professor, who was himself Italian, was quite willing to question this opinion. That theory, you will find, is quite generally confined to the people who live in the colder climates, he suggested. When Elidor discussed this with me, she went further. It seems as if, when people say, the world, they mean their own people, she commented. I've been reading history as written by the North European races. Perhaps when we get to Persia, India, China and Japan, it will be different. It was different. I had spent my own youth in the most isolated of modern nations, the one most ignorant of and indifferent to all the others, the one whose popular view of foreigners is based on the immigrant classes, and whose travelling rich consider Europe as a playground, a picture gallery, a museum, a place wherein to finish one's education. Being so reared, and associating with similarly minded persons, my early view of history was a great helter-skelter surging background to the clear, strong, glorious incidents of our own brief national career. While geography consisted of the vivid, large-scale familiar United States, and a globe otherwise covered with more or less nebulous maps, and such political evolution as I had in mind consisted of the irresistible development of our own institutions. All this, of course, was my youthful attitude. In later studies, I had added a considerable knowledge of general history, sociology and the like, but had never realised until now how remote all this was to me from the definite social values already solidly established in my mind. Now, associating with Elidor, dispassionate and impartial as a visiting angel, bringing to her studies of the world the triple freshness of view of one of different stock, 
different social development and different sex, I began to get a new perspective. To her, the world was one field of general advance. Her own country held the foreground in her mind, of course, but she had left it as definitely as if she came from Mars and was studying the rest of humanity in the mass. Her alien point of view, her previous complete ignorance, and that powerful, well-ordered mind she brought to bear on the new knowledge so rapidly amassed gave her advantages as an observer far beyond our best scientists. The one special and predominant distinction given to her studies by her supreme femininity was what gave me the most numerous, and I may say unpleasant, surprises. In my world studies, I had always assumed that humanity did thus, and so, but she was continually shearing through the tangled facts with her sharp distinction that this, and this phenomenon, was due to masculinity alone. But Elador, I protested, why do you say the male Scandinavians continually indulged in piracy, and... The male Spaniards practice terrible cruelties, and so on. It sounds so invidious, as if you were trying to make out a case against men. Why, I wouldn't do that for anything, she protested. I'm only trying to understand the facts. You don't mind when I say the male Phoenicians made great progress in navigation, or the male Greeks developed great intelligence, do you? That's different, I answered. They did do those things. Didn't they do the others too? Well, yes, they did them, of course, but why rub it in that they were exclusively males? But weren't they, dear? Really? Did the Norse women raid the coasts of England and France? Did the Spanish women cross the ocean and torture the poor Aztecs? They would have if they could, I protested. So would the Phoenician women and Grecian women in the other cases, wouldn't they? I hesitated. Now, my best beloved, she said, holding my hand in both hers and looking deep into my eyes. Please, oh please, don't mind. The facts are there, and they are immensely important. Think, dearest. We of her land have known no men, till now. We, alone in our tiny land, have worked out a happy, healthy life. Then you came, you wonderful three. Ah, you should realize the stir, the excitement, the great hope that it meant to us. We knew there was more world, but nothing about it. A new meant a vast new life to us. Now I come to see, to learn, for the sake of my country. Because, you see, some things we gathered from you made us a little afraid. Afraid for our children, you see. Perhaps it was better, after all, to live up there alone in ignorance, but in happiness, we thought. Now I've come to see, to learn, to really understand, if I can, so as to tell my people. You mustn't think I'm against men, dear. Why, if it were only for your sake, I would love them. And I'm sure, we were all sure at home, or at least most of us are, that two sexes working together must be better than one. Then I can see how, being two sexes, and having so much more complex a problem than ours, and having all kinds of countries to live in. How you got into difficulties we never knew. I'm making every allowance. I'm firm in my conviction of the superiority of the bisexual method. It must be best, or it would not have been evolved in all the higher animals. But, but you can't expect me to ignore facts. No, I couldn't. What troubled me most was that I, too, began to see facts, quite obvious facts, which I had never noticed before. Wherever men had been superior to women, we had proudly claimed it as a sex distinction. Wherever men had shown evil traits, not common to women, we had serenely treated them as race characteristics. So, although I did not enjoy it, I did not dispute any further Elidore's growing collection of facts. It was just as well not to. Facts are stubborn things. We visited a little in Tunis, Algiers, and Cairo, making quite an excursion in Egypt with our steamship acquaintance whose knowledge was invaluable to us. He translated inscriptions, showed us the more important discoveries, and gave condensed accounts of the vanished civilizations. Elidor was deeply impressed. To think that under one single city, here in Abydos, there are the remains of five separate cultures. Five! as different as can be. 
with a long time between, evidently, so that the ruins were forgotten, and a new people built a new city on the site of the old one. It's wonderful! Then she turned suddenly on Signor Armini. What did they die of? she demanded. Die of? Who, madam? Those cities, those civilizations. Why, they were conquered in war, doubtless. The inhabitants were put to the sword. Some carried away as slaves, perhaps, and the cities raised to the ground. By whom? she demanded. Who did it? Why, other peoples, other cultures from other cities? Do you mean other peoples, or just other men? she asked. He was puzzled. Why, the soldiers were men, of course, but war was made by one nation against another. Do you mean that the women of the other nations were the governing power and sent the men to fight? No, he did not mean that. And surely the children did not send them? Of course not. But people are men, women and children, aren't they? And only the adult men, about one-fifth of the population, made war? This he admitted perforce, and Elidor did not press the point further. But in these cities were all kinds of people, weren't there? Women and children as well as men? This was obvious also, and then she branched off a little. What made them want to conquer a city? Either fear, or revenge, or desire for plunder. Often is that. The ancient cities were the centres of production, of course. And he discoursed on the beautiful handicrafts of the past. The rich fabrics, the jewels and carved work, and varied treasures. Who made them? she asked. Slaves, for the most part, he answered. Men and women? Yes, men and women. I see, said Elidor. She saw more than she spoke of, even to me. In ancient Egypt she found much that pleased her in the power and place of historic womanhood. This satisfaction was short-lived as we went on eastward. With a few books, with eager questioning of such experts as we met, and what seemed to me an almost supernatural skill in eliciting valuable and apposite information from unexpected quarters, my lady from Herland continued to fill her mind and her notebooks. To me, who grew more and more to admire her, to reverence her, to tenderly love her as we travelled on together, there now appeared a change in her spirit, more alarming even than that produced by Europe's war. It was like the difference between the terror roused in one surrounded by lions and the loathing experienced in the presence of hideous reptiles, this not in the least at the people, but at certain lamentable social conditions. In visiting our world, she had been most unfortunately first met by the hot horrors of war. I had thought to calm her by the static nations, the older peoples sitting still among their ruins, richly draped in ancient and interesting histories. But a very different effect was produced. What she had read, while it prepared her to understand the sequence of affairs, had in no case given what she recognised as the really important events and their results. "'I'm writing a little history of the world,' she told me, with a restrained smile. "'Just a little one,' so that I can have something definite to show them. But how can you, dearest, in this time with what data you have? I know you are wonderful, but a history of the world? Only a little one, she answered, just a synopsis. You know we are used to condensing and simplifying for our children. I suppose that is where we get the grasp of salient features you have spoken of so often. These historians I read now certainly do not have it. She continued tender to me, more so, if anything. Of two things we talked with pleasure, of her land and my land, and always of the beauty of nature. This seemed to her a ceaseless source of strength and comfort. It's the same world, she said, as we leaned side by side on the rail at the stern and watched the white wake run uncoiling away from us, all silver shining under the round moon. The same sky, the same stars, some of them the same blessed sun and moon, and the dear grass, and the trees, the precious trees. Being by profession a forester, it was inevitable that she should notice trees. And in Europe, she found much to admire, though lamenting the scarcity of food-bearing varieties. 
in northern Africa, she had noted the value of the palm, the olive, and others, and had readily understood the whole system of irrigation and its enormous benefits. What she did not easily grasp was its disuse and the immeasurable futility of the fellahin, still using the shadoof after all these ages of progress. I don't see yet, she admitted, what makes their minds so, so impervious? It can't be because they're men, surely. Men are not duller than women, are they, dear? Indeed they are not, I cried, rather stung by this new suggestion. Men are the progressive sex, the thinkers, the innovators. It is the women who are conservative and slow. Even you will have to admit that. I certainly will if I find it so, she answered cheerfully. I can see that these women are dull enough, but then, if they do things differently, there are penalties, aren't there? Penalties? Why, yes. If the women innovate and rebel, the least that happens to them is that the men won't marry them. Isn't that so? I shouldn't think you would call that a penalty, my dear, I answered. Oh, yes, it is. It means extinction. The end of that variety of woman. You seem to have quite successfully checked mutation in women, and they had neither education, opportunity, or encouragement in other variation. Don't say you, I urged. These are the women of the Orient you are talking about, not all of the world. Everybody knows that their position is pitiful and a great check to progress. Wait till you see my country. I shall be glad to get there, dearest, I'm sure of that, she told me. But as to these more progressive men amongst the Egyptians, there was no penalty for improving on the shadoof, was there? Or the method of threshing grain by the feet of cattle? Then I explained, trying to show no irritation, that there was a difference in the progressiveness of nations, of various races, but that other things being equal, the men were, as a rule, more progressive than the women. Where are the other things equal, then? I had to laugh at that. She was a very difficult person to argue with. But I told her they were pretty near equal in our United States, and that we thought our women fully as good as men, and a little better. She was comforted for a while, but as we went on into Asia, her spirit sank and darkened, and that change I spoke of became apparent. Burma was something of a comfort, and that surviving matriarchate in the island hills. But in our rather extended visit to India, guided and informed by both English and native friends, and supplied with further literature, she began to suffer deeply. We had the rare good fortune to be allowed to accompany a scientific expedition up through the wonder of the Himalayas, through Tibet and into China. Here, that high sweet spirit drooped and shrunk with a growing horror, a loathing, such as I had never seen before in her clear eyes. She was shocked beyond words at the vast area of dead country, skeleton country, deforested, deshrubbed, degrassed, wasted to the bone, lying there to burn in the sun and drown in the rain, feeding no one. Van, Van, she said, help me to forget the women a little and talk about the land. Help me to understand the the holes in the minds of people. Here is intelligence, intellect, a high cultural development of sorts. They have beautiful art in some lines. They have an extensive literature. They are old, very old, surely old enough to have learned more than any other people. And yet here is proof that they have never mastered the simple and obvious facts of how to take care of the land on which they live. But they still live on it, don't they? Yes, they live on it. But they live on it like swarming fleas on an emaciated kitten, rather than careful farmers on a well-cultivated ground. However, she brightened a little, there's one thing. This horrible instance of a misused, devastated land must have been of one great service. It must have served as an object lesson to all the rest of the world where such an old and wise nation has made so dreadful a mistake, for so long at least no other nation need to make it. I did not answer as fully and cheerfully as she wished, and she pressed me further. The world has learned how to save its trees, its soil, its beauty, its fertility, hasn't it? Of course, what I've seen is not all. It's better in other places. We did not go to Germany, you know, my dear, 
They have a high degree of skill in forestry there. In many countries it is now highly thought of. We are taking steps to preserve our own forests, though so far they are so extensive that we rather forgot there was any end to them. It will be good to get there, Van. And she squeezed my hand hard. I must see it all. I must know the worst, and surely I am getting the worst first. But you have free education. You have every advantage of climate. You have a mixture of the best blood on earth, of the best traditions, and you are brave and free and willing to learn. Oh, Van, I am so glad it was America that found us. I held her close and kissed her. I was glad too. And I was proud clear through to have her speak so of us. Yet still, I was not as perfectly comfortable about it as I had been at first. She had read about the foot-binding process, still common in so large a part of China, but somehow had supposed it was a thing of the past, and never general. Also, I fancy she had deliberately kept it out of her mind, as something impossible to imagine. Now she saw it. For days and days, as we travelled through the less-known parts of the great country, she saw the crippled women. Not merely those serenely installed in rich gardens and lovely rooms with big-footed slaves to do their bidding, or borne in swaying litters by strong coolies, but poor women, working women, toiling in the field, carrying their little mats to kneel on while they worked, because their feet were helpless, aching pegs. Presently, while we waited in a village, and were entertained by a local magnate who had business relations with one of our guides, Elidor was in the women's apartment and she heard it, the agony of the bound feet of a child. The child was promptly hushed, struck, and chided, made to keep quiet. But Elidor had heard its moaning. From a woman missionary she got details of the process, and was shown the poor little shrunken stumps. That night, she would not let me touch her, come near her. She lay silent, staring with set eyes, long shudders running over her from time to time. When it came to speech, which was some days later, she could still but faintly express it. To think, she said slowly, that there are on earth men who can do a thing like that to women, to little helpless children. But their men don't do it, dearest, I urged. It is the women, their own mothers, who bind the feet of the little ones. They are afraid to have them grow up big-footed women. Afraid of what? asked Elidor, that shudder passing over her again. End of chapter 3 Recording by Kate M Chapter 4 of With Her in Our Land this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. With Her in Our Land by Charlotte Perkins Gilman Chapter 4 Nearing Home We stayed some little time in China, meeting most interesting and valuable people, missionaries teachers diplomats merchants some of them the educated english-speaking chinese elidor's insatiable interest her exquisite courtesy and talent as a listener made anyone willing to talk to her she learned fast and placed in that wide sunlit mind of hers each fact in due relation I'm beginning to understand, she told me sweetly, that I mustn't judge this miscellaneous world of yours as I do my country. We were just ourselves, an isolated, homogeneous people. When we moved, we all moved together. You're all kinds of people, in all kinds of places, touching at the edges and getting mixed. And so far from moving on together, there are no two nations exactly abreast that I can see, and they mostly are ages apart, some away ahead of the others, some going far faster than others, some stationary. Yes, I told her, and in the still numerous savages we find the beginners and the backsliders, the hopeless backsliders in human progress. I see, I see, she said reflectively. When you say the civilized world, that is just a figure of speech. The world is not civilized yet. Only spots in it, and those not wholly. 
That's about it, I agreed with her. Of course, the civilized nations think of themselves as the world. That's natural. How does it compare in numbers, she inquired. Let's look. So we consulted the statistics on the population of the earth, chasing through pages of classification difficult to sift, until we hit upon a little table. Population of the earth according to race. That ought to do, roughly speaking, I told her. We'll call the white races civilized, and lump the others. Let's see how it comes out. It came out that the total of Indo-Germanic or Aryan white for Europe, America, Persia, India, and Australia was 775 million, and the rest of the world, black, red, brown, and yellow, was 788 million. Do you mean that the majority of mankind is still uncivilized? She asked. She didn't ask it unpleasantly. Elador was never sarcastic or bitter, but the world was her oyster to study, and she was quite impartial. I, however, felt reproached by this cool estimate. No, indeed, I said. You can't call China uncivilized. It is one of the very oldest civilizations we have. This is only by race, you see, by color. Oh, yes, she agreed. And race or color do not count in civilization? Of course not. How stupid I was. But I laid down the pencil I was using to total our populations and looking at her with a new and grave misgiving. She was so world innocent. Even the history she had so swiftly absorbed had not changed her, any more than indecent novels affect a child. The child does not know the meaning of the words. In the light of Elador's colossal innocence of what we are accustomed to call life, I began to see the process in a wholly new perspective. Her country was but one. Her civilization was one and indivisible. In her country, the women and children lived as mothers, daughters, sisters, in general tolerance love, education, and service. Out of that nursery, school, garden, shop, and parlor, she came into this great scrambling world of ours, to find it spotted over with dissimilar peoples, more separated by their varying psychology than by geography, politics, or race, often ignorant of one another, often fearing, despising, hating one another, and each national group, each racial stock, assuming itself to be the norm by which to measure others. She had first to recognize the facts and then to disentangle the causes, the long lines of historic evolution which had led to these results. Even then, it was hard for her really to grasp the goals which divide one part of the human race from the others. And now I had the unpleasant task of disabusing her of this last glad assumption that race and color made no difference. Dear, I said slowly, you must prepare your mind for another shock though you must have got some of it already, here and there. Race and color make all the difference in the world. People dislike and despise one another on exactly that ground. Difference in race and color. These millions who are here marked Aryan or white include Persians and Hindus, yet the other white races are reversed to intermarrying with these, whose skins are indeed much darker than ours, though they come of the same stock. Is the aversion mutual? she asked, as calmly as if we had been discussing insects. I assured her that, speaking generally it was, that the flatter-faced Mongolians regarded us as hawk-like in our aquiline features, and that little African children fled screaming from the unnatural horror of a first-seen white face. But what I was thinking about was how I should explain to her the race prejudice in my own country when she reached it. I felt like a housekeeper bringing home company, discovering that the company has far higher and more exacting standards than herself, and longing to get home first and set the house in order before inspection. We spent some little time in Japan, Elador enjoying the fairy beauty of the country, with its flower-worshipping, sunny-faced people, and the plump, happy children everywhere. But instead of being content with the artistic beauty of the place, with which their life is covered, she followed her usual course of penetrating investigation. It needed no years of study, no dreary tables of figures. With what she already knew, so clearly held in her mind, with a few questions each loaded with implications, she soon grasped the salient facts of Japanese civilization. Its conspicuous virtues gave her instant joy. The high honor of the samurai the unlimited patriotism of the people in general, the exquisite politeness, and the sincere love of beauty, nature, and art. These were all comforting, and the free-fitted women also, after the golden lilies of China. 
but presently piercing below all these she found the general poverty of the people their helplessness under a new and hard-grinding commercialism and the patient ignominy in which the women lived how is it dear she asked me that these keenly intelligent people fail to see that such limited women cannot produce a nobler race i could only say that it was a universal failing common to all races except ours of course her face always lighted when we spoke of america you don't know how i look forward to it dear she said after this painful introduction to the world i knew so little of i am so glad we came this way saving the best to the last the nearer we came to america and the more eagerly she spoke of it the more my vague uneasiness increased i began to think of things i had never before been sensitive about and to seek for justification meanwhile elador was accumulating heartache over the japanese women whose dual duty of childbearing and manservice dominated all their lives it is so hard for me to understand van they aren't people at all somehow just wives or worse their mothers surely i urged no not in our sense not consciously look at this ghastly crowding here's a little country easy to grasp and manage capable of supporting about so many people not more and here they are making a saturated solution of themselves she had picked up that phrase from one of her medical friends a vigorous young man who told her much that she was eager to know about the health and physical development of the japanese can't they see that there are too many she went on if a people increases beyond its means of support it has to endure miserable poverty uh, what is that the germans demand expansion they have to have somebody else's country how strangely dull they are but my dear girl please remember that this is life i told her this is the world this is the way people live you expect too much of them it is a law of nature to increase and multiply of course malthus set up a terrified cry about overpopulating the earth but it has not come to that yet not near our means of subsistence increase with the advance of science as to the world i can see that but as to a given country and especially a smaller one as this what does become of them she asked suddenly this started her on a rapid study of emigration in which fortunately my own knowledge was of some use and she eagerly gathered up and arranged in her mind that feature of our history on which hangs so much the migration and emigration of peoples she saw at once how when most of the earth's surface was unoccupied people moved freely about in search of the best hunting or pasturage how in an agricultural system they settled and spread widening with the increase of population However, since they met and touched each nation, limited by its neighbors, there had been the double result of overcrowding inside the national limits and warfare in the interests of expansion. I can see now the wonderful advantage you have, she said eagerly. Humanity got its second wind with the discovery of the new world, didn't it? It always delighted me to note the speed and correctness with which she picked up idioms and bits of slang. They were a novelty to her, and a constant delight you had a big new country to spread out in and no competitors there were no previous inhabitants were there nothing but indians i said indians yes savages like those in the forest below your mountain land though more advanced in some ways how did you arrange with them she asked i hate to tell you elador you see you have a little idealized my country we do not arrange with those savages we kill them all of them how many were there she was quite calm she made no movement of alarm or horror but i could see the rich color fade from her face and her dear gentle mouth set in harder lines of control it's a long story and not a nice one i'm sorry to say we left some hemming them in spots called reservations there has been a good deal of education and missionary work some indians have become fully civilized as good citizens as any and some have intermarried with the whites we have many people with indian blood but speaking generally this is one of our national shames helen hunt wrote a book about it called a century of dishonor elador was silent that lovely far-off homesick look came into her eyes i hate to disillusion you dear heart i said we're not perfect in america i truly think we have many advantages over any other country but we are not blameless 
I'll defer judgment till I get there, she presently answered. Let's go back to what we're discussing. The pressure of population. Rather sadly, we took it up again and saw how, as long as warfare was a relief, nations continually boiled over upon one another, gaining more land by the simple process of killing off the previous owners, and having to repeat the process indefinitely as soon as the population again pressed against its limits. Where warfare was abandoned and a settled boundary established, as when Great China walled itself in from marauding tribes, then the population showed an ingrowing pressure and reduced the standard of living to a ghastly minimum. Then came the latter process of peaceful emigration, by which the coasts and islands of the Pacific became tinged with the moving thousands of the yellow races. She saw it all as a great panorama, an endless procession, never accepting a static world with the limitations of party-colored maps, but always watching the movement of races. That's what ails Europe now, isn't it? she said at last. That's why those close-packed, fertile races were always struggling up and down among one another and making room for a while by killing people? That's certainly a good part of it, I agreed. Every nation wants more land to accommodate its increasing population. And they want an increase of population in order to win more land, don't they? This, too, was plain. And there isn't any way out of it, on a limited earth, but fixed boundaries with suicidal crowding inside, or the fortunes of war? That, too, was plainly unfortunate. Then, why do not the women limit the population as we did? Oh, Elador, Elador, you cannot seem to realize that this world is not a woman's world, like your little country. This is a man's world, and they do not want to limit the population. Why not? she urged. Was it because they did not bear the children? Was it because they would rather fight than live in peace? What was the reason? Neither of those, I said slowly. The real reason is that neither men nor women have been able to see broadly enough, to think deeply enough, sufficiently to visualize these great racial questions. They just followed their instincts and obeyed their ancient religions, and these things happened without their knowing why. But the woman, protested Elador, surely the women could see a simple thing as that. It's only a matter of square miles. How many people to a mile can live healthfully and pleasantly? Are these women willing to have their children grow up so crowded that they can't be happy, or where they'll have to fight for room to live? I can't understand it. Then she went determinedly to question a Japanese authority, to whom we were introduced by one of our friends as to the status of women in Japan. She was polite, she was meek, she steeled herself beforehand to hear without surprise, and the authority, also courteous to a degree, gave her a brief outline with illustrative story and quotation of the point of view from which women were regarded in that country. She grasped it even more thoroughly than she had in India or China. We left Japan for home via Hawaii, and for days she was silent about the subject. Then, as the wide blue sea, the brilliant ice spinning by, the smooth magnificence of our progress comforted her, she touched on it once more. I'm trying not to feel about these particularly awful things and not to judge, even till I know more. These things are so, and my knowing them does not make them any worse than they were before. You're a brave girl, and a strong one, I assured her. That's the only way to do. I'm awfully sorry you had to have such a dose at first, this war of all things, and then women in the East. I ought to have prepared you better. You could not have, dearest. It would have been impossible. No mere words could have made me visualize the inconceivable. And no matter how I came to it, slow or fast, the horror would have been just the same. It is as impossible for me to make you see how I feel it now, as it would have been for you to make me feel it beforehand. The voyage did her great good. She loved the sea and gloried in the ships, doing her best to ignore the pitiful labor conditions of those who made the glory possible. Always, she made friends, travelers, missionaries, businessmen and women, wherever she found them. Yet strangely enough, she seemed more at a loss with the women than with the men, seemed not to know quite how to approach them. It was not for lack of love and sympathy, far from it. She was eager to make friends with them. I finally worked out an explanation like this. She made friends with the men on the human side rather than attracting them by femininity. And as human beings, they exchanged ideas and got on well together. 
the women were not so human had a less wide outlook less experience as a rule when she did get near enough to one of them for talk at all intimate then came the ultra feminine point of view the different sense of social and moral values the peculiar limitations of their position i saw this as reflected by elador as i had never seen it for myself before what i did not understand at first was why she seemed to flag in interest and impatience with the women sooner than with the men she never criticized them but i could see a puzzled grieved look come over her kind face and then she would withdraw they were exceptions marked ones a woman doctor who had worked for years in china was going home for a long-needed vacation and elador was with her day after day learning she told me and there was another once a missionary now a research worker in biology who commanded her sincere admiration we came to the lovely hawaiian islands quite rested and refreshed and arranged to stay there a while and enjoy the splendor of the secret mountains here her eager social interest was again aroused and she supplied herself with a history of this little sample of social progress most rapidly there were plenty to teach her a few excellent books to read and numbers of most self-satisfied descendants of missionaries to boast of the novel work of their fathers this is very illuminating she told me it is a what's the nice word professor whiting used a microcosm isn't it by this time my dear investigator had as clear an idea of general human history as any one not a specialist could wish and had it in a very small notebook while in england someone had given her winwood reed's wonderful martyrdom of man as good a basis for historical study as could be asked and all the facts and theories she had been collecting since were duly related to her general views here you have done it so quickly inside of a century only eighteen twenty and these nice gentle golden-colored people were living here by themselves they weren't always gentle don't idealize them too much i interrupted they had wars and quarrels and they had a very horrid taboo religion particularly hard on women yes i know that they were imperfect as we are as professor boynton used to say but they were beautiful and healthy and happy they were courteous and kind and oh how splendidly they could swim even the babies they tell me i've understood a child can swim earlier than it can walk did they tell you that yes why not but look here my dear then came the missionaries and interfered now these natives and owners of the land are only fifteen per cent of the population with twenty per cent of the deaths they are dispossessed and are being exterminated yes i said well elador looked at me one could watch the expressions follow one another over her face like cloud shadows and sunlight over a landscape she looked puzzled she evidently saw a reason she became stern then a further reason was recognized and then that heavenly mother look came over her the one i had grown to prize most deeply but all she said was i love you van thank heaven for that my dear i thought you were going to cast me out because of the dispossessed hawaiians i didn't do it you're not blaming me are you did not america do it she asked quietly and do you care at all then i embarked on one of those confined and contradictory explanations by which the wolf who has eaten the lamb seeks to show how unavoidable if not how justifiable it all was do you feel like that about england's take in the boyer's country she asked gently i did not i had always felt it a particularly inexcusable piece of expansion and your country it not packed very close yet is it having so much why did you need these we wanted to christianize them to civilize them i urged rather sulkily do you think christ would have the same effect on them and does civilization help dead people she saw i was hurt and stopped to kiss me let's drop it dear i was wrong to press the point but i become so used to saying everything to you just as if you were one of my sisters i forget that things must look differently when one's own country is involved she said no more about the vanishing hawaiians but i began to look at them with a very different feeling from what i had ever had before we had brought them syphilis and tuberculosis the chinese brought them leprosy one of their lovely islands was now a name of horror from that ghastly disease a place where noble christians strive to minimize the evil too late 
the missionaries nobly purposed no doubt to begin with had amassed great fortunes in land given to them by these careless children who knew so little of land ownership and the children and grandchildren of the missionaries lived wealthy and powerful proud of the great work of their forefathers and apparently seeing no evil in sad results perhaps they thought it was no matter how soon the natives died so that they died christians and the civilization we had brought them means an endless day of labor long hours of grinding toil for other people's profit in place of the clean ease and freedom of their own old life hard labor disease death and the lasting consciousness of all this among their dwindling ranks exclusion social dissemination industrial exploitation approaching extermination it is no wonder the music is mournful i was glad to leave the lovely place glad to put aside a sense of national guilt and to see elador freshen again as the golden days and velvet nights flowed over us as we steamed toward the sunrise and home there were plenty of californians on board both wise and unwise and i saw my wife with a constantly increasing ease and skill extracting information from each and all she talked with it is not difficult to extract information about california from a californian not being one myself and having more definite knowledge about my own country than i had had about most of the others we had visited i was able to check off this triumphant flood of boosting with somewhat colder facts elador liked it it does my heart good she said both to know that there is such a country on earth and that people can care for it like that she particularly reveled in ella coolbridge's exquisite poem california so rich with tender pride with vivid appreciation some devotee had the book with her and poured forth a new torrent of praise over a fine list she had of californian authors this annoyed me rather more than real estate climate fruit or flowers and having been somewhat browbeaten over hawaii i wanted to take it out of somebody else i'm not as good as elador don't pretend to be at moments like that i don't even want to be so i said to this bubbling enthusiast why do you call all these people californian authors she looked at me in genuine surprise were they born there i inquired are they native sons or daughters she had to admit they were not save in a few cases we marked those who were it was a most insufficient list but they lived in california she insisted how long i asked how long a visit or residence does it take to make an author a californian like mark twain for instance is he a Connecticut author because he lived more years than that in Connecticut, or a New York author because he lived quite a while in New York? She looked much annoyed, and I was not a bit sorry, but went on ruthlessly. I think California is the only state in the Union that is not content with its own crop, but tries to claim everything in sight. To be continued. End of chapter 4《Chapter Five of With Her in Our Land》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org.《With Her in Our Land》by Charlotte Perkins Gilman《Chapter Five》My Country In through the golden gate we steamed at last, one glorious morning calm Tamalpais basking on the northern side, and the billowing city rising tumultuously on the southern, with the brilliant beauty of the fair glowing on the water's edge. I had been through before, and showed her through the glass as we passed, the seal rocks and the cliff house with the great sutro baths beside it, and then the jewelled tower, the streaming banners of that wonder city of a year. It was in February. There had been rain, and now the luminous rich green of the blazing sudden spring was cloaking every sloping shore. The long bay stretched wide on either hand. The fair bay cities opposite embroidered the western shore for miles. San Francisco rose before us. Elador stood by my side, holding my arm with tense excitement. "'Your country, dear,' she said. "'How beautiful it is! I shall love it!' I was loving it myself at that moment, as I never had before. Behind me was that long journey of us three adventurous explorers, our longer imprisonment, 
and then these travels of ours through war-torn Europe and the slow dark reaches of the Oriental civilization. It certainly looks good to me, I told her. We spent many days at the Great Exposition, and others, later, at the still lovelier, smaller one at San Diego. Days of great happiness to both of us, and real pride to me. Later on, I lost this feeling, replacing it with a growing discomfort. I suppose everyone loves and honours his own country, practically everyone. And we Americans, so young a people, so buoyantly carried along on the flood of easy geographical expansion, so suddenly increased in numbers, not by natural growth of our own stock, but by crowding injections of alien blood, by vast hordes of low-grade labourers whose ignorant masses made our own ignorant masses feel superior to all the earth. We Americans are almost as boastful as the still newer Federation of Germany. I had thought myself a sociologist an ethnologist, one able to judge fairly from wide knowledge. And yet, with all my knowledge, with all my lucid criticism of my country's errors and shortcomings, I had kept an unshaken inner conviction of our superiority. Elidor had shaken it. It was not that she had found any fault with the institutions of my beloved land. Quite the contrary. She believed it faultless, or nearly so. She expected too much. Knowing her as I now did, becoming more and more familiar with the amazing lucidity and fairness of her mind, with its orderly marshalling of well-knit facts and the swinging searchlight of perception which covered every point in her field of vision, I had a strange, helpless sense of coming to judgment. In her land... I had never fully realised the quality of mind developed by their cultural system. Some of its power and clarity was of course plain to us, but we could no more measure that mind than a child can measure its teachers. I had lived with it now, watched it work, seen it in relation to others, to those of learned men and women of various nations. There was no ostentation about Elidor's intellectual processes. She made no display of learning, did not contradict and argue. Sometimes, in questions of fact, if it seemed essential to the matter under discussion, she would quote authority in opposition, but, for the most part, she listened, asking a few questions to satisfy herself as to the point of view of her interlocutor. I used to note with appreciative delight how these innocent, almost irrelevant questions could bring out answers, each one of which was a branching guidepost as to the mind of the speaker. Sometimes just two would show him to be capable of believing flat contradictions, or merely one would indicate a limitation of knowledge or an attitude of prejudice which placed the man at once. These were not smart questions, with a flippantly triumphant and all-too-logical demand at the end, leaving the victim confused and angry. He never realised what was being done to him. "'How do you have patience with these chumps?' I asked her. They seem like children in your hands, and yet you don't hurt them a bit. Perhaps that is why, she answered gravely. We are so used to children at home, and when a whole country is always more or less teaching children, why, it, it makes us patient, I suppose. What good would it do to humiliate these people? They all know things more than I do about most things. They may know more about some things, but it's their mental processes that seem so muddy, so sticky, so slow and fumbling somehow. You're right there, Van. It impresses me very much. There is an enormous fund of knowledge in the minds of your people. I mean, any of these people I have met, but the minds themselves are, to me, astonishing. The Oriental mind is far more highly developed than the Occidental, in some lines, but as serenely unconscious of its limits as, as the other is. What strikes me most of all is the lack of connection between all this knowledge they have accumulated and the way they live. I'm hoping to find it wholly different here. You Americans, I understand, are the people who do things. Before I go on with Elidor's impressions of America, I want to explain a little further, lest my native-born fellow citizens resent too bitterly her ultimate criticisms. She, perhaps, would not have published those criticisms at all, but I can, now. 
the sensitiveness I felt at first, the hurt pride, the honest pain, as my pet ideals inexorably changed colour under that searchlight of hers, do what I would to maintain them in their earlier glory. All this is outgrown. I love my country better than I ever did before. I understand it better. Probably that accounts for the increased tenderness and patience. But if ever a country needed to wake up and look itself in the face, it is this one. Elador, in that amazing little pocket history she compiled, had set up the order of exercises in our development and placed the nations in due sequence as contributors. Running over its neat pages, with the outline maps, the charts with their varied washes of colour, showing this or that current of tendency and pressure of condition, one gathered at once a clear bird's-eye view of what humanity had been doing all this time. She speculated sagely with me as to what trifling deflection of type, what variation in environment was responsible for the divigation of races, especially those of quite recent common stock. But in the little book was no speculation, merely the simple facts. Referring to it, she could show in a few moments what special influences made Egypt Egypt and differentiated Assyria from Chaldea. She shook her head sadly over those long early ages. They were slow to learn, weren't they? She'd say. Never seemed to put two and two together at all. I suppose that peculiar rest of the mental processes was due first to mere social inertia, with its piled up weight of custom, and then much more to religion. That finality, that believing, seemed to put an end to real thinking and learning. But, my dear, interposed, they were learned, surely. The ancient priests had practically all the learning, and in the Dark Ages the church in Europe was all that kept learning alive at all. Do you mean learning, dear, or just remembering? she asked. What did the medieval church learn? This was a distinction I had never thought of. Of course what we have always called learning was knowing what went before, long before, and mostly what people had written. Still, I made out something of a case about the study of alchemy and medicine, which she gravely admitted. It remained true that the church, any church, in any period, has set its face like a flint against the people's learning anything new, and as we commonly know, had promptly punished the most progressive. It is a wonder to me, said Elidore tenderly, that you have done as well as you have, with all these awful handicaps. But you, America, you have a different opportunity. I don't suppose you quite realise yourselves what a marvellous difference there is between you and every other people on earth. Then she pointed out, briefly, how by the start in religious rebellion we had set free the mind from its heaviest shackles. By throwing off the monarchy and aristocracy we had escaped another weight. How our practically unlimited area and fluctuating condition made custom but a name and how the mixture of races broke the current of heredity. All this we had gone over on the steamer, sitting by the hour in our long chairs, watching the big smooth swells roll by, and talking of my country. You have reason to be proud, she would say. No people on earth ever had such a chance. I used to feel misgivings then, especially after Hawaii. I tried to arrange some satisfying defence for our treatment of the Asiatics, the Negroes, Mexico. I thought of all that I could to excuse the open evils that I knew. Intemperance, prostitution, graft, lynching. I began to see more holes in the bright fabric of Columbia's robe than I had ever noticed before, and bigger ones. But at that, I did not anticipate. We spent several weeks in California. I took her to see Shasta the Yosemite, the cedars of Monterey, the big trees, the imperial valley. All through the country she poured out constant praises of the boundless loveliness of the land, the air, the sunshine, even the rain. Rain did not depress Elidor. She was a forester. And she read avidly. She read John Muir with rapture. How I should have loved him, she said. She read the brief history of the state, and some books about it, Ramona, for instance. She visited and talked with some leading Japanese and Chinamen. And she read steadily, with a fixed, non-committal face, the newspapers. 
if I asked her anything about it at all, she would pour forth honest delight in the flowers and fruit, the beauty and brightness of the land. If I pressed for more, she would say, Wait, Van dear, give me time. I've only just come. I don't know enough yet to talk. But I, knowing how quickly she learned, and how accurately she related new knowledge to old, watched her face with growing dismay. In Europe, I had seen that beautiful face pale with horror. In Asia, sicken with loathing. Now, after going around the world, after reaching this youngest land, this land of hope and pride, of wealth and power, I saw that face I loved so well, set in sad lines of disappointment, fairly age before my eyes. She was still cheerful with me, still happy out of doors, and her heart rose as I had hoped it would among the mountains, on the far-spread lustrous deserts, in that wordless wonder, the Grand Canyon of the Colorado. But as she read, as she sat thinking, I could see the light die out of her face, and a depressing look creep over it, a look of agonised disappointment, yet of patience too, and a courageous, deep determination. It was as if a mother had learned that her baby was an idiot. As we drew eastward, and the cities grew larger, noisier, blacker, her distress increased. She began to urge me to play games with her, to read aloud from books she loved, and especially to talk of her land. I was willing, more than willing, as I saw my country through her eyes, as I saw its effect on her, I became less and less inclined, indeed less able, to discuss with her it. But the tension grew, her suffering increased, until I told her, as I had that terrible night in Europe, that she must talk to me about it. You see, you will have to, whether you want to or not, I argued. You cannot take all America to task about itself. You would get yourself disliked. Besides, if you don't want to tell them about your country, and if you pitch into theirs, they will insist on knowing where you come from quite naturally. I can't bear to see you getting more and more distressed and saying nothing about it. Besides, it is barely possible that I might offer some palliation or explanation of some of the worst things. What do you consider the worst things? she asked casually enough. But I was already wise enough to see at once that we might not agree on definition. Suppose we do this, I suggested. Here you are, as extra mundane as a Martian. You are like an investigating committee from another world. Quite apart from my love for you, my sympathy with you, my admiration for you, yes, all serious and sincere, my dear, I do appreciate this unparalleled opportunity to get a real outsider's point of view. This is something that never happened before, you see. Marco Polo came nearest to it, perhaps, when he went poking into the Asiatic wonderland. But these old adventurers of ours, whatever their hardships, never took it so hard as you do. They enjoyed satisfying their curiosity. They always thought their own birthplace infinitely superior, and the more inferior they found other places the more they enjoyed it. Now with you, it seems to hurt your feelings most horribly. I wish you could somehow detach yourself from it, so that you could learn and not suffer. You are quite right, dear boy. It is most unphilosophical of me. I suppose it is largely a result of our long period of lovingness at home that things strike so harshly on my mind. And partly you're being a woman, don't you think? I urged. You see, yours is a feminine culture and naturally more sensitive, isn't it? Perhaps that is it, she said, pondering. The very first thing that strikes me in this great, rich, lovely land of yours is its unmotherliness. We are, of course, used to seeing everything taken care of. But surely it was worse, far worse in the other countries, wasn't it? She smiled tenderly and sadly. Yes, Van, it was. But here, well, doubtless I expected too much. But isn't there some comfort in the contrast? I asked eagerly. Here is not the petrified oppression, the degradation of women that so sickened you in Asia. And here is not the wild brutality of war that so horrified you in Europe. No, not either of those, she slowly agreed. 
but you see, I had warning that Europe was at war, and had read about it a little. It was like going into a... a slaughterhouse for the first time. Then, all I learned in my studies in Europe prepared me to find what I did find in Asia, and Asia was in some ways better than I had been told, in some ways worse. But here... Oh, Van. That look of grey anguish had settled on her face again. She seized my arms, held me fast, searched my face as if I was withholding something. Big, slow tears welled over and dropped. This is the top of the tree, Van. This is the last young nation, beginning over again in a new world, a new world. Here was everything to make life richly happy, everything. And you had all the dreadful record of the past to guide you, to teach you at least what not to do. You had courage. You had independence. You had intelligence, education, opportunity. And such splendid principles to start with. Such high ideals. And then all kinds of people coming. Oh, surely, surely, surely this should be the crown of the world. Why, Van... Europe was like a man with, with delirium tremens. Asia was like something gnarled and twisted with hopeless age. But America is a splendid child with... She covered her face with her hands. I couldn't stand this. I was an American and she was my wife. I took her in my arms. Look her, you blessed Herlander, I said. I'm not going to have my country wiped off the map in disgrace. You must remember that all judgment is comparative. You cannot compare any other country with your country for two reasons. First, your long isolation. And second, that miraculous manlessness of yours. This world of ours has been in more or less intercourse and exchange for many more thousands of years than Herland has lived. We Americans were not a new created race. We were just English and Dutch and French and Scandinavian and Italian and so on, just everybody. We brought with us our inherited tendencies, of course. All of them. And while we did make a clean break with some of the old evils, we had no revelation as to a perfect social method. You're expecting too much. Don't you see, I went on, for she said nothing, that a splendid child may be a pretty bad child sometimes and may have the measles pretty hard, and yet not be hopeless? She raised her wet face from my shoulder, and her own warm, loving smile illuminated it once more. You're right, Van. You're wholly right, she agreed. I was most unreasonable, most unwise. It is just a piece of the same world, a lot of pieces, mixed samples, on a new piece of ground. And it was a magnificent undertaking, I can see that. And you are young, aren't you? Oh, Van dear, you do make it easier. I held her very close for a while. This journey among strange lands had brought me one deep joy. Elidor had grown to need me as she never did in her own peaceful home. You see, dearest, I said, you have a dual mission. You are to study all about the world and take your knowledge back with you, but all you'll need of it there is to decide whether you'll come out and play with us or not, or let any more of us come in. Then you have what I, as a citizen of the rest of the world, rather the biggest part of it, consider a more important duty. If that Herland mind of yours can find out what ails us, and how we are to mend it, if your little country, with its strange experiment, can bring aid in solving the problems of the world... That is what I call a historic mission. How does that strike you, Mrs. Jennings? It was good to see her rise to it. That wonderful mother heart, which all those women had, seemed to shine out like a sunrise. I went on delighted with my success. I'll just forget I'm an American, I said. This country is the child. I'm not its father or anything. I'm just a doctor, a hygienist, an investigator. You're another, and a bigger one. Now, I understand that you find the child is in a bad way. Worse off than I thought it was. To judge from your expression, dear, on several occasions, you think it is a very dirty child, a careless child, a wasteful child, with a bad temper and no manners. Am I right? Not about the temper, dear. 
pettish at times, but not vindictive, and very, very kind. Van, I think I've been too hard on the child. I'm quite ashamed. Yes, we are two investigators. I'm so glad there are two. She stopped and looked at me with an expression I never saw enough of, that I used to long for in vain at first. That look as if she needed me. No matter what we have in her land, she said slowly, we miss this, this united feeling. It grows, Van. I feel more and more as if, somehow or other, we were really blended. We have nothing just like it. No, you haven't, with all your paradise. So let's allow some good things in your case, and particularly in this case of the bad child, and we'll pitch in and work out a diagnosis, won't we? And then prescribe. We pitched in. First, she had insisted on knowing the whole country. We made a sort of spiral, beginning on the outside, and circulated south, east, north, west, and so over again, till we wound ourselves up in Topeka. By that time, we had been in every state, in all the principal cities, and in many of those tiny towns which are more truly indicative of the spirit of the community than the larger ones. When we were interested in a given place, we would stay a while. There was nothing to hurry us. And when Elador showed signs of wear and tear, there was always some sweet wild country to fly to and rest. She sampled both sea coasts, the Great Lakes and some little ones, many a long winding river, mountains wooded and mountains bare, the restful plains, the shadowy cypress swamps. Her prompt reaction to the beauty of the real country was always beneficial, and, to my great delight, she grew to love it, and even to feel a pride in its vast extent and variety, just as I did. We both admitted that it was a most illegitimate ground for pride, but we both felt it. As she saw more of the cities, and of the people, by mere usage she grew accustomed to what had grieved her most at first. Also, I suggested a method which she gladly used, and found most comforting in which we classified all the evils as transient, and concerned ourselves merely with finding out how they came there and how to remove them. Some of these things you'll just outgrow, she said relievedly. Some are already outgrown. America is not nearly so cocky as Dickens found her. She is now in an almost morbid attitude of self-distrust and condemnation, but she'll outgrow that too. It was a great relief to me to have her push through that period of shocked disappointment so readily. But of course, the vigour of her mental constitution made it possible for her to throw off a trouble like that more easily than we can do it. She soon devised methods of her own, of acquiring further information. In her capacity of a traveller, and recently come from the seat of war, to say nothing of the Orient, she found frequent opportunity for addressing women's clubs, churches and forums of various kinds, and so coming in touch with large bodies of people and their reactions. I am learning to realise the popular mind, she said. I can already distinguish between the different parts of the country. And, oh, Van, she laughed a little, caught her breath over, and added with an odd restraint, I'm getting to know the women. Why do you say it like that? I inquired. She looked at me in what I might describe as 40 ways at once. It was funny, there was such an odd mixture of pride and shame, of hope and disillusionment, of a high faith and a profound distrust. I can stand it, she protested. The child is by no means hopeless. In fact, I begin to think it is a very promising child, Van. But oh, how it does behave. And she laughed. I was a little resentful. We were such good chums by this time. We had played together such a lot and studied together so widely. We had such a safe foundation of mutual experience that I began to dare to make fun of my strange princess now and then, and she took it most graciously. There's one thing I won't stand for, I told her solemnly. You can call my country a desert, my people incompetent, dishonest, wasteful, and careless to a degree. You can blackguard our agriculture, horticulture, arboriculture, floriculture, viticulture, and... and... apiculture? She suggested with a serious face. 
You can deride our architecture and make trivial objections to the use of soot as a civic decoration. But there is one thing I, as an American man, will not stand. You mustn't criticize our women. I won't, she said meekly, a twinkle in her eye. I won't say one word about them, dear, until you ask me to. Whereat I knew that my doom was sealed once more. Could I rest without knowing what she thought of them? End of chapter 5 Recording by Kate M. Chapter 6 of With Her in Our Land This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. With Her in Our Land by Charlotte Perkins Gilman Chapter 6 The Diagnosis How are you getting on with the case, Mrs. J? I asked Elidore one evening when she seemed rather discouraged. What symptoms are worrying you most now? She looked at me with wide, anxious eyes, too much in earnest to mind the Mrs. J, which usually rather teased her. It's an awfully important case, Van, dear, she answered soberly. And a serious one. Very serious, I think. I've been reading a lot, had to, to get background and perspective, and I feel as if I understood a good deal better. Still, you helped me ever so much by saying that you were not new people, just mixed Europeans. But the new country and the new conditions began to make you all into a new people, only... These pauses are quite terrifying, I protested. Won't you explain your ominous, still and sinister, only? She smiled a little. Why, the still should have been followed by the amount which I did not understand, and the only... She stopped again. Well, out with it, my dear. Only what? Only you have done it too fast and too much in the dark. You weren't conscious, you see. Not conscious? America? Not conscious? Not self-conscious, I mean, Van. This I scouted entirely, till she added patiently. Perhaps I should say nationally conscious or socially conscious. You were plunged into an enormous social enterprise, a huge, swift, violent experiment. The current of social evolution burst forth over here, like a, a subterranean river finding an outlet. Things that the stratified crust of Asia could not let through, and the heavy shell of European culture could not either, just burst forth over here and swept you along. Democracy had been uh, accumulating through all the centuries. The other nations forced it back, held it down. It boiled over in France, but the lid was clapped on again for a while. Here, it could pour forward, and it poured. Then all the people of the same period of social development wanted to come too, and did. Lots of them. That was inevitable. All that America means in this sense is a new phase of social development, and anyone can be an American who belongs to it. Guess you were right so far, Mrs. Doctor. Go ahead. But while this was happening to you, you were doing things yourselves, some of them in line with your real position and movement, some dead against it. For instance, your religion. Religion against what? Expound further. Against democracy. You don't mean the Christian religion, do you? I urged, rather shocked. Oh, no, indeed. That would have been a great help to the world if they had ever taken it up. I was always entertained and somewhat startled by Elidor's detached view. She knew the same facts, so familiar to us, but they had not the same connotations. I think Jesus was simply wonderful, she went on. What a pity it was he did not live longer. 
This was a new suggestion to me. Of course I no longer accepted that pitiful old idea of his being a prearranged sacrifice to his own father, but I never deliberately thought of his having continued alive and its possible effects. He is supposed to have been executed at about the age of 33, was he not? She went on. Think of it. Hardly a grown man. He should have had 30 or 40 more years of teaching. It would all have become clearer, more consistent. He would have worked things out, explained them, made people understand. He would have made clear to them what they were to do. It was an awful loss. I said nothing at all, but watched the sweet, earnest face, the wise, far-seeing eyes, and really agreed with her, though in my mind rose a confused, dim throng of horrified objections, belonging not to my own mind, but to those of other people. "'Tell me how you mean that our religion was against democracy,' I persisted. "'It was so personal,' she said, "'and so unjust.' There must have crept into it, in early times, a lot of the Buddhist philosophy, either direct or filtered, the acquiring merit idea and ascetism. The worst part of all was the idea of sacrifice. That is so ancient. Of course, what Jesus meant was social unity, that your neighbour was yourself, that we were all one humanity, many gifts but the same spirit. He must have meant that for that is so. What I mean by your religion is the grade of Calvinism which dominated young America, and the still older branches, and the various small, newer ones. It was all so personal. My soul, my salvation, my conscience, my sins. And here was the great living, working truth of democracy carrying you on in spite of yourselves, a pluribus unum, your economic philosophy was dead against it too, that foolish laissez-faire idea. And your politics, though what was new in it started pretty well, has never been able to make such headway against the highest religious sanction, the increasing economic pressure, and the general drag of custom and tradition, inertia. You are somewhat puzzling, my fair Marco Polo, I urged. So you mean to extol our politics, American politics? Why, of course, she said, her eyes shining. The principles of democracy are wholly right. The law of federation, the method of rotation in office, the stark necessity for general education that the people may understand clearly, the establishment of liberty, that they may act freely, it is splendidly, gloriously right. But why do I say this to an American? I wish you could say it to every American man, woman and child, I answered soberly. Of course we used to feel that way about it. But things have changed somehow. Yes, yes, she went on eagerly. That's what I mean. You started right for the most part, but those high-minded, brave old ancestors of yours did not understand sociology. How should they? It wasn't even born. They did not know how society worked, or what would hurt it the most. So the preachers went on exhorting the people to save their own souls, or get it done for them by imputed virtues of someone else, and no one understood the needs of the country. Why, Van... Van Dyke Jennings, as I understand more and more how noble and courageous and high-minded was this splendid child, and then see it now, bloated and weak, with unnatural growth, preyed on by all manner of parasites inside and out, attacked by diseases of all kinds, sneered at, criticised, condemned by the older nations, and yet bravely stumbling on making progress in spite of it all. I'm getting to just love America. That pleased me, naturally. But I didn't like her picture of my country as bloated and verminous. I demanded explanation. Do you think we're too big? I asked. 
too much country to be handled properly. Oh, no, she answered promptly. Not too big in land. That would have been like the long, lean lines of youth, the far-reaching bones of a country gradually rounding out and filling in as you grow. But you couldn't wait to grow. You just swelled. What on earth do you mean, Elador? You have stuffed yourself with the most ill-assorted and unassimilable mass of human material that ever was held together by artificial means, she answered remorselessly. You go to England, and the people are English. Only three percent of aliens, even in London, I understand. And in France, the people are French, bless them. And in Italy, Italian. But here? It's no wonder I was discouraged at first. It has taken a lot of study and hard thinking to see a way out at all. But I do see it. It was simply awful when I began. Just look. Here you were. A little band of really promising people, of different nations, yet of the same general stock and like-minded. That was the main thing. The real union is the union of idea. Without that, no nation. You made settlements. You grew strong and bold. You shook off the old government. You set up a new flag. And then? Then, said I proudly, we opened our arms to all the world if that is what you are finding fault with. We welcomed other people to our big new country, the poor and oppressed of all nations, I quoted solemnly. That's what I mean by saying you were ignorant of sociology, was her cheerful reply. It never occurred to you that the poor and oppressed were not necessarily good stuff for a democracy. I looked at her rather rebelliously. Why just study them, she went on, in that large, sweeping way of hers. Hadn't there been poor and oppressed enough in the past? In Chaldea and Assyria and Egypt and Rome, in all Europe, everywhere? Why, Van, it is the poor and oppressed who make monarchy and despotism. Don't you see that? Hold on, my dear. Hold on. This is too much. Are you blaming the poor, helpless things for their tyrannical oppression? No more than I blame an apple tree for bearing apples, she answered. You don't seriously advance the idea that the oppressor began it, do you? Just one oppressor jumping on the necks of a thousand free men. Surely you see that the general status and character of a people creates and maintains its own kind of government. Yes, I agreed. But all the same, they are human. And if you give them proper conditions, they can all rise. Surely we have proved that. Give them proper conditions and give them time. Yes. Time. They do it in one generation. We have citizens, good citizens of all races, who were born in despotic countries, all equal in our democracy. How many Chinese and Japanese citizens have you? She asked quietly. How are your African citizens treated in this equal democracy? This was rather a facer. About the first awful mistake you made was in loading yourself up with those reluctant Africans, Elidor went on. If it wasn't so horrible, it would be funny, awfully funny. A beautiful, healthy young country, saddling itself with an antique sin every other civilized nation had repudiated. And here they are, by millions and millions, flatly denied citizenship, socially excluded, an enormous alien element in your democracy. They are not aliens, I persisted stoutly. They are Americans, loyal Americans. They make admirable soldiers. Yes, and servants. You will let them serve you and fight for you, but that's all, apparently. Nearly a tenth of the population, and not part of the democracy, and they never asked to come. Well, I said rather sullenly. I admit it. Everyone does. It was an enormous, costly national mistake, and we paid for it heavily. And it's there yet an unsolved question. I admit it all. Go on, please. We were dead wrong on the blacks, and pretty hard on the reds. We may be wrong on the yellows. I guess this is a white man's country, isn't it? 
You're not objecting to the white immigrants, are you? To legitimate immigrants, able and willing to be American citizens, there can be no objection. But to millions of deliberately imported people, not immigrants at all, but victims, poor ignorant people, scraped up by paid agents, deceived by lying advertisements, brought over here by greedy American ship owners and employers of labour. There are objections, many and strong. But Elador, even granting it is as you say, they too can be made into American citizens, surely. They can be, but are they? I suppose you all tacitly assume that they are, but an outsider does not see it. We have been all over the country now, pretty thoroughly. I have met and talked with people of all classes and all races, both men and women. Remember, I'm new to the world, and I've just come here from studying Europe and Asia and Africa. I have the hinterland of history pretty clearly summarised, though of course I can't pretend to be thorough. And I tell you, Ron, there are millions of people in your country who do not belong to it at all. She saw that I was about to defend our foreign-born, and went on. I do not mean the immigrants solely. There are Bostonians of Beacon Hill who belong in London. There are New Yorkers of five generations who belong in Paris. There are vast multitudes who belong in Berlin, in Dublin, in Jerusalem. And there are plenty of native sons and daughters of the Revolution who are aristocrats, plutocrats, anything but Democrats. Why, of course there are. We believe in having all kinds. There's room for everybody. This is the melting pot, you know. And do you think that you can put a little of everything into a melting pot and produce a good metal? Well fused and flawless? Gold, silver, copper and iron, lead, radium, pipe clay, coal dust and plain dirt? A simile is an untrustworthy animal if you ride it too hard. I grinned and admitted that there were limits to the powers of fusion. Please understand, she urged gently. I am not looking down on one kind of people because they are different from others. I like them all. I think your prejudice against the black is silly, wicked and hypocritical. You have no idea how ridiculous it looks to an outsider to hear your southern enthusiasts raving about the horrors of miscegenation and then to count the mulattoes, quadroons, octoroons and all the successive shades by which the black race becomes white before their eyes, or to see them shudder at social equality while the babies are nourished at black breasts and cared for in their most impressionable years by black nurses, their children. She stopped at that, turned away from me, and walked to the opposite window, where she stood for some time with her hands clenched and her shoulders heaving. Where was I? She asked presently, definitely dropping the question of children. Black, yes. And how about the yellow? Do they melt? Do you want them to melt? Isn't your exclusion of them an admission that you think some kinds of people unassimilable? That democracy must pick and choose a little? What would you have us do? I asked rather sullenly. Exclude everybody? Think we are superior to the whole world? Elador laughed and kissed me. I think you are, she whispered tenderly. No, I don't mean that at all. It would be too great a strain on the imagination. If you want a prescription, far too late. It is this. Democracy is a psychic relation. It requires the intelligent, conscious cooperation of a great many persons, all equal in the characteristics required to play that kind of a game. You could have safely welcomed to your great undertaking people of every race and nation who were individually fitted to assist. Not by any means because they were poor and oppressed, nor because of that glittering generality that all men are born free and equal, but because the human race is in different stages of development and only some of the races, or some individuals in a given race, have reached the democratic stage. But how could we discriminate? You mustn't ask me too much, Fan. I'm a stranger. I don't know all I ought to. And of course, I'm all the time measuring by my background of experience in my own country. 
I find you people talk a good bit about the brotherhood of man, but you haven't seemed to think about the possibilities of a sisterhood of women. I looked up alertly, but she gave a mischievous smile and shook her head. You do not want to hear about the women, I remember. But seriously, dear, this is one of the most dangerous mistakes you have made. It complicates everything. It makes your efforts to establish democracy like trying to make a ship go by steam and at the same time admitting banks of oars, masses of sails and cordage, and mere paddles and outriggers. You can certainly make some prescription for this particularly dreadful state, can't you? I urged. Sometimes an outsider can see better than those who are being melted. She pondered a while, then began slowly. Legitimate immigration is like the coming of children to you, new blood for the nations, citizens made, not born. And they should be met like children, with loving welcome, with adequate preparation, with the fullest and wisest education for their new place. Where you have that crowded little filter on Ellis Island, you ought to have immigration bureaus on either coast, at ports so specified, with a great additional department to definitely Americanize the newcomers, to teach them the language, spirit, traditions and customs of the country. Talk about offering hospitality to all the world. What kind of hospitality is it to let your guests crowd and pack into the front hall, to offer them neither bed, bread, nor association? That's what I mean by saying that you are not conscious. You haven't taken your immigration seriously enough. The consequence is that you are only partially America, an American clogged and confused, weakened and mismanaged for lack of political compatibility. Is this all? I asked after a little. You make me feel as if my country was a cross between a patchwork quilt and a pudding stone. Oh dear, no, she cheerfully assured me. That's only a beginning of my diagnosis. The patient's worst disease was that disgraceful, out-of-date attack of slavery, only escaped by a surgical operation, painful, costly, and not by any means wholly successful. The second is this chronic distension from absorbing too much and too varied material, just pumping it in at wild speed. The third is the most conspicuously foolish of all, to a Herlander. Oh, leaving the women out? Yes, it's so, so well, I can't express to you how ridiculous it looks. We're getting over it, I urged. Eleven states now, you know, it's getting on. Oh yes, yes, it's getting on. But I'm looking at your history, and your conditions, and your loud complaints. And then to see this great mass of fellow citizens treated as if they were there. It's unbelievable! But I told you about that before we came, said I. I told you in her land, you knew it. I knew it, truly. But Van... Suppose anyone had told you that in her land, women were the only citizens. Would that have prevented your being surprised? I looked back for a moment, remembering how we men, after living there so long, after knowing that women were the only citizens, still never got over the ever-recurring astonishment of realising it. No wonder it surprises you, dear. I should think it would, but go on about the women. I'm not touching on the women at all, Van. This is only entreating of democracy, of your country and what ails it. You see? Well, dear? See what? It is so presumptuous of me to try to explain democracy to you, an American citizen. Of course you understand, but evidently the country at large doesn't. In a monarchy, you have this one allowed ruler, and his subordinate rulers, and the people submit to them. Sometimes it works very well, but in any case it is something done for and to the people by someone they let do it. A democracy, a real one, means the people socially conscious and doing it themselves. Doing it themselves. Not just electing a ruler and subordinates and submitting to them, 
transferring the divine right of kings to the divine right of aldermen or senators. A democracy is a game everybody has to play, has to, else it is not a democracy. And here, you people deliberately left out half. But they never had been in, you know, in the previous governments. Now, Van, that's really unworthy of you. As subjects, they were the same as men, and as queens, they were the same as kings. But you began a new game, that you said must be by the people, and so on, and left out half. It was funny, I admitted, and unfortunate, but we're improving. Do go on. That's three counts, I believe, she agreed. Next lamentable mistake. Failure to see that democracy must be economic. Meaning socialism. No, not exactly. Meaning what socialism means or ought to mean. You could not have a monarchy where the king was in no way different from his subjects. A monarchy must be expressed not only in immediate symbols of robe and crown, throne and scepter, but in the palace and the court, the list of lords and gentlemen in waiting. It's all part of monarchy. So, you cannot have a democracy while there are people markedly differentiated from the others, with symbolism of dress and decoration, with courts and palaces and crowds of servitors. You can't expect all the people to be just alike, can you? No, not even to be equal. Some people will always be more valuable than others, and some more useful than others. But... A poet, a blacksmith, and a dancing master might all be friends and fellow citizens in a true democratic sense. Your millionaires vote, and your day labourers vote, but it does not bring them together as fellow citizens. That's why your little old New England towns and your fresh young western ones have more of America in them than is possible, could ever be possible, in such a political menagerie as New York, for instance. Meaning the tiger? I inquired including the tiger, with the elephant, the moose and the donkey, especially the donkey. No, I do not really mean those totems. I mean the weird collection of political methods, interests, stages of growth. New York's an oligarchy. It's a plutocracy. It's a hierarchy. It reverts to the clown system with its Irishmen, and back of that to the patriarchy with its Jews. It's anything and everything you like. But it's not a democracy. If it was, what would it do to prove it? Just what do you expect of what you call democracy? Don't you idealize it? I asked. No. She shook her head decidedly. I do not idealize it. I'm familiar with it, you see. We have one at home, you know. So they had. I had forgotten. In fact, I had not very clearly noticed. We had been so much impressed by their all being women that we had not done justice to their political development. It's no miracle, she said, just people cooperating to govern themselves. We have universal suffrage, you know, and train our children in the use of it before they come to the real thing. That far-seeing Mr. Gill is trying to do that in your public schools, I notice, and Mr. George of the Junior Republics. It requires a common knowledge of the common need, local self-management, recognising the will of the majority and a big, ceaseless, loving effort to make the majority wiser. It's surely nothing so wonderful, Van, for a lot of intelligent people to get together and manage their common interests. It certainly had worked well in her land. So well, so easily, so smoothly that it was hardly visible. But the people who get together have got to be within reach of one another, she went on. They've got to have common interests. What united action can you expect between Fifth Avenue and Avenue A? I've had all I can stand for one dose, my lady, I now protested. From what you have said, I should think your splendid child would have died in infancy, a hundred years ago. But we haven't, you see. We're alive and kicking, especially kicking. I have faith in my country yet. It is still able to lead the world, if it will, she agreed. It has still all the natural advantages it began with, and it has added new ones. 
I'm not despairing nor blaming Van. I'm diagnosing, and pretty soon I'll prescribe. But just now I suggest that we change politics for tennis. We did. I can still beat her at tennis, having played 15 years to her one, but not so often as formerly. End of chapter 6. Recording by Kate M. Chapter 7 of With Her in Our Land. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by K. Hand. With Her in Our Land by Charlotte Perkins Gilman. Chapter 7 In Our Homes. If there was one more thing than another I had wanted to show Elidor, it was our homes my home of course and others that i knew in all the peace and beauty of her land there was nowhere the small lit circle of intimate love and mutually considered comfort which means so much to us the love the comfort were everywhere to be sure but that was different it was like reflected lighting instead of a lamp on the centre table it was like an evenly steam heated house instead of one with an open fire in each room we had missed those fires, so warm to the front, so inadequate on the back, so inclusive of those who can sit near it, so exclusive of everyone else. Now, as we visited far and wide, and as Elidor, in her new capacity as speaker to clubs and churches, went farther and wider, she was becoming well acquainted with our American homes, it seemed to me. But it did not satisfy her. She had become more and more the sociologist, the investigator. They are all alike, she said. The people vary, of course, but the setting is practically the same. Why, Van, in all my visits, in so many states, in so many kind families, I found the most amusing similarity in homes. I can find the bathroom in the dark. I know just what they'll have for dinner. There seem to be only some eight or ten dinners or luncheons known. I was a little nettled, just a little. There is a limit to edible animals, if that's what you mean, I protested. Beef and veal, mutton and lamb, pig, fresh, salted, and smoked, poultry and game. Oh, and fish. That's ten, and can be stretched, of course. No, I don't mean the basis of supplies. I mean only the lack of, of specialization in it all. You see, the women have talked with me, eagerly. It really is pathetic, Van, the effort, 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 to do what ought to be so easy and the expense. We know it is laborious, but most women hold it is their duty, dear. Of course I agree with you, but most of our people don't, you see. And the men, I'm afraid, consider their own comfort. I only wish they did, she remarked surprisingly, but I'm studying the home, not merely on the economic side. I'm studying it as a world institution. It's new to me, you see. Europe, Africa, Asia, the islands, America, See here, dear, we haven't seen South America. Let's learn Spanish and go. Elidor spoke of learning a new language as if it were a dance, a brief and entertaining process. We did it too, at least she did. I knew some Spanish already and polished it up with her new enthusiasm to help. It was not until observing her intellectual processes in our journeyings together that I had realized the potential energy of the Herland mind. Its breadth and depth its calm control, its rationality, its fertility of resource, were apparent while we were there, but accustomed as I was to the common limitations of our own minds, to the narrow specialization with accompanying atrophy of other powers, to the brain fag and mental breakdown, with all the deadly lower grades of feeble-mindedness and last gulf of insanity, I had not realized that these disabilities were unknown in her land. A healthy brain does not show any more than a sick one, and the airy strength of a bounding acrobat can hardly be judged if you see him in a hammock. For this last year or two I was observing a Herland brain at work, assimilating floods of new impressions, suffering keen and severe emotional shocks, hampered by an inevitable nostalgia, and yet picking up languages in passing as one picks flowers by the roadside. We made our trip to South America, with Spanish history carefully laid in beforehand, and learned what every one of us ignorant United Statesians ought to know, that America 
is a world spanning double continent not merely a patch on one and that if we do our duty by our brother countries we may some day fill out legitimately that large high sounding name of ours and really be the united states of america i certainly have enough data now to be fair in my deduction elidor said on our home trip it has been awfully interesting visiting your world and coming back to your country now with wider knowledge and a background of experience i think i can be fairer to it so if you're ready we'll go back to where we left off that day i jumped to south america she turned over her book of notes on the united states and looked at me cheerfully homes she said the home the american home and the homes of all the rest of the world past and present i tucked the kenwood rug closer about her feet settled my own and prepared to listen yes ma'am here you and i at great expense have circled the habitable globe been most everywhere except to australasia and south africa spent a good year canvassing the u s and if you're not ready to give us your diagnosis and prescriptions why i shall lose faith in herland want it for the world or just your country she asked serenely oh well give us both you're capable of it but not quite all at once i couldn't take it in america first please it's not so long she began slowly not if you generalize safely one could of course say that because the jones children were let alone they spilled the ink teased the dog hurt the kitten let the canary out ate too much jam soiled their clothes pulled up the tulip bulbs smeared the wallpaper broke the china tore the curtains and so forth and so forth and so forth and you could tell just how it happened in each case that would take some time especially if you added a similar account of the smith children and the brown children and so on but if you say neglected children are liable to become mischievous you've said it all don't be as short as that i begged it would not be illuminating we spent many hours on the endless subject rich fruitful hours full of insight simplification and hope i'm not so shocked as i was at first she told me i've seen that europe goes on being europe even if each nation loses a million men two million men they'll grow again i see that all this horror is no new thing to the world poor world poor wretched blind baby but it's a sturdy baby for all that it's here it has not died what seems to be the matter speaking very generally is this people have not understood their works their second nature that is they have not understood that's all stupid hopelessly stupid i asked not at all not in the least but here's the trouble their minds were always filled up beforehand with what they used to believe talk about putting new wine in old bottles it's putting old wine in new bottles that has kept the world back you can see it all the way along she pursued new life continually arising new condition but always the old older oldest ideas theories beliefs every nation every race hampered and hagridden by what it used to think used to believe used to know all the nice fresh eager struggling children forcibly filled up with the same old stuff it is pretty terrible van but it's so funny that i can stand it in one way human misery is a joke because you don't have to have it then you people came over to a new continent and started a new country with a lot of new ideas yet you kept enough old ones to drown any country no wonder you've splashed so much just to keep above water I didn't say much i wanted her to work it out gradually she was letting me see her do it of course in this record i'm piecing together a great many talks a great many ideas and i'm afraid leaving out some it was no light matter she had undertaken even for a herlander this family and home idea is responsible for a great part of it she said not as i find you quite generally believe as a type and pattern of all that is good and lovely but as a persistent primitive social group interfering with the development of later groups if you look at what you ought to have evolved by this time it becomes fairly easy to see what is the matter take your own case with its wonderful new start a clean slate of a country and a very good installation of people to begin with a good religion too in essence and a prompt appreciation of the need of being generally educated then your splendid political opening the great wave of democracy pouring out into expression room for all wealth for all what should have been the result easily why van the proudest yankee southerner westerner that ever lived doesn't begin to estimate what your people might have done what they have done is a good deal but oh what they might have done 
you see they didn't understand democracy they began to play but they didn't know the game it was like a small child running a big auto democracy calls for the conscious intelligent coordinate action of all the people without it it is like a partly paralyzed king first you left out half the people an awful mistake you only gradually took in the other half you saw dimly the need of education but you didn't know what education was reading writing and arithmetic are needed even in monarchies you needed special education for the new social process democracy calls for the understanding recognition and universal practice of social laws laws which are natural like those of physics and chemistry but your religion and your education too taught authority not real law you couldn't make a good electrician on mere authority could you he has to understand not merely obey neither can you make the citizens of a democracy reverence for and submission to authority are right in monarchies wrong in democracies when demos is king he must learn to act for himself not to do as he is told and back of your christian religion is the hebrew back of that the family it all comes down to that absurd root error of the proprietary family we were easily at one in this view but i had never related it to america's political shortcomings before that old boss father is behind god she went on calmly the personal concept of god as a father with his special children his benign patronage his quick rage long anger and eternal vengeance she shivered it is an ugly picture the things men have thought about god she said slowly are a ghastly proof of the way they have previously behaved as they have improved their ideas of god have improved slowly when kings were established they crystallized the whole thing in plain sight and you had kings a very long time you see have them yet kings and fathers bosses rulers masters overlords it is all such a poor preparation for democracy fathers and kings and the hebrew deity are behind you and above you democracy is before you around you it is a thing to do you have to learn it by trying there is no tradition and no authority it calls for brave careful continuous scientific experiment with record of progress and prompt relinquishment of failures and mistakes it is open in front and in motion democracy is a going concern how a foreigner does love an idiom or a bit of slang even this hurland angel was not above it now you in young america had left off the king idea for the most part but you had the king's ancestor the father the absolute boss and you had a religion heavily weighted with that same basic concept moreover as protestants book worshippers in default of a king you must needs make a written ruler for yourselves and that poor blind blessed baby democracy promptly made itself a cast iron constitution and crawled under it that was something to chew on it was so it was undeniably so we had done just that we had been so anxious for stability as if a young living thing could remain stable the quality of stones you grew in spite of it you had to the big wild land helped and the remoteness and necessity for the individual action and continual experiment the migration of the children helped migration of the children what on earth do you mean elador why haven't you noticed hardly any of your children stay at home any more than they can help any longer than they can help and as soon as they are able they get off as far as they can they may love the old homestead but they don't stay in it this was so too you see that steadily lightens up this old mistake about authority it is the change to the laboratory system of living finding out how by doing it it does not seem to me that there is much authority left in the american home i urged all the immigrants complain of just that of course they do your immigrants naturally understand democracy even less than you do you have all of you set the word freedom over the most intricately coordinated kind of political relation you see the authority method is so simple it is an order and you merely do it no thought no effort no responsibility god says so the king or the captain says so the book says so and back of it all the family the father boss what's that nice story papa says so and if he says so it is so if it ain't so but elador really there is almost none of that in the american family surely you must have seen the difference i have in the oldest countries the most absolute father boss 
and family worship the dead father being even more potent than the live ones van dear the thing i cannot fully understand is this reverence people have for dead people why is it how is it why is a man who wasn't much when he was alive anything more when he is dead you do not really believe that people are dwindling and deteriorating from age to age do you that is precisely what we used to believe i told her for the greater part of our history for all of it really the evolution idea is still less than a century old in popular thought but you americans who are free who are progressive who are willing to change in most things why do you still talk about what your fathers said and did as if it was so important it's because of our recent birth as a nation i suppose i answered in the prodigious struggle those fathers of ours made the pilgrim fathers the church fathers the revolutionary fathers and now our own immediate fathers in the civil war but why is it that you only reverence them politically and perhaps religiously nobody quotes them in business methods in art or science or medicine or mechanics why do you assume that they were so permanently wise in knowing how to govern a huge machine-run electrically connected city-dominated nation when they were unable even to imagine it's so foolish van it is foolish i admitted it but i told her perhaps a little testily that i didn't see what our homes had to do with it then that wise lady said sweet kind discriminating things about us till i felt better and came back with smooth clarity to the subject please understand dear that i am not talking about marriage the beauty and joy and fruitful power of this dear union are a growing wonder to me you know that i knew that she made me realize it with a praising heart every day no this monogamous marriage of yours is distinctly right when it is a real one it is the making a business of it that i object to you mean the women kept at housework that's part of it about a third of it i mean the whole thing the men saddling themselves for life with the task of feeding the greedy thing and the poor children heavily stamped with it before they can escape that's the worst she stopped at that for a little so far she had not entered on the condition of women or of children in any thorough way she had notes enough volumes what i'm trying to establish is this she said slowly the connection between what seems to me errors in your social fabric and the natural result of these in your political action the family relation is the oldest the democratic relation is the newest the family relation demands close interconnected love authority and service the democratic relation demands universal justice and goodwill the capacity for the widest coordinate action in the common interest together with a high individual responsibility people have to be educated for this it is not easy your homes require the heaviest drain on personal energy on personal loyalty and leave a small percentage either of feeling or action for the state you don't expect everyone to be a statesman do you why not everyone must be in a democracy but we should not make better citizens if we neglected our homes should we does it make a man a better soldier if he stays at home to protect his family oh van dear don't you see these poor foolish fighting men are at least united coordinated making a common effort for a common cause they are or think they are protecting their homes together i suppose you mean socialism again i rather sulkily suggested but she took it very sweetly we isolated herlanders never heard of socialism she answered we had no german jewish economist to explain to us in interminable and to most people uncomprehensible prolixity the reasons why it was better to work together for common good perhaps the feminine mind did not need so much explanation of so obvious a fact we co-mothers in our isolation with a small visible group of blood relations without any father boss just saw that our interests were in common we couldn't help seeing it stop a bit sister said i are you insinuating that mr father is at the bottom of the whole trouble are you going to be as mean as adam and lay all the blame on him she laughed gleefully not quite i won't curse him i won't suggest ages of hideous injustice to all men because of the alleged transgression of one man no it is not mr father i am blaming nor his fatherhood for that is evidently the high crown of physiological transmission always these herland women bowed their heads at what they called the holy mystery of fatherhood and always we men were well not completely pleased 
"'But it does seem clear,' she went on briskly, "'that much mischief has followed from too much father. "'He did put himself forward so. "'He thought he was the whole thing, and motherhood— "'Motherhood was quite a subordinate process.' "'I always squirmed a little in the back of my mind at this attitude. "'All their tender reverence for fatherhood didn't seem in the least "'to make up for their absolute, unconscious pride in motherhood. "'Perhaps they were right.' the dominance of him she went on the egoism of him my name and not letting her have any my house my line my family if she had to be mentioned it was on the spindle side and when he is annoyed with her what's that man in cymbeline mr posthumus wishing there was some way to have children without these women it is funny now isn't it van it certainly is. Man or not, I can face facts when I see them. It is only too plain that Mr. Father has grossly overestimated his importance in the part. Don't you think the American husband and father is a slight improvement on the earlier kind? I modestly inquired, at which she turned upon me with swift caresses and delighted agreement. That's the beauty and the wonder of your country, Van. You are growing swiftly and splendidly in spite of yourselves. This great thing you started so valiantly is sweeping you along with it, educating and developing as it goes. Your men are better, your women are freer, your children have more chance to grow than anywhere on earth. That's good to hear, my dear, I said with a sigh of relief. Then why so gloomy about us? Suppose everybody was entitled to a yearly income of five thousand dollars. Suppose most people averaged about five cents. Suppose a specially able, vigorous, and well-placed group had worked it up to fifty dollars. Why, Van, your superiority to less fortunate peoples is not worth mentioning compared to your inferiority to what you ought to be. Now we are coming to it, I sighed resignedly. Pitch in, dear, give it to us. Only be sure and show the way to help it. She nodded grimly. I will do both as well as I can. Let us take physical conditions first. With your numbers, your intelligence and mechanical ingenuity, your limitless materials, the United States should by now have the best roads on earth. This would be an immediate and progressive economic advantage, and would incidentally go far to solve other problems, as you call your neglected work, such as unemployment, the Negro question, criminality, social discontent. That there are not good roads in Central Africa does not surprise nor annoy me. That they are lacking in the United States is discreditable. Granted, I said hastily, granted, absolutely, you needn't stop on that point. There's only one thing, she went on serenely. Here you are a democracy, free, the power in the hands of the people. You let that group of conservatives saddle you with a constitution which has so interfered with free action that you've forgotten you had it. In this ridiculous helplessness, like poor old Gulliver, bound by the Lilliputians, you have sat open-eyed, not moving a finger, and allowed individuals, mere private persons, to help themselves to the biggest, richest, best things in the country. You know what is thought of a housekeeper who lets dishonest servants run the house with waste and robbery, or of a king who is openly preyed upon by extortionate parasites. What can we think of a democracy, a huge, strong, young democracy, allowing itself to become infested with such parasites as these? talk of blood suckers you have your oil suckers and coal suckers water suckers and wood suckers railroad suckers and farm suckers this splendid young country is crawling with them and has not the intelligence the energy to shake them off but most of us do not believe in socialism you see i protested you believe in it altogether too much she replied flatly you seem to think that every step toward decent economic health and development has been appropriated by socialism and that you cannot do one thing toward economic freedom and progress unless you become socialists. There was something in this. I admit the socialists are partly to blame for this, she went on, with their insistent claims. But do you think it is any excuse for a great people to say, we have all believed this absurd thing because they told us so? Was it our stupidity that shocked you so at first? I ventured. She flashed a bright look at me. How brilliant of you, Van. That was exactly it, and I hated to say so to you. How can you, for instance, let that little bunch of men own all your anthracite coal, and make you pay what they choose for it? You who wouldn't pay England a little tax on tea. 
It puzzled me beyond words at first. Such intelligence, such power, such pride, such freedom, such good will, and yet such abysmal idiocy. That's what brought me around to the home, you see. We've wandered a long way from it, haven't we? No, that's just the point. You should have, but you have it. Don't you see? All these changes, which are so glaringly necessary and so patently easy to make, require this one ability, to think in terms of the community. You only think in terms of the family. Here are men engaged in some absolutely social enterprise, like the railroad business, in huge groups, most intricately coordinated. And from the dividend suckers to the road builders, every man thinks only of his pay, of what he is to get out of it. What is a railroad, you might ask them all? An investment, says the dividend sucker. A means of speculation, says the sucker at large. A paying business, says the corporate owner. A thing that pays salaries, says the officer. A thing that furnishes jobs, says the digger and builder. But what has all this to do with the home? It has this to do with it, she answered slowly and sadly. Your children grow up in charge of home-bound mothers who recognize no interest, ambition, or duty outside the home, except to get to heaven if they can. These home-bound women are man-suckers. All they get he must give them, and they want a good deal. So he says, the world is mine oyster, and says its teeth in that. It is not only this relentless economic pressure, though. What underlies it and accounts for it all is the limitation of idea. You think home, you talk home, you work home, where you should, from the earliest childhood, be seeing life in terms of the community. You could not get much fleet action from a flotilla of canoes, with every man's first duty to paddle his own, could you? What do you want done? I asked after a while. Definite training in democratic thought, feeling in action, from infancy. An economic administration of common resources under which the home would cease to be a burden and become an unconscious source of happiness and comfort. And, of course, the socialization of home industry. To be continued. End of Chapter 7Chapter 8 of With Her in Our Land. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Amelia Chesley. With Her in Our Land by Charlotte Perkins Gilman. Chapter 8 More Diagnosis. Our study of American problems went on now with persistence. Elidor was as busy, as patient, as inexorably efficient as an eminent surgeon engaged in a first-class operation. We studied together, she wrote carefully from time to time, and read me the results, or part of them. And we talked at all hours, not only between ourselves, but with many other persons, of all kinds and classes. I've seen the ruined lands that were once so rich, she said one day and the crowded lands now being drained by a too thick population. Those blind mothers, can't they once think of what is going to happen to their children? But here I see land in plenty, carelessly skimmed and left, or not even skimmed, just lying open to the sun, while your squeezed millions smother in the cities. You are used to it. To you it is merely a fact, accepted without question. To an outsider, it seems as horribly strange as to see a people living in cellars thick and crawling, while great airy homes stand empty above. My study is mainly to get at your state of mind, to understand, if possible, what mysterious ideas and convictions keep you so poor, so dirty, so crowded, so starved, so ill-clothed, so unhealthy, so unhappy, when there is no need of it. Now, look here, Elidor. That's rather strong, isn't it? You surely don't describe the American people that way. Then she produced another of those little groups of assorted statistics she was so fond of. She gave the full wealth of the country, as at present administered, and showed that it ought to give nearly two thousand dollars to each of us. That is per capita, you see, Van, not per family. For a family of five, that would be nine or ten thousand, not a bad nest egg besides what they earn. 
Then she showed me the estimate made by our latest scientific commission of inquiry, that fully one half of our wage earners do not receive income sufficient to maintain healthful conditions of living. A world almanac was at hand, and she pointed out on page 228 the summary of manufacturers. Here you have enough to show how people live in this splendid country, Van. See here. Average number of wage earners, 6,615,046. Wages, 3,427,038,000, which being divided gives to each $518 plus. Less than 520 a year, Van. Less than $10 a week to keep a family, average family, five, $104 a year, $2 a week apiece for Americans to live on. And you know what food and rent costs? Of course, they are not healthy. How could they be? I looked at the figures uncomfortably. She gave me a few more. Salaried employees average 1187 plus. That's a bit more than twice as much, about $4.40 a week apiece for Americans to live on. How much do you want them to have? I asked a little irritably, but she was sweetly patient, inquiring, how much would you be willing to live on, or how little, rather? I don't mean luxuries, I mean a decent, healthy life. Think you could do it on $4.40? Think you could do it on less than $6, say? Rent, board, clothing, car fares? Now, I had spent a few months during my youth living on a modest salary of $10 a week, and remembered it as a period of hardship and deprivation. There was $6 a week for board, $0.60 cents for car fare, $0.90 cents for my modest $0.15 cent lunches, $0.70 cents for tobacco. It left $1.80 for clothing and amusements, if any. I had thought it hard enough at that time to endure life on $10 a week for one. It had never occurred to me that the working man had to keep five on it. And here were six million of them who did, it appeared, and a lot of clerks who were only twice as well off. Ten dollars a week for each person is little enough for a decent living in this country, isn't it, man? That would call for fifty dollars a week for a family of five. Two thousand six hundred a year. But, my dear girl, the business would not stand it. You ask impossibilities, I protested. She turned to her figures again. Here's the value added by manufacturer, she said. That must be what these workers produce, isn't it? Eight billion five hundred and thirty million two hundred and sixty one thousand. Now we'll take out these wages. It leaves five billion one hundred and three million two hundred and twenty three thousand dollars. Then we'll take out the salaries. That leaves four billion thirty one million six hundred and forty nine thousand. Where does that go? Here is a $4 billion item for services. Whose? It must be those proprietors and firm members. Only 273,265 of them. Let's see. Out of that 4 billion, they get nearly 16,000 a year each. Don't you think it is a little remarkable, Van? These services are valued at 14 times as much as those of the salaries of employees and 30 times as much as the workers. My dear girl, I said, you have the most wonderful mind I ever lived with, ever met, and you know more than I do about ever so many things. But you haven't touched economics yet. There are laws here which you take no notice of. And I told her of the iron law of wages, the law of supply and demand, and others. She listened, giving careful attention. You call them laws, she said presently. Are they laws of nature? Why, yes, I agreed slowly. Of human nature acting under economic conditions. Surely the economic conditions are those of soil, climate, materials available, the amount and quality of strength, intelligence, scientific, and mechanical development. Why, of course, but also there are those I have mentioned. 
do you mean to tell me that it is a law of nature for men to arrange their working and paying so that half the people shall be unhealthy do you really believe for a minute that this has to be so but i was not prepared to repudiate all my education in economics at once and doggedly pointed out it is a law of human nature then she smiled at me with cheerful derision i am glad to say that elidor had risen above the extreme horror and pain of her first year among us and was able to smile at what used to bring distress it must be male human nature quoth she we have no such law in her land but you are all sisters i said rather lamely well you are all sisters and brothers aren't you of course van i know the difference you have had your long history of quarrels and hatred of inimical strange races of conquest and slavery it looks to me as if the contempt of the rich for the poor was a lineal descendant of that of the conqueror for the vanquished a helpless enemy a slave a serf an employee and the state of mind coming along unchanged but the funny part of it is that in this blessed land with more general good will and intelligence than i have found anywhere you should have allowed this old foolishness to hang on so long now van dear don't you see how foolish it is this is a democracy to be efficient that demands a competent electorate doesn't it why we know that i answered with some heat those forefathers of ours that you so scoff at knew that much that's why we have our great system of free public education from kindergarten to college and in nineteen fourteen said elidor turning to that handy volume again you had a public school primary enrollment of seventeen million nine hundred and thirty four thousand nine hundred and eighty two a drop in high school enrollment down to one million two hundred and eighteen thousand eight hundred and four only one out of seventeen to get that far and another drop to a college enrollment of eighty seven thousand eight hundred and twenty that free public education does not seem to go far does it but most of these children have to go to work early they cannot take the time for more education even if they could afford it does going to work early make them better citizens i dare say it does some of the college graduates aren't any too good she shook her head at this and confronted me with more figures the college graduate certainly made a pretty good showing and the terrible dregs as she called the criminals and paupers were not as a rule well educated do look at it reasonably van i'm not trying to be unpleasant and i know i'm ignorant of this economics you talk of but i'm looking as a stranger of average intelligence and with the additional advantage of an entirely different background at your country you have natural advantages as good as earth affords you have plenty of room you have good racial stocks in large variety you have every element of wealth you have a good many true principles to go on and yet in the time you have been at it in a hundred and forty years you have built up the most crowded cities on earth robbed neglected and wasted the soil made politics a thing of shame developed private wealth that is monstrous and general poverty that is disgraceful there was some silence after this it was extremely unpleasant it was quite true i know it is better here than in europe she went on i know that with all your imperfections and errors you are better off than germany poor mistaken germany so authoritatively perfect that she became proud so proud that she became hateful so hateful that it will take generations before the world can forgive her you are not lost van not a bit of it but surely you can see that it is as i say i could who couldn't it is very easy for me to show what could be done how easily and how soon in ten years time you could see an end of poverty in twenty of crime in thirty of disease this whole great land could be as fair and clean and healthy and happy as my own and vastly richer in products even richer in happiness with this heaven of married love to crown all else she took my hand at the end and was still for a little 
but for the most part you don't have that she continued evenly then i've been reading i've been talking with doctors and many wise persons and it seems to me dear that you don't appreciate marriage i had to grin at that this herlander who never saw a man till a few years ago and had only married one of them moreover i recalled with a momentary touch of bitterness that we were not married people at present not in the usual sense and then i was ashamed i had accepted my bargain such as it was with open eyes i had had all this time of unbroken happy love living so near a beautiful woman who gave me comfort and rest and calmness in some mysterious supersexual way and keeping always the dear hope of a further fulfillment we had had no misunderstandings no quarrels and while i owned that at first there had been periods of some unease for me they were as nothing to our larger joy it was as if in clean vigor and activity i was on an expedition with a well-loved sister a sister dearer and sweeter than all the world and with that background of a still happier future from this i looked at the world about me seeing it as i had never seen it before as it was all the eager fresh young boys and girls all the happy hopeful lovers the marriages and then how painful a portion of miserable failures it was not only the divorces not only the undivorced ill-doing but the low order of happiness among so many that was what elidor had in mind with her fine sense of personal relationship she did not know as much as i of the deeper gulf what she meant was the dreary level you make fun of it you know she went on it's a joke a question for discussion is marriage a failure it is being discussed by many ignored made the subject of cheap talk there are many who feel this i answered her there is a great effort to check the divorce evil to preserve the sanctity of marriage another thing my elador had learned i think from being in america was a spice of mischief it became her well with a mind as keen and powerful as hers lack of humor would have been a serious loss have they tried benzoate to preserve the sanctity of marriage she inquired or is it enough to be hermetically sealed under pressure at the boiling point i'm not much of a cook nor is she for that matter but i could smile at that too without going into the marriage question at present i wish you would go on with your herland view of economics i told her it looks to me as if you wanted to adopt socialism at once and that's out of the question most of us don't believe in it most of you don't seem to understand it it seems to me she answered if you mean by socialism the principles of socialism yes that is the way we manage in her land the land is ours visibly we never divided it up into little bits as you people have what we raised on it and out of it was ours too visibly when there was little we had little children first of course and now that there is a balanced plenty why of course everyone has enough had you no selfish women no ambitious women no superwomen trying to get ahead of the others why of course we had still have some few well how did you manage them why that is what government is for isn't it she replied to preserve justice to prevent the selfish and ambitious from injuring the others to see to it that production is increased and distributed fairly carried on we say that government is the best that governs least i told her yes i've heard that do any of you really believe it why do you believe it how can you but look at germany i cried there you see what comes of too much government i wish you would look at germany every other nation might study germany with great improvement she replied a little hotly just because germany has gone criminally insane that is no reason for underrating all the magnificent work she has done the attitude of some people toward germany is like that of your lynchers nations that do wrong are not to be put to death with torture surely 
Like individual criminals, they need study, help, better conditions. I think Germany is one of the most glorious, pathetic, awful examples of, of the way our world works, she concluded solemnly. They wouldn't thank you for calling them pathetic, I said. No, I know they wouldn't. Their weakest spot is their blind pride. I find all your nations are proud. It's easy to see why. Well, if you see it easily, do tell us. Why, it's one of your laws of nature, she explained with a twinkle in her eye. You know something of perspective? The farther a thing is away from you, the smaller it is, the less well you can see it, the less you are able to understand it, and by the law of nature, you look down upon it. That was the reason when nations were really far apart and separate. Now that you are all so close together, you should have long since come to see and know and understand and work together. That means love, you know. But to prevent that are two big, unnecessary, foolish things. One is ignorance, the common ignorance which takes the place of distance. The man next door is as strange as the man in the Antipodes, if you don't know him. The nations of the earth don't try to understand each other, Van. Then, as a positive evil, you have each built up for yourselves an artificial wall of brag and boastfulness. Each nation ignores the other nations and deliberately teaches its helpless children that it alone is the greatest and best. Why, Van? The tears always came when she touched upon children, but this time they vanished in a flashing smile. Children, she said. Anything more like the behavior of a lot of poor little underbred children, it would be hard to find. Quarrelsome, selfish, each bragging that he can lick the others. Oh, you poor dears, how you do need your mother, and she's coming at last. I suppose you think she will solve these economic problems forthwith. Why not, then? Look here, dear. Why can't you people see that... Here she spoke very slowly, as if she were writing some ABCs very large on a blackboard. There is nothing to prevent human beings in this historic period from being healthy, beautiful, rich, intelligent, good, and happy. That's easy to say, my dear, I remarked rather glumly. I wish it was true. Why isn't it true, she demanded. Do you think Satan prevents you, or God? Or what? Don't you see? Can't you see? God's on the side of all the growing good of life. God's with you. What's against? I suppose it is only ourselves, I agreed. But that's something. Of course I know what you mean. We could conceivably do and be all that you say. But there's an if. An if as big as all the world. If we knew what to do and if we would act together. That is not half such an obstacle as you think, Van. You know enough now easily to set everything going in the right direction. It doesn't have to be done by hand, you know. It does itself give it a chance. You know what to do for one baby to give it the best chance of health, full growth, and happy usefulness, don't you? Well, yes, we do know that much, I admitted. Very well, then, do it for all of them, and you lift the whole stock. That's easy. You know how good roads, waterways, and efficient transportation build up the wealth of a community. Very well, have them everywhere. She was splendid in her young enthusiasm. That keen, strong face, all lit and shining with love for the naughty world and wise suggestions for its betterment. But I could not catch the fire. I don't want to dash your hopes, my dear, I told her gently. You are, in a sense, correct. Even I could make a plan that would straighten things out quite a bit. The difficulty is to get that plan accepted by the majority. No king is going to do it, and in a democracy you have to convince more than half the people. That's slow work. She sat silent, looking out of our high hotel window and thinking of what I said. It isn't as if our minds were empty, said I. We don't think we're ignorant. We think we know it all. 
Only the wise are eager to learn, I'm afraid, and for everything you tell the people as truth, there are no end of other teachers to tell them something else. It's not so easy as it looks. There's more excuse for us than would appear at first sight. We had made special studies, as we traveled about, of different industries and social conditions. Now we plunged more deeply into economics, politics, and the later researches of sociology and social psychology. Elidor became more and more interested. Again and again she wished for the presence and help of certain of her former teachers in her land. How they would love it, she said. They wouldn't be tired or discouraged. They'd just plunge in and find a way to help in no time. Even I can see something. From time to time she gave me the benefit of the things she saw. The reason we had so little trouble is that we had no men. I'm sure of that. The reason you have made so much progress is because you have had men. I'm sure of that, too. Men are splendid, but... Here was a marked pause. The reason you had so much trouble is not because of the men, but because of this strange dissociation of the men and women. Instead of the smooth, helpful interrelationship, you have so much misery. I never knew, of course not, how could I, that there could be such misery. To have two kinds of people, evidently adapted for such perfect coordinate action, once in a while you see it, even now, and then to have them hurt and degrade one another so. Another time she propounded this suggestion. Can't some of your big men, and women of course, work out an experiment station in methods of living, an economic and social unit, you know, to have for reference? to establish facts as you do in other things? What do you mean, I asked her. Compulsory eugenics and a cooperative colony? Don't tease me, Van. I'm not as foolish as that. No, what I mean is something like this. Take a given piece of ground, most anywhere, and have it surveyed by competent experts to see how much it could produce under the best methods known then see how many persons it would take to do the necessary work to ensure that production. Then see by what arrangements of living those persons could be kept healthful and happy at the least expense. For that unit, you'd have something to go on, some definite proof of what the country could do. You leave out the human side of the problem, my dear. We have so many different causes for living, where and how and as we do, our people are not pawns on a chessboard. They can't be managed to prove theories. It was no wonder that Elidor, for all her wonderful clarity of vision, her exceptional advantage of viewpoint, should be somewhat overwhelmed in our sociological morass. The very simplicity and ease of living to which she was accustomed made her see a delusive simplicity and ease in attempting to solve our problem. How about the diagnosis, I suggested? Suppose we merely consider symptoms a while. What strikes you most forcibly in the way of symptoms? Physically? Yes, physically first. As to the land, neglect, waste, awful glaring waste, she answered promptly. It makes me sick. It makes me want to cry. As a mere wilderness, of course, it would be interesting. But as a wilderness with a hundred million people in it, and such able people, I don't know whether it is more laughable or horrible. As to the water, neglect and waste again, and hideous suicidal defilement. As to means of communication, words failed her. You know how I feel about your roads and the city streets are worse. One would think to see the way you rip up and lay down in your cities that an organized group of human habitations had never been built before. Such childish experiments over and over and over. Why, a city van is no new thing. It can be foreseen and planned for. That was done in ancient Egypt, in Assyria, and today with all you know, with the whole past to learn from. Van, as I come into your cities by rail and see the poor, miserable, dirty, unhealthy things, it makes me feel almost as badly as those European battlefields. They are at least trying to kill one another. You are doing it unconsciously. A city should be the loveliest thing. Why, you remember. Oh, Van. 
For the moment, homesickness overcame her. I did remember. From that first low flight of ours soaring across the garden land, that fruitful park and pleasure ground, with its little villages so clean, so bright in color, so lovely in arrangement, lying here and there among the green, all strung together by those smooth shaded roads and winding paths. From that bird's eye view to my later more intimate knowledge, I recalled them with deep admiration and with a painful envy. They had no slums, not in all her land. They had no neglected dirty places. They had no crowded tenements. They lived in houses, and the houses were in gardens, and their manufacturing, storing, and exchanging, all the larger business of life, was carried on in buildings, if possible, even more lovely than their dwelling houses. It could be done. I had seen it. I don't wonder you cry, my dear. The designs for such a city, glorious in beauty, have been already made and worked out in extreme detail by Hendrik Andersen and his friends. The greatest artists in the world would be proud to give their best to build and beautify it. America could give little in works of art, and her land is not so available for such a purpose as something nearer Europe, but she could give engineering and mechanical skill, materials, and money. The thing could be in good running order inside of five years. It took but ten to open the Panama Canal, and that, all told, cost but $375 billion. Say, we took half a billion for the world city since our present national wealth of 187,739,071,000 dollars allows to each of us, man, woman, and child, $1,877, if we all had an equal share in it, it would seem simplicity itself to have each of that hundred million of us contribute ten dollars, and there is a billion at once. There is money enough, there is land enough, there is labor enough, there is intelligence enough, there is art, science, invention enough, there is love enough. Why don't we do it? End of chapter 8、chapter、nine of With Her in Our Land Chapter Her Land Land This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Amelia Chesley. With Her in Our Land by Charlotte Perkins Gilman. Chapter 9. This is the most fascinating study, Elidor announced one day. At home, we are so smoothly happy, so naturally growing, that it's almost unconscious. Here, if you have not happiness, you have a call on all your sympathy, all your energy. All your pride. You have such a magnificent opportunity. I've gone deeper into my diagnosis, dear, she continued, and have even some prescriptions. Be patient while I generalize a little more. You see, this case has so many diseases at once that one has to discriminate a bit. Here is the young, new made country, struggling out of the old ones to escape their worst diseases, breaking loose from monarchy, from aristocracy. And feudalism with its hereditary grip on land and money, on body and soul, and most of all from that mind crushing process of enforced belief which had kept the whole world back so long. Note, she interpolated, it is easy to see that as man progresses in social relation, he needs more and more a free, strong, agile mind with sympathetic perception and understanding and the full power of self chosen action. The enforced belief in any religion. Claiming to be the final truth, cripples the mind along precisely those lines, tending to promote a foolish sense of superiority to other believers or disbelievers, running to extremes of persecution, preventing sympathy, perception, and understanding, and reducing action to mere obedience. There, she said cheerfully, if America had done nothing but that, established the freedom of thought and belief, she would have done world service of the highest order. The Greeks allowed it, didn't they? And the Romans, I offered. If they did, it was a lost art afterward, she replied. Anyhow, you did it later, and you have gone on doing it splendidly. 
Then, in establishing a beginning of democracy, you performed another great service. This has not progressed as successfully, first because of its only partial application, second because you did not know it needed to be earnestly studied and taught. You thought you had it once and for all just by letting men vote, and third because it has been preyed upon by both parasites and diseases. In the matter of religion, you threw off an evil restriction and let the mind grow free, a natural process. In the matter of government, you established a social process, one requiring the utmost knowledge and skill. So it is no wonder the result has been so poor. Prescription as to government. A. Enfranchisement of all adult citizens. You have started on this. B. Special training and practice in the simpler methods and principles of democratic government as far as known for all children with higher courses and facilities for experiment and research for special students. You are beginning to do this already. C. Careful analysis and reports on the diseases of democracy with applied remedies and as careful study of the parasites affecting it with sharp and thorough treatment. Even this you are beginning. A little severe on the parasites, aren't you? I asked. It is time you were severe on them, Van. I'm no Buddhist. I'm a forester. When I see trees attacked by vermin, I exterminate the vermin if I can. My business is to raise wood, fruit, nuts, not insects. Except, of course, when the mulberry tree is sacrificed to the silkworms, I suggested. But she merely smiled at me. You need to transfer to your democracy the devotion you used to have for your kings, she went on. To kill a common man was murder. To kill a king was regicide. You have got to see that for one man to rob another man is bad enough. For a man to rob the public is worse. But to rob the public through the government is a kind of high treason, which, if you still punished by torture, would be deserving of the most excruciating kind. As it is, you have allowed the practice to become so common that it is scarcely condemned at all. You do not even call it robbery. You call it graft or pork or a plum tree or some such polite term. Of course, I knew all this, but I never had felt it as anything particularly dreadful. Don't you see, she went on, the government is the social motor system. By means of it, society learns as a baby learns to check some actions and to make others. If your government is sick, you are paralyzed, weakened, confused, unable to act. In practical instance, your city governments are frequently corrupt from the policemen up. Therefore, when with infinite labor the public feeling has been aroused to want something done, you find that the machinery to do it with won't work. What you do not seem to realize at all is that the specific evil you seek to attack is not nearly so serious as the generic evil, which makes your whole governmental system so, so groggy, I suggested with a wry smile. Yes, that's about it, as weak and slow and wavering as a drunken man. Remedy, I demanded. Remedy? Why, that comes under C in those I just gave, she said. It needs full study and careful experiment to decide on the remedies. But here is what might be done at once. A report be made which should begin with a brief survey of the worst cases of governmental corruption in other countries, past and present. Not only in general, but with specific instances, people called by name with their crimes clearly shown. What such and such a person cost his country. How such decisive battles were lost because of such crippling disorders in the government. Parallel made between conspicuous traitors, already recognized and this kind. Report now brought to our own country, with both summary and instances. Our waterways described what has been done legitimately to improve them, and what has been done illegitimately to hinder, pervert, and prevent right government action. History of our river and harbor bills given, and brought down to date, with this last huge steal now accomplished, and not even rebuked. Names should be given, and names called. The congressmen and senators concerned, and the beneficiaries in the localities thus nefariously fattened. This kind of thing could be put simply and briefly, so that the children could understand. 
They should be taught early and steadily how to judge the men who corrupt the very vitals of their country. Also how to judge the lazy shirks who do not even vote, much less study how to help the country. It needs, it needs a new kind of public opinion, doesn't it? I ventured. Of course it does, but new public opinion has to be made. It takes no great genius to recognize a thief and a traitor once he is shown up, but yours are not shown up. Why, Elidor, I'm sure there's a lot about this in the papers. She looked at me, just looked at me, and her expression was like that of an overripe volcano firmly suppressed. For heaven's sake, let it out, Elidor. Say it quick and say it all. What's the matter with the papers? She laughed. Fortunately, she could laugh, and I laughed with her. I couldn't say it all under ten volumes, she admitted, but I'll say some of it. This is a special department. I must begin again. This whole matter of societies, parasites, and diseases is intensely interesting. We, in her land, being normal, have not realized our society much any more than a healthy child realizes her body. I noticed that Elidor and her sisters always said she and her, as unconsciously as we say he and his. Their reason, of course, is that all the people are she. Our reason is not so justifiable. But the rest of the world seems to be painfully conscious of its social body without being able to help it much. Now, you know there are diseases and diseases, some much preferable to others. In their degree of danger, they vary much, and in what they are dangerous to. One might better have a very sick leg than an even partly sick heart or brain. Rheumatism, for instance, is painful and crippling, but when it reaches the heart, it becomes fatal. Some creatures cannot have certain diseases for lack of material. One does not look for insanity in an angleworm or neurasthenia in a clam. Society, as it has developed new functions, has developed new diseases. The daily press is one of the very newest social functions, one of the very highest, one of the most measureless importance. That is why the rheumatism of the press is worse than rheumatism of the farm or the market rheumatism of the press. Yes, that's a poor figure, perhaps. I mean any serious disease is worse there than in some lower or less important function. Look at the whole thing again, Van. Society, in the stage of democracy, needs to be universally informed, mutually sympathetic, quick and strong to act. For this purpose, it must introduce machinery to develop intelligence, to supply information, to arouse and impart feeling, to promote prompt action. The schools are supposed to train the intelligence, but your press is the great machine through which the democracy is informed, aroused, and urged to act. It is the social sensorium. Through it, you see and hear and feel collectively. Through it, you are incited to act collectively. It is later, and by that much higher than the school and the church, it is the necessary instrument of democracy. Admitted, all admitted, but isn't that our general belief, dear, though perhaps not so clearly put? Yes, you seem to think a great deal of your press, so much so that you cannot see, much less cure, its diseases. Well, you are the doctor. Pitch in. I suppose you know there are many and fierce critics of our sensational press and our venal press. Oh, yes, I have read some of the criticisms. They don't touch it. Go on and touch it yourself, sister. I'm listening. She was too serious to be annoyed at my light manner. It's like this, she said slowly. This great new function came into being in a time when people were struggling with what seemed more important issues. Were, perhaps. In Europe, it has become very largely a tool of the old governments, here, fearing that, it has been allowed to become the tool of individuals, and now of your plutocratic powers. You see, you changed your form of government, but failed to change your ideas and feelings to go with it. You allow it to go on over your heads, as if it were a monarchy, and none of your business. And you jealously refuse to give it certain necessary tools, 
as if it were a monarchy and would misuse them what you have got to learn is to keep your government the conscious determined action of the majority of the people and see that it has full power a democracy is self-government the united self of the people is that self-control the best that self-controls the least do you want a government-owned press i inquired we see that in europe and do not like it you mean a monarchy controlled press do you not no i do not mean anything like that you should have a press with democratic control surely and that means all the people or at least the majority of them what you have now is a press controlled by starkly mercenary motives of individuals and the more powerful purposes of your big interests what are you going to do that's what i want to know lots of people criticize our press but no one seems able to suggest the better method some propose endowment we must have freedom of expression you mustn't expect too much of me man i can see the disease is easier than the cures of course it seems to me that you could combine perfect freedom of opinion comment idea with the most authoritative presentation of the facts do you think a government-run paper could be trusted to give the facts correctly if it did not there would be heavier charges against it than could be survived over election what you have not recognized yet is the social crime of misrepresenting the facts your papers lie as they please we have our libel laws i didn't say libel i said lie they lie on whichever side they belong and there is no penalty for it i laughed as an american would penalty for lying he was going to throw the first stone exactly that's the awful part of it van your people are so used to public lying that you don't mind you are paralyzed benumbed calloused to certain evils you should be keenly alive to there are plenty of much less dangerous things you make far more noise about you see the press is suffering from a marked confusion of function it makes all its proud claims for freedom and protection as an expression of public opinion as a medium of information and then makes its main business the cheapest kind of catering to prejudices and to a market the market of the widest lowest popular taste for literary amusement why does the palladium of your liberties have to carry those mind-weakening soul-degenerating comics they are neither information nor opinion only bait the people would not buy the papers if they were not amusing what people would not wouldn't you oh i would of course i want to know the news i mean the lower classes and these lower classes so low that they take no interest in the news of the day and have to be given stuff suited to imbeciles imbeciles with slightly criminal tastes are they a large and permanent part of your democracy you mean that we ought to put out decent papers and see that the people are educated up to them why not i was trying to see why not but she went on if your papers were what they ought to be they could be used in the schools should be so used every boy and girl in the high school should take the current events course each day they should be required to read the brief clear summary of real news which would not be a long task and required to state what seemed to them most important and why this array of crimes and casualties you print is not news it is as monotonous as the alphabet all that needs is a mere list a bulletin from the sick chamber of society interesting only to the specialist but the children should be taught to see the world move every day to be interested to feel responsible people educated like that wouldn't need to be baited with foul stuff to read the papers for the life of me i couldn't see anything the matter with this if we can trust our government with the meteorological reports why not with the social ones the best brains the best backing the whole country watching she continued papers that gave the news and people who could read them then your comment and opinion could be as free as it pleased on the side anybody could publish all of that she wanted to but why should private opinion be saddled on the public facts then all right 
diagnosis accepted with reservations, remedy proposed too suspiciously simple. But go ahead, what else ails us? With every adult enfranchised, the newspapers reliable, our natural resources properly protected, developed, and improved, would that do for a starter? Not while half the people do not earn enough to be healthy. I groaned. All right, let's get down to it. Bring on your socialism. Do you want it by evolution or revolution or both? She was not deceived by my mock pathos. What is your prejudice against socialism, Van? Why do you always speak as if it were slightly ridiculous? I considered for a moment, thoughtfully. I suppose it is on account of my college education and the kind of people I have lived with most, I answered. And what is your own sincere view of it? That had to be considered, too. Why, I suppose the theory is right enough, I began, but she stopped me to ask, What is the theory as you see it? Then I was obliged to exhibit my limitations, for all I could produce was what I had heard other people say about it what I could remember of various articles and reviews, mostly adverse, a fruitless excursion into the dogmatic mazes of Marx, and a most unfavorable impression of certain socialist papers and pamphlets I had seen. That's about what I find everywhere, she was good enough to say. That is your idea of it. Now, very honestly, what is your feeling about it? Say it right out, please. So, without waiting to be careful and to see if my feelings bore any relation to my facts, I produced a jumble of popular emotions, to the effect that socialism was a lazy man's paradise, that it was an effort of the underdog to get on top, that it was an unfair evening down of the rewards of superior ability with those of the inferior, that it was a class movement full of hatred and injustice, that nobody would be willing to do the dirty work, and that such a world wouldn't be worth living in anyhow. Elidor laughed merrily, both at this nondescript mass of current misconception, and at my guilty yet belligerent air, as who should say, it may be discreditable, but that's the way I feel. She sobered soon enough, and looked far past me, through me. It's not you, Van dear, she said. It's America talking. And America ought to be ashamed of itself, to have so little vision, to be so gullible, to believe so easily what the least study would disprove, to be so afraid of the very principles on which this nation rests. This nation rests on the principle of individual liberty, not on government ownership, I protested. What individual liberty has the working man, she countered? What choice of profession has his ill-born, ill-fed, ill-clothed, ill-taught child. The thing you call free competition is long past, and you never saw it go. You see ideas stay fixed in people's minds long after the facts have changed. Your industrial world is in a state of what Kent called feudalism, and he was right. It is like Europe under the robber barons, and your struggling trade unions are like the efforts of the escaping serfs in that period. It only takes a little history in economics to see the facts. The perplexing part of the problem to me is the dullness of the popular mind. You Americans are an intelligent people and a somewhat educated people, but you can't seem to see things. Are we any blinder than other people, my lady? Do they recognize these glaring facts any better than we do? Elidor sat still a moment, running over her fresh, clear view of the world, past and present. No, she said. No other people is any better, in all ways, except New Zealanders, perhaps. Yet ever so many countries are wiser in some particulars, and you, with all your advantages, haven't sense enough to see it. Oh, I know you'll say the others don't see it either, but you ought to. You are free and you are able to act when you do see. No, Van, there's no excuse for you. You had supreme advantages. You made a brave start. You established a splendid beginning, and then you sat back and bragged about your ancestors and your resources, 
and your prospects and let the vermin crawl all over you. Her eyes were grave, her tone solemn, her words most offensive. Look here, Elidor, why will you use that term? It's very disagreeable. What else can you call these people who hang like clusters of leeches on the public treasury, who hop like fleas to escape the law, who spin webby masses of special legislation in which to breed more freely, who creep and crawl on every public work that is undertaken, and flatten undisturbed on all private business? What do you call your sidewalk speculators in theater tickets, for instance, but vermin? Just to steal a ticket and go to see the play would be a clean, manly thing to do compared to this. They are small ones, openly disgusting, yet you do nothing but grumble a little. To turn from little to big, I want to know what you call your sleeping car extortionists. What is the size limit of vermin anyhow? I suppose if a flea was a yard long, he would be a beast of prey, wouldn't he? You certainly are drastic, my dear girl. But what have you got against the sleeping cars? I always thought our service was pretty good. She shook her head slowly, regarding me with that motherly patient expression. The resignation of the American public to its devourers is like that of, of a sick kitten. You remember that poor little lean thing we picked up and had to drop quick and brush ourselves? Why, Van Jennings, don't you even know you are being robbed to the bone by that sleeping car company? Look here, please. Then she produced one of those neat little sheets of figures I had so learned to respect. Most damaging things, Elidora's figures. Twelve double berths to a car beside the stateroom, or rooms which I won't count. Twenty-four passengers who have already bought a ticket on which they are entitled to transportation with accommodations in the day coach. Usual price, five dollars for twenty-four hours. For this five dollars, the passenger receives by day a whole seat instead of a half one, unless there is a day crowd and then extra seats are cheerfully sold to other victims. I have seen sleeping cars crowded to standing. By night, he has a place to lie down, three by three by six with a curtain for privacy. Well, but he is being carried on his journey all the time, I urged. So he is in the day coach, or chair car. This money is not for transportation, that's paid for. It is for special accommodation. I am speaking of the kind of accommodation and what is extorted for it. The night arrangements are what you know. Look at the price. Two dollars and a half isn't so much, I urged but she pursued relentlessly. Wouldn't you think it was much here in this hotel for a space of that size? I looked about me at the comfortable room in the first-class hotel where we were then lodged and thought of the preceding night when we had had our two berths on the car. Here was a room 12 by 14 by 10. There were two windows. There was a closet and a bathroom. There was every modern convenience in furniture. There was a wide, comfortable bed. My room adjoined it, equally large and comfortable. This is two dollars for twenty-four hours, she remarked. That was five dollars. Sleeping cars are expensive to build, I remarked feebly. More expensive than hotels, she asked. The hotel must pay ground rent and taxes. The sleeping cars are not always full, I urged. Neither are the hotels, are they? But the car has to be moved. Yes, and the railroad company pays the sleeping car for being moved, she triumphed. I wanted to say something about service. Tried to, but she made merry over it. They have one conductor for their string of sleepers, and as to porters, we mostly pay them, you know. I did know, of course. This is how I have figured it, said Elidor. Of course I don't know the exact facts about their business, and they won't tell, but look at it this way. Suppose they average 20 passengers per car, staterooms and all, at $5 a day. That's $100 a day income, 36500 a year per car. Now they pay the porter about $30 a month, I understand, or less, leaving the public to do the rest. Each car's fraction of the conductor's wages wouldn't be more than $20, I should think. 
there is fifty dollars a month, six hundred a year for service, and there is laundry work and cleaning, forty sheets, pillowcases, towels, flat work rates, of course, and renovating at the end of the journey. I don't believe it comes to over, say, eight hundred dollars a year. Then there is insurance, deprecation, and repairs. Look here, Elidora, where did you get up these technicalities? Talking with businessmen, I suppose, as usual? Yes, of course, she agreed, and I'm very proud of them. Well, I'll allow sixteen hundred a year for that. That is three thousand for their running expenses. And remember, they are paid something for running. I don't know how much. That leaves thirty-three thousand five hundred dollars. I will magnanimously leave off that three thousand five hundred dollars for times when they carried fewer passengers. Call it a clear income of thirty thousand dollars a year. Now that is ten percent of three hundred thousand dollars. You don't honestly suppose that one sleeping car costs three hundred thousand dollars, do you, Van? I did not. I knew better. Anybody knows better. If it costs one hundred thousand dollars to build and fit a sleeping car, she went on calmly, then they could charge about a dollar seventy five for their berths and still make money, as you call it. If 10% is a legitimate profit, I call the extra 20% a grinding extortion. What do you call it? Up to date, I never called it anything. I never noticed it. She nodded. Exactly. You people keep quiet and pay three times what it is necessary for the right to live. You are bled, sucked night and day in every direction. Now then, if these bloodsuckers are beasts of prey, fight them, conquer them. If they are vermin, oh, I know you don't like the word, but Van, what is your estimate of people who are willing to endure vermin? End of chapter 9Chapter 10 of With Her in Our Land. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by K. Hand. With Her in Our Land by Charlotte Perkins Gilman. Chapter 10. Going about with Elidor among familiar conditions and seeing things I never dreamed were there was always interesting, though sometimes painful. It was like carrying a high-powered light into dark places. As she turned her mind upon this or that feature of American life, it straightway stood out sharply from the surrounding gloom, as the moving searchlight of a river boat brings out the features of the shore. I had known clever women, learned women, even brilliant women, a few, but the learned ones were apt to be a bit heavy. The clever ones twinkled and capered like spangled acrobats, and the brilliant ones shone, indeed like planets among stars, but somehow did not illuminate much. Elidor was simple enough, modest enough. She was always keeping in mind how little she knew of our civilization, but what she saw, she saw clearly and was able to make her hearers see. As I watched her, I began to understand what a special strength it was not to have in one's mind all the associate ideas and emotions ours are so full of. She could take up the color question, for instance, and discuss it dispassionately, with no particular sentiment one way or the other. I heard her once with a southern sociologist, who was particularly strong on what he called race conflict. He had been reading a paper at some scientific meeting which we attended, a most earnest paper, full of deep feeling and some carefully selected facts. He spoke of the innate laziness of the Negro race, their inborn objection to work, their ineducability, very strong on this, but his deepest horror was miscegenation. This he alluded to in terms of the utmost loathing, hardly mitigated by the statement that it was impossible. There is, he averred, an innate, insuperable, ineradicable, universal race antipathy, which forever separates the negro from the white. Elidor had her chance at him afterward, with quite a group about, and he was too polite or insufficiently ingenious to escape. 
first she asked him what was the market price of a good able-bodied negro before the war if it was not as she had read about a thousand dollars to this he agreed unsuspectingly she inquired further if there had not been laws in the slave states forbidding the education of negroes and if there were not laws still forbidding their intermarriage with whites to this he agreed also he had to then she asked whether the sudden emancipation of the negro had not ruined many rich men if the major part of the wealth of the south had not been in slaves and the products of their labor here again could be no denial but she said i do not understand yet if negroes cannot or will not work why was one worth a thousand dollars and how could the owners have accumulated wealth from their inefficiency if they could not learn anything why was it necessary to make laws forbidding their education and if there is this insuperable antipathy segregating the races why are the laws against miscegenation in needed he was quite naturally incensed there were a good many of his previous hearers about some of them looking quite pleased and he insisted rather stormily that there was this deep-seated antipathy and that every southerner at least knew it at what age does it begin she asked him he looked at her not getting the drift of her question this innate antipathy she pursued gently i have seen southern babies clinging to their black nurses almost affectionately at what age does the antipathy begin he talked a good bit then with much heat but did not seem to meet the points she raised merely reiterating much of what he had said before then she went on quite calmly and your millions of mulattoes they appear not only against the law but against this insuperable antipathy this seemed to him so unwomanly of her that he made some hasty excuse and got away but his position was upheld by another man for a moment his little speech was mainly emotion there are such hot depths of feeling on this subject in the children of slave owners that clear reasoning is naturally hard to find this man made a fine little oration with much about the noble women of the south and how he or any man would lay down his life to protect them against the faintest danger of social contact with the colored race against the abomination of a proposal of marriage from a black man do you mean said elidor slowly her luminous eyes on his that if black men were free to propose to white women the white women would accept them at this he fairly foamed with horror a white woman of the south would no sooner marry a black man than she would a dog then why not leave it to the women she inquired neither of these men were affected save in the way of deep annoyance by elidor's general questions but many of her hearers were and she turning that searchlight of hers on the subject later announced to me that it seemed rather a long but by no means a difficult problem about ten million negroes counting all the mulattoes quadroons octoroons and so on to about ninety million whites she said as a mere matter of interbreeding following the previous habits of the white men it could be worked out mathematically how long it would take to eliminate the negro i mean but suppose there remains a group of negroes that have race pride and prefer to breed true to the stock i suggested what then if they are decent orderly and progressive there is no problem surely it is the degraded negro that is so feared the answer to that is easy compulsory and efficient education suitable employment at fair wages under good conditions why don't you see dear she interrupted herself to say the proof that it is not impossible is in what has been accomplished already here you white people wickedly brought over the ocean a great lot of reluctant black ones and subjected them to several generations of slavery yet in those few generations these previously savage people have made noble progress she reeled off to me a list of achievements of the negro race which i found surprising their development in wealth in industry in the professions even the arts was considering the circumstances astonishing all you have to do is improve the cultural conditions to increase the rate of progress it's no problem at all you are a wonder i told her you come out of that little faraway heaven of yours and dip into our tangle of horror and foolishness and as soon as the first shock is over you proceed to administer these little doses of wisdom as if a mere pill or two would set the whole world straight 
It would, said Elidor, if you'd take it. Do you mean that seriously? I demanded. I do. Why not? Why, Van, you've got all the necessary ingredients for peace and happiness. You don't have to wait a thousand years to grow. You're here. It's just a little matter of behaving differently. I laughed. Exactly, my dear, and in her land, so far as I make out, you behave accordingly to your perceptions and decisions. Here we don't. No, she admitted grudgingly, you don't, not yet. But you could, she persisted triumphantly, you could in a minute if you wanted to. I ducked this large proposition, and asked her if she had an answer to the Jewish race question as simple as that of the Negro. What's the question? she countered. I suppose there's more than one question involved, I answered slowly, but mine would be, why don't people like Jews? I won't be severe with your question, Van, though it's open to criticism. Not all people feel this race prejudice, and I'll tell you frankly that this is a bigger widespread. It has deeper roots. I've one than the other. It's older. It's more licked into it, a little. I grinned. Well, you young encyclopedia, what did you discover? I soon discovered that the very general dislike to this one people is not due to the religious difference between them and Christians. It was quite as general and strong, apparently, in very ancient times. Do you think it is a race feeling, then? An insuperable, ineradicable, etc. antipathy? No, she said. There are other Semitic and allied races to whom there is no general objection. I don't think it can be that. I have several explanations to suggest a varying weight. Here's one of them. The Jews are the only surviving modern people that have ever tried to preserve the extremely primitive custom of endogenous marriage. Everywhere else the exogenous habit proved itself best and was generally accepted. This people is the only one which has always assumed itself to be superior to every other people and tried to prevent intermarriage with them. That's twice you've said tried, I put in. Do you mean that they have not succeeded? Of course they haven't, she replied cheerfully. When people endeavor to live in defiance of natural law, they are not, as a rule, very successful. But they boast the purity of their race. Yes, I know they do, and other people accept it. But, Van Deer, surely you must have noticed the difference between, say, the Spanish and the German Jews, for instance. Social contract will do much in spite of ghettos, but it hardly alters the color of eyes and hair. Well, my dear, if it is not religion, nor yet race, what is it? I have two other suggestions, one sociologic, one psychic. The first is this. In the successive steps of social evolution, the Jewish people seem not to have passed the tribal stage. They never made a real nation. Apparently, they can't. They live in other nations perforce. Why perforce? I interrupted. Well, if they don't die, they have to live somewhere, Van, and unless they go and set up a new nation in a previously uninhabited country, or on the graves of the previous inhabitants, they have to live in other nations, don't they? But they were a nation once, I urged. In a way, yes, they had a piece of land to live on, and they lived on it as tribes, not as one people. According to their own account, ten out of twelve of these tribes got lost somehow and the others didn't seem to mind. No, they could not maintain the stage of social organization rightly called a nation. Their continuing entity is that of a race, as we see in far lesser instance in gypsies. And the more definitely organized peoples have not a racial, but a sociological aversion to this alien form of life, which is in them, but not of them. But, Elidor, do not the modern Jews make good citizens in whatever country they are in? They do, in large measure, wherever they are allowed, she agreed, and both this difference and the old marriage difference would long ago have been outgrown, but for the last one, the psychic one. Do you mean what that writer in Blackwood said about Spain? There seems to be something Spanish in the minds of Spaniards which causes them to act in a Spanish manner? She laughed. All of that, Van, and a lot more. She stopped, looking away toward the far horizon. I never tire of the marvel and interest of your mixed humanity, she resumed. You see, we were just us. For two thousand years we have been one stock and one sex. It's no wonder we can think, feel, act as one. 
and it's no wonder you poor things have had such a slow tumultuous time of it all kinds of races all kinds of countries all kinds of conditions and the male sex to manage everything why van the wonder is that before this last world quake of a war you could travel about peaceably almost anywhere i understand surely that ought to prove once and for all how safe and quiet the world might be but about the jews i urged at last oh yes well dear as i see it people are moving on to a wide and full mutual understanding with peace of course free trade and social intercourse and intermarriage until everyone is what you call civilized against this process stood first total ignorance and separation then opposing interests then opposing ideas today it is ideas that do the most damage look at poor europe every interest calls them together but their different mental content holds them apart their egregiously false histories their patromanias their long-nursed hatreds and vengeances oh it is pathetic yes and the jews oh dear me van they're only one people i get so interested in the world at large that i forget them well what the jews did was to make their patriomania into a religion i did not get that and said so it was poorly put she admitted they couldn't be patriomaniacs without a fatherland could they but it was on the same feeling at a lower stage applied only to the race they thought they were the chosen people of god didn't other races think the same thing don't they yet i urged oh in a way they do some of them especially since the jews made a bible of it you see van the combination was peculiar the special talent of this race is in literary expression other races had their sorrows but could not utter them carthage had no jeremiah nor has armenia she saw that i was impressed by this point you have greece in its sculpture its architecture and its objective literature even greek history is a story told by an artist a description rome lives in its roads i have read as well as its arts and its power of social organization rome if it could have survived its besetting sins was a super nation the beginning of a real world people egypt india they all have something but none of them concentrated on literature as the jews did having no other social expression why elidor don't you call their religion anything haven't they lifted the world with great religious concepts she smiled at me that gentle warm steady smile of hers forgive an outsider please i know that the christian religion rests on the jewish books and that it is hard indeed to see around early teachings but i have read your bible carefully and some little of the latest study and criticism upon it i think the christian races have helped the jews to overestimate their religion you've never said much about our various religions my fair foreigner what do you really think about them this she pondered carefully it's a large subject to try to comment on in a few words but i can say this they are certainly improving i had to laugh this was such faint praise for our highest institution how do you measure them o oh casual observer by their effect on the people of course naturally each set of believers holds its own to be the all true and as naturally that is impossible but there is enough truth and enough good will in your religions if you would only use them instead of just believing them and do you not think especially considering the time of its development that the jewish concept of one god the jewish ethical ideal was a long step upward it was a step certainly but van they did not think their god was the only one he was just theirs a private tribal god openly described as being jealous of the others and as to their ethics and the behavior of the people you have only to read their own books to see how bad it was van no religion can be truly good where the initial doctrines are false or even partly false that utterly derogatory concept of a god who could curse all humanity because of one man's doing what he knew he would a god so petty as to pick out one small people for no better reason than that they gave him some recognition and to set his face against all the rest of his equally descended children can't you see how unethical how morally degrading such a religion must be it was surely better than the others at the time i insisted that may be but the others of that period have mercifully perished they weren't so literary don't you see 
by means of their tremendous art this people have immortalized their race egotism and their whole record of religious aspirations mistakes and failures in literature that is what has given them their lasting place in the world but the effect of this primitive religion immortalized by art and thrust upon the world so long has been far from good it has well nigh killed christianity from its cradle it has been the foundation of most of those hideous old wars and persecutions with quotations from that hebrew voice of god the most awful deeds have been committed and sanctioned i consider it in many ways a most evil religion but we have as you say accepted it so it does not account for the general dislike for which you were offering explanations the last explanation was the psychic one she went on what impresses me here is this the psychic attitude of this people presents to all the other inhabitants of the world a spirit of concentrated pride it rests first on the tribal animus with that old endogenous marriage custom and then on this tremendous literary religious structure one might imagine generations of egyptians making their chief education a study of the pyramids sphinxes and so on or generations of greeks bringing up their children in the ceaseless contemplation of the acropolis or the works of their dramatists but with the jews as a matter of fact we do see century after century of education in their ancient language in their ancient books an everlasting study and discussion of what remote dead men have written this has given a peculiar intensity to the jewish character a sort of psychic inbreeding they have a condensed spirit more and more so as time passes and it becomes increasingly inimical to the diffused spirit of modern races look at the pale recent imitation of such a spirit given in germany they have tried in a generation or two to build up and force upon their people an intense national spirit with of course the indwelling egotism essential to such an undertaking now suppose all german national glory rested on a few sacred books their own early writings imposed upon the modern world and suppose that german spirit even now so offensive to other nations had been concentrated and transmitted for thousands of years do you think people would like them i was silent a bit her suggestions were certainly novel and in no way resembled what i had heard before either for or against this peculiar people what's the answer i said at last is it hopeless certainly not aren't they born babies with dear little clean free minds just as soon as people recognize the evil of filling up new minds with old foolishness they can make over any race on earth that won't change race characteristics will it no not the physical ones she answered intermarriage will do that it looks to me as though your answer to the jewish question was leave off being jews is that it in a measure it is she said slowly they are world people and can enrich the world with their splendid traits they will keep of course their high race qualities their special talents and virtues by a chosen not an enforced selection some of the noblest people are jews some of the nicest that can't be denied but this long nursed bunch of ancient mistakes it is high time they dropped it what is the use of artificially maintaining characteristics which the whole world dislikes and then complaining of race prejudice of course there is race prejudice a cultural one and all the rest of you will have to bring up your children without that it is only the matter of a few generations at most this was a part of the spirit of her land to which i was slow in becoming accustomed their homogeneous well-ordered life extended its social consciousness freely ahead as well as backwards their past history was common knowledge and their future development even more commonly discussed they planned centuries ahead and accomplished what they planned when i thought of their making over the entire language in the interest of childhood of their vast field of cultural literature of such material achievements as their replanting all their forests i began to see that the greatness of a country is not to be measured by linear space and extent of land nor arithmetically by numbers of people nor shallowly by the achievements of the present and a few leftovers but by the scope of its predetermined social advance as this perception grew within me it brought first a sense of shame for all the rest of the world and even more intensely for my own country which had such incomparable advantages but after a little instead of shame which is utter waste i began to see life as i had never before as a great open field of work in which we were quite free to do as we would 
we have always looked at it as a hopeless tangle of individual lives short aimless threads as blindly mixed as the grass stems in a haystack but collectively as nations taking sufficient time there was nothing we could not do i told her of my new vision and she was dumbly happy just held my hand her eyes shining that's how to stand the misery and failure isn't it i said that's how not to be discouraged at the awfulness of things and the reason you take up these separate questions so lightly is that none of them mean much alone the important thing is to get people to think and act together there's nothing on earth to hinder them van dear except what's in their heads and they can stop putting it in in the babies i mean and can put it out of their own at least enough to get to work they are beginning you know she spoke most encouragingly most approvingly of the special efforts we were making in small groups or as individuals to socialize various industries and functions but with far more fervor of the great movement the biggest of all and closely related are your women's movement and labor movement both seem to be swiftly growing stronger the most inclusive forward-looking system is socialism of course what a splendid vision of immediate possibilities that is i cannot accustom myself to your not seeing it at once of course the reason is plain your minds are full of your ancient mistakes too not so much racial and religious as in beliefs of economic absurdities it is so funny it always nettled me a little to have her laugh at us that she should be shocked and horrified at the world i had expected that she should criticize and blame but to have her act as though all our troubles were easily removable and we were just a pack of silly fools not to set about it this was irritating well dear she pursued pleasantly doesn't it look funny to you like a man sleeping cold with good blankets at the foot of his bed like mr tantalus quite able to get what he wanted if he would only reach if what you said was so i began and why isn't it dear the trouble is i think in your psychology you as a free-minded herlander cannot seem to see how helpless we are in our minds all these ages of enforced belief have done something to us i tell you we can't change all in a minute the worst thing that has been done to you is to fill your poor heads with this notion that you cannot help yourselves tell me now what is there to hinder you you had better be studying as to what does hinder us i answered and explain it so that we can do something we mean well we are fairly well educated we are as you say rich enough and all that but we up to date seem unable to get together on any line of concerted action toward better living i've been studying just that van ever since i first came of course after i saw how things were that was the only thing to do well i said and again well she sat considering turning over some books and papers that lay on the table beside her a lovely picture she made unique among the women of this land she had the smooth rounded freedom of body we see in noble statues and whatever her new friends tried to make her wear she insisted upon a dress of such simplicity as did not contradict her natural lines and movements her face had changed somewhat in our two years of travel and study there was a sadness in it such as it never wore in her land such as i never seen in any one while here and for all her quiet courtesy her gentle patience her scientific interest and loving kindness there was a lonely look about her as of some albatross in a poultry yard to me she was even more tender and delicately sympathetic than in our first young happiness she seemed to be infinitely sorry for me though carefully refraining from expressing it our common experiences our studying and seeing so much together had drawn us very close and for my part i had a curious sense of the growing detachedness from the conditions about me and an overwhelming attachment to her which transcended every other tie it seemed as if my love for her as a human being such love as a brother a sister a friend might feel was now so much greater than my love of her as a woman my woman that i could not miss that fulfillment much while so contented in the larger relation I thought of the many cases I had known where the situation was absolutely reversed, where a man loved a woman solely because of sex desire, without ever knowing her nature as a person, without even wanting to. I was very happy with Elidor.
to be continued. End of chapter 10「Chapter Eleven of With Her in Our Land. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. With Her in Our Land by Charlotte Perkins Gilman. Chapter Eleven. It was inevitable that my wife should take a large interest in feminism. With that sweeping swiftness of hers, she read a dozen or so of the leading and misleading books on the subject, spent some time in library work looking over files of papers, and talked with all manner of people we met who had views on the matter. Furthermore, she thought about it. As I grew more and more accustomed to seeing Elidore think, or at least to seeing the results of that process, I was sharply struck with the lack of thinking among people in general. She smiled sociably when I mentioned it. Why, yes, dear, that is largely what is the matter. You do not train your children to think. You train them not to. Your men think hard in narrow lines, just little pushing lines of their special work or how to get richer, and your women... Oh, come, let's have it, I cried despairingly. Whatever else you say or don't say, you are always thinking about the women. I can fairly hear your brain click. And I'll tell you honestly, my dear, that I don't believe you can hurt me now, no matter how hard you hit them, or the men. It certainly has been a liberal education to live with you. Also, I've had my time in her land to show me the difference. I confess that as I now see this life of ours, the women shock me, in some ways more than the men. And I've been doing some reading as well as you, even some thinking. I suppose one thing that has made you so reticent about this is that you can't criticize the women without blaming the men. Perhaps it will encourage you if I begin to do the blaming. She mildly said that perhaps it would seem more magnanimous. So I started in and found the case worse when stated at length than I had seen it in glimpses. Of course, there is no getting around Lester Ward, I began slowly. No one can study biology and sociology much and not see that on the first physiological lines the female is the whole show, so to speak, or at least most of it, and all the way up she holds her own, even into early savagery, till Mr. Man gets into the saddle. How he came to do it is a mystery that I don't believe even you can explain. No, she agreed, I can't. I call it the great divergence. There is no other such catastrophic change in all nature, as far as I've been able to gather. What Elidor had gathered in two years was perhaps not equal in detailed knowledge to the learning of great specialists, but she had a marvelous gift for selecting the really important facts and for arranging them. That was the trick. She did something with what she knew, not merely stored it. Well, he did take the reins somehow, I resumed, and we began our historic period, which is somewhat too large to be covered in an hour, by me. But in all this time, as far as I can make out, he has never been even fair to women and has for the most part treated her with such an assortment of cruelty and injustice as makes me blush for my sex. What made you think so, Van? What first? Why, her land first, I answered promptly, seeing women who were people, and that they were people because they were women, not in spite of it seeing that what we had called womanliness 
was a mere excess of sex, not the essential part of it at all. When I came back here and compared our women with yours, well, it was a blow. Besides, if I'd had no other evidence, you would have shown me, just living with you, my wonder darling. She looked at me with shining eyes, that look that was more than wife, more than mother, the illimitable, loving, human look. What I have learned from you, dearest, from our companionship without the physical intimacy of sex, is this, that persons, two persons who love each other, have a bigger range of happiness than even two lovers. I mean, than two lovers who are not such companions, of course. I do not deny that it has been hard, very hard sometimes. I've been disagreeable to live with. Never, she interpolated. But somehow the more I loved you, the less it troubled me. Now I feel that when we do reach that union with all our love, with all the great mother purpose that is in your heart, and the beginning of a sense of father purpose in mine, I'm sure that it will be only an incident in our love, our happiness, not the main thing. She gave a long, soft sigh of full content, still listening. All this makes me see the limitations of our women, I continued, and when I look for a reason, there is only the conduct of men toward them. Cruelty? Why, my dear, it is not the physical cruelty to their tender bodies. It is not the shame and grief and denial that they have had to bear. Those are like the atrocities in warfare. It is the war itself which is wrong. The petted women, the contented women, the happy women, these are perhaps the worst result. It's wonderful how clearly you see it, she said. Pretty plain to see, I went on. We men, having all human power in our hands, have used it to warp and check the growth of women. We, by choice and selection, by law and religion, by enforced ignorance, by heavy overcultivation of sex, have made the kind of woman we so made by nature, that that is what it was to be a woman. Then we heaped our scornful abuse upon her, ages and ages of it, the majority of men in all nations still looking down on women. And then, as if that was not enough, really, my dear, I'm not joking, I'm ashamed, as if I had done it myself, we, in our superior freedom, in our monopoly of education, with the law in our hands, both to make and execute, with every conceivable advantage, we have blamed women for the sins of the world. She interrupted here eagerly. Not all of you, Van, dear. That was only a sort of legend with some people. It was only in the Jewish religion you think so much of that the contemptible lie was actually stated as a holy truth. And even God made to establish that unspeakable injustice. Yes, that's true. But nobody objected. We all accepted it gladly and treated her accordingly. Well, sister, have I owned up enough? I guess you can't hurt my feelings any with anything you say about men. Of course, I'm not going into details. That would take forever. But just in general, I can see what ails the women, and who's to blame for it. Don't be too hard on Mr. Mann, she urged gently. What you say is true enough, but so are other things. What puzzles me most is not at all that background of explanation, but what ails the women now. Here, even here in America, now. They have had some education for several generations. Numbers of them have time to think. 
some few have money i cannot be reconciled to the women van she was so unusually fierce about it that i was quite surprised at her i had supposed that her hardest feeling would be about men she saw my astonishment and explained put yourself in my place for a moment van suppose in her land we had a lot of subject men blame us all you want to for doing it but look at the men little creatures undersized and generally feeble cowardly and not ashamed of it kept for sex purposes only or as servants or both usually both i confess i'm asking something difficult of your imagination but try to think of her land women each with a soft man she kept to cook for her to wait upon her and to love when she pleased ignorant men mostly poor men almost all having to ask their owners for money and tell what they wanted it for some of them utterly degraded creatures kept in houses for common use as women are kept here some of them quite gay and happy pet men with pet names and presents showered upon them most of them contented piously accepting kitchen work as their duty living by the religion and laws and customs the women made some of them left out and made fun of for being left not owned at all and envying those who were allow for a surprising percentage of mutual love and happiness even under these conditions but also for ghastly depths of misery and a general low level of mere submission to the inevitable then in this state of degradation fancy these men for the most part quite content to make monkeys of themselves by wearing the most ridiculous clothes fancy them men with men's bodies though enfeebled wearing open-work lace underclothing with little ribbons all strung through it wearing dresses never twice alike and almost always foolish wearing hats she fixed me with a steady eye in which a growing laughter twinkled wearing such hats as your women wear at this i threw up my hands i can't i said it's all off i followed you with increasing difficulty even through the lace and baby ribbon but i stopped there men wear such hats men i tell you it is unthinkable unthinkable for such men such men are unthinkable really contemptible skulking cowardly spaniels they would deserve all they got why aren't you blaming the women of her land for treating them so van oh said i and yes said i i begin to see my dear herlander why you're down on the women good she agreed it's all true what you say about the men nothing could be blacker than that story but the women van the women they are not dead they are here and in your country they have plenty of chance to grow how can they bear their position van how can they stand it another day don't they know they are women no said i slowly they think they are women we both laughed rather sadly presently she said we have to take the facts as we find them emotion does not help us any it's no use being horrified at a hermit crab that's the way he is this is the woman man made how is she going to get over it you don't forget the ones who have gotten over it do you and all the splendid work they are doing i'm afraid i did for a moment she admitted besides so much of their effort is along sidelines and some of it in precisely the wrong direction what would you have them do 
what would you have those inconceivable men of her land do she countered what would you say to them to rouse them i'd try to make them realize that they were men i said that's the first thing exactly and if the smooth plump crazily dressed creatures answered a true man is always glad to be supported by the woman he loves what would you say to that i should try to make him realize what the world really was i answered slowly and to see what was a man's place in it and if he answered you a hundred million strong a man's place is in the home what would you say then it would be pretty hard to say anything if men were like that yes and it is pretty hard to say anything when women are like that it doesn't reach them but there is the whole women's movement surely they are changing improving she shook off her mood of transient bitterness my ignorance makes me hard i suppose i'm not familiar enough with your past history recent past history i mean to note the changes as clearly as you do i come suddenly to see them as they are not knowing how much worse it has been for instance i suppose women used to dress more foolishly than they do now can that be possible i ran over in my mind some of the eccentricities of fashion in earlier periods and was about to say that it was possible when i chanced to look out of the window it was a hot day most oppressively hot with a fiercely glaring sun a woman stood just across the street talking to a man i picked up my opera glass and studied her for a moment i had read that the small waist is coming in again hers had come she stood awkwardly in extremely high-heeled slippers in which the sole of the foot leaned on a steep slant from heel to ball and her toes poor things were driven into the narrow pointed toe of the slipper by the whole sliding weight of the body above the thin silk hose showed the insteps puffing up like a pincushion from the binding grip of that short vamp her skirts were short as a child's most voluminous and varied in outline hanging in bunches on the hips and in various fluctuating points and corners below the bodice was a party-colored composition of indiscreet exposures more suitable for a ballroom than for the street but what struck me most was that she wore about her neck a dead fox or the whole outside of one no she was not a lunatic no that man was not her keeper no it was not a punishment not an initiation penalty not an election bet that woman of her own free will and at considerable expense wore heavy furs in the hottest summer weather i laid down the glass and turned to elidore no my dear said i gloomily it is not possible that women ever could have been more idiotic in dress than that we were silent for a little watching that pitiful object with her complacent smile as she stood there on those distorted feet sweating under her load of fur perfectly contented and pleased with herself some way said elador slowly it makes me almost discouraged about the woman's movement i'm not of course not really i do know enough to see that they are far better off than a hundred years ago and the laws of life are on their side solid irresistible laws they are women after all and women are people are the people really up to a certain point i must make more allowances must learn to see the gain in some ways even where there is none in others now that that tottering little image may be earning her own living or doing something useful what's worst of all perhaps 
is the strange missing of purpose in those who are most actively engaged in advancing they seem like flies behind a window they bump and buzz pushing their heads against whatever is in front of them and never seem really to plan a way out no there's one thing worse than that much worse i wouldn't have believed it possible i can hardly believe it now what's this horror i asked prostitution white slavery oh no she said those things are awful but a sort of natural awfulness if i may say so what a scientific observer would expect of the evil conditions carried to excess no this thing is unnatural i mean the antis oh the anti-suffragists yes think of the men again those poor degraded men i was imagining and then think of some of them struggling for freedom struggling long and hard with pathetically slow progress doing no harm in the meantime just talking arguing pleading petitioning using what small money they could scrape together to promote their splendid cause their cause that meant not only their own advantage but more freedom and swifter progress for all the world and then think of some other of those pet men not only misunderstanding the whole thing too dull or too perverse even to see such basic truth as that but actually banding together to oppose it van if you want one all-sufficient and world-convincing proof of the degradation of women you have it in the anti-suffragist the men are backing them remember i suggested of course they are you expect the men to oppose the freeing of women they naturally would but the women van the women themselves it's unnatural with a sick shudder she buried her face in her hands for a moment then straightened up bravely again giving that patient little sigh of dismissal to the subject i was silent and watched her as she sat so strong so graceful so beautiful with that balanced connection in line and movement we usually see only in savages her robe was simple in form lovely in color comfortable and becoming i looked at her with unfailing pleasure always never having to make excuses and reservations all of her was beautiful and strong and i thought of her sisters that fair land of full-grown women all of whom with room for wide personal distinction were beautiful and strong there were differences enough a group of thoroughbred racehorses might vary widely in color size shape marking and individual expression yet all be fine horses there would be no need of scrubs and cripples to make variety and i looked again out of our window at the city street with its dim dirtiness its brutal noise and the unsatisfied unsatisfying people going so hurriedly about after their food crowding pushing hurrying like hungry rats the sordid eagerness of the men the shallow folly of the women and all at once there swept over me a great wave of homesickness for her land elidor was never satisfied merely to criticize she must needs plan some way out some improvement so laying aside her discouragement she plunged into this woman question with new determination and before long came to me in loving triumph i was wrong van to be so harsh with them it was just my herland background now i have been deliberately putting myself in the woman's place and measuring the rate of progress as of a glacier and it's wonderful really wonderful there was the bottom limit not so very far back some savages still keeping to it 
merely to live long enough to bear a daughter then there's the gain this way in one land and that way in another but always a gain then this great modern awakening which is now stirring them all over the world by keeping my own previous knowledge of women entirely out of my mind and by measuring your really progressive ones today against their own grandmothers that movement i was so scornful about now seems to me a sunburst of blazing improvement of course they bump and buzz in every direction that is mere resilience haven't they been kept down in every direction they'll get over that as they grow accustomed to real liberty it would be inconceivable that they should have been so unutterably degraded for so long and not show the results of it the limitations instead of blaming them i should have been rejoicing at the wonderful speed with which they have surged forward as fast as any door was opened even a crack i have been looking at what might be called the unconscious as apart from the conscious woman's movement and it comforts me much just what do you mean i mean the women's clubs here in this country especially and largest of all the economic changes the immense numbers who are at work didn't they always work the poor ones that is oh yes at home i mean human work wage earning that incidentally as a descriptive term but it would be different grade of work even without that so i've heard people say some people but what is their superior in doing some fractional monotonous little job like bookkeeping for instance as compared with the management and performance of all the intimate tasks in a household i was so solemn about this that she took me seriously at least for a moment it isn't the difference between a bookkeeper and a housekeeper that must be considered it is the difference between an organized business world that needs bookkeeping and an unorganized world of separate families with no higher work than to eat sleep and keep alive then she saw me grin and begged pardon cheerfully i might have known you were wiser than that van but oh the people i've been talking to the questions they ask and the comments they make fortunately we do not have to wait for universal conviction before moving onward if you could have your way with the women of this country and the others what would you make them do i asked she set her chin in her hand and meditated a little what they are doing only more of it for one thing she answered presently but oh so much more of course they have to be taught differently they need new standards new hopes new ideals new purposes that's the real field of work you see van in the mind that is what was so confusing to me at first you see the difference in looks between your women and our women is as one to a thousand compared to the differences between their mental content your conditions are so good the real ones i mean the supplies the materials the abilities you have that at first i underrated the difficulties inside you are not as advanced as outside men or women you have such antique minds i never get used to it you see we ever so long ago caught up with our conditions and now we are always planning better ones our minds are ahead of our conditions and yet we live pretty comfortably and how are our women going to catch up they have to make a long jump from the patriarchal status to the democratic from the narrowest personal ties to the widest social relation from first-hand labor mere private service of bodily needs 
to the specialized organized social service of the whole community at present this is going on in actual fact without their realizing it without their understanding and accepting it it is the mind that needs changing i suppose it seems a trifling matter to you to change the working machinery of twenty million homes that's what it amounts to doesn't it how long does it take to do up twenty million women's hair she inquired no longer than it does one if they all do it at once numbers don't complicate a question like this what could be done in one tiny village could be done all over the country in the same time i suppose i do underestimate the practical difficulties here on account of our having settled all those little problems the idea of your still not being properly fed i can't get used to it then i remembered the uniform excellence of food in her land not only all that we ourselves had enjoyed but that i never saw in any shop or market any wilted withered stale or in any way inferior supplies how did you manage that i asked her did you confiscate all the damaged things was there a penalty for selling them does one of your housekeepers confiscate her damaged food is there any penalty for feeding her family with it oh i see you only provided enough to keep fresh exactly i tell you numbers don't make any difference a million people do not eat any more a piece than a dozen at one table we feed our people as carefully and as competently as you try to feed your families you can't do as well because of the inferiority of materials this i found somewhat offensive but i knew it was true it's so simple she said wearily a child could see it food is to eat and if it is not good to eat it is not food here you people use food as a thing to play with to buy and sell to store up to throw away with no more regard for its real purpose than than the swine with pearls before him i suggested but you know those economic laws come in she laughed outright van dear there is nothing in all your pitiful tangled life more absurd than what you so solemnly call economics good economics in regard to food is surely this to produce the best quality in sufficient quantity with the least expenditure of labor and to distribute it the most rapidly and freshly to the people who need it the management of food in your world is perhaps the most inexplicably foolish of anything you do i've been up and down the streets in your cities observing i've been in the hotels and restaurants far and wide and in ever so many homes and i confess van with some mortification that there is no one thing i'm more homesick for than food i am getting discouraged if you are not elador as compared with a rational country like yours this is rather a mess and it looks so hopeless i suppose it will take a thousand years to catch up you could do it in three generations she calmly replied three generations that's barely a century i know it the whole outside part of it you could do inside of twenty years it is the people who will take three generations to remake you could improve this stock say five per cent in one fifteen in two and eighty per cent in three perhaps faster are not you rather sanguine my dear girl i don't think so she answered gravely people are not bad now they are only weighed down with all this falsehood and foolishness in their heads there is always the big lifting force of life to push you on as fast as you will let it there is the wide surrounding help of conditions 
such conditions as you even now know how to arrange and there is the power of education which you have hardly tried with these all together and with proper care in breeding you could fill the world with glorious people soon oh i wish you'd do it i wish you'd do it it was hard on her harder even than i had foreseen not only the war horrors not only the miseries of more backward nations and of our painful past but even in my america where i had fondly thought she would be happy the common arrangements of our lives to which we are so patiently accustomed were to her a constant annoyance and distress through her eyes i saw it newly and instead of the breezy pride i used to feel in my young nation i now began to get an unceasing sense of what she had called an idiot child it was so simply true what she said about food food is to eat all its transporting and preserving and storing and selling if it interferes with the eating value of the food is foolishness i began to see the man who stores eggs until they are reduced to the grade called rots and spots as an idiot and a malicious idiot at that vivid and clear rose in my mind the garden circled cities of her land where for each group of inhabitants all fresh fruits and vegetables were raised so near that they could be eaten the day they were picked it did not cost any more it cost less saving transportation supplies that would keep they kept enough from season to season with some emergency reserves but not one person young or old ever had to eat such things as we pay extortionately for in every city nothing but women only mothers but they had worked out to smooth perfection what now began to seem to me to be the basic problem in human life how to make the best kind of people and how to keep them at their best and growing better surely that is what we are here for end of chapter eleven Chapter Twelve of With Her in Our Land. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Amelia Chesley. With Her in Our Land by Charlotte Perkins Gilman. Chapter Twelve. As I look over my massive notes of hastily jotted down or wholly reconstructed conversations and some of Elidor's voluminous papers. I am distressingly conscious of the shortcomings of this book. There is no time now to improve it, and I wish to publish it as a little better than no report at all of the long visit of my wife from her land to the world we know. In time, I hope, if I live, and if I come back again, to make a far more competent study than this. Yet, why trouble myself to do that? She will do it, I am sure, with the help of her friends and sisters far better than I could. I had hoped that she could go blazing about our world, lecturing on the wonders and beauties of her land, but that was all dropped when they decided not to betray their strange geographical secret, yet. I am allowed to print the previous account of our visit there. Even that will set explorers on their track. But she did not wish to answer specific questions while here nor to refuse to answer. They were quite right. The more I see of our world, the surer I am that they are right to try to preserve their lovely country as it is, for a while at least. Elidor begs that I explain how inchoate, how fragmentary, how disproportionate her impressions necessarily were. The longer I stay, she said, the more I learn of your past and understand of your present, the more hopeful I feel for you. Please make that very clear. This she urged strongly. The war did not discourage her after a while. What is one more among so many? she asked with a wry smile. 
The very awfulness of this is its best hope, that and the growing wisdom of the people. You'll have no more, I'm sure. That is, no more except those recognized as criminal outbreaks and punitive ones. The receding waves of force as these turbulent cross-currents die down and disappear. But Van, dear, whatever else you leave out, be sure to make it as strong as you can about the women and children. Perhaps you'd better say it yourself, my dear. Come, you put in a chapter, I urged. But she would not. I should be too abusive, I'm afraid, she objected. And I've talked enough on the subject, you know that. She had, by this time, gone over it pretty thoroughly, and it is not very difficult to give the drift of it. We all know the facts. Her position as a Herlander was naturally the maternal one. The business of people is, of course, to be, well, happy, wise, beautiful, productive, and progressive. Why don't you say good, too, I suggested. Don't be absurd, Van. If people are well and happy, wise, beautiful, productive, and progressive, they must incidentally be good. That's being good. What sort of goodness is it which does not produce those effects? Well, these good people need a good world to live in, and they have to make it a clean, safe, comfortable world to grow in. Then, since they all begin as children, it seems so self-evident that the way to make better people and a better world is to teach the children how. You'll find general agreement so far, I admitted. But the people who train children are with you, the mothers, she pursued and the mothers of your world have not yet seen this simple truth. They talk of nothing else, I suggested. They are always talking of the wonderful power and beauty of motherhood, from the most ancient morality to Ellen Key. Yes, I know they talk about it. Their idea of motherhood, to what it ought to be, is like a birch bark canoe to an ocean steamship, Van. They haven't seen it as a whole. That's the trouble. What prevents them is their dwarfed condition, not being people, real, world-building people. And what keeps them dwarfed is this amazing relic of the remote past, their domestic position. Would you destroy the home, as they call it, Elidol? I think the home is the very loveliest thing you have on earth, she unexpectedly replied. What do you mean, then? I asked, genuinely puzzled. You can't have homes without women in them, can you? And children? And men, she gravely added. Why, Van, do not men have homes and love them dearly? A man does not have to stay at home all day in order to love it. Why should a woman? Then she made clear to me, quite briefly, how the home should be to the woman just what it was to a man, and far more to both, in beauty and comfort in privacy and peace, in all the pleasant rest and dear companionship we so prize, but that it should not be to him a grinding weight of care and expense, or an expression of pride, nor to her a workshop or her sole means of personal expression. It is so pathetic, she said, and so unutterably absurd to see great city size and world size women trying to content themselves and express themselves in one house. Or worse, one flat. You know how it would be for a man, surely. It is just as ridiculous for a woman. And your city size and world size men are all tied up to these house size women. It's so funny, Van, so painfully funny, like a horse harnessed with an Eohippus. We haven't got to wait for Mrs. Eohippus to catch up to Mr. Horse, I hope. You won't have to wait long, she assured me. They are born equal, your boys and girls. They have to be. It is the tremendous difference in cultural conditions that divides them, not only in infancy and youth, not only in dress and training, but in this wide gulf of industrial distinction, this permanent division which leaves one sex free to rise, to develop every social power and quality, and forcibly restrains the other to a labor level thousands of years behind. It is beginning to change, I can see that now, but it has to be complete, universal, before women can do their duty as mothers. 
but i thought at least i've always heard that it was their duty as mothers which kept them at home she waved this aside with a touch of impatience look at the children she said that's enough look at these girls who do not even know enough about motherhood to demand a healthy father why a a sheep would know better than to mate with such creatures as some of your women marry they are only just beginning to learn that there are such diseases as they have been suffering and dying from for all these centuries and they are so poor they haven't any money most of them they are so disorganized unorganized apparently unconscious of any need of organization i mentioned the growth of trade unions but she said that was but a tiny step useful but small what she meant was mother union i suppose it is sex she pursued soberly with us motherhood is so simple i had supposed at first that your bisexual method would mean a better motherhood a motherhood of two so to speak and i find that men have so enjoyed their little part of the work they have grown to imagine it as quite a separate thing and to talk about sex as if it was wholly distinct from parentage why see what i found the other day and she pulled out a copy of a little yellow medical magazine published by a physician who specializes in sex diseases and read me a note this doctor had written on sterilization wherein he said that it had no injurious effect on sex just look at that she said the man is a doctor and thinks the removal of parental power is no loss to sex what men yes and some women too seem to mean by sex is just their preliminary pleasure when your women are really awake and know what they are for seeing men as the noblest kind of assistance nature's latest and highest device for the improvement of parentage then they will talk less of sex and more of children i urged as genuinely as i could the collateral value and uses of sex indulgence not the common theories of necessity which any well-trained athlete can deny but the more esoteric claims of higher flights of love and of far-reaching stimulus to all artistic faculty the creative impulse in our work she listened patiently but shook her head when i was done even if all those claims were true she said they would not weigh as an ounce to the ton beside the degradation of women the corruption of the body and mind through these wholly unnecessary diseases and the miserable misborn children why then what's creative impulse and all its far-reaching stimulus to set beside the stunted meagre starveling children the millions of poor little subordinary children children who are mere accidents and by-products of this much-praised sex it's no use dear until all the children of the world are at least healthy at least normal until the average man and woman are free from taint of sex disease and happy in their love lastingly happy in their love there is not much to boast of in this popular idea of sex and sex indulgence it cannot be changed in a day or a year she said this is evidently a matter of long inheritance and that's why i allow three generations to get over it but nothing will help much till the women are free and see their duty as mothers some of the freest women are urging more sex freedom i reminded her they want to see the women doing as men have done apparently yes i know they are almost as bad as the antis but not quite they are merely a consequence of wrong teaching and wrong habits they were there before those women only not saying what they wanted surely you never imagined that all men could be unchaste and all women chaste did you i shamefacedly admitted that that was exactly what we had imagined and that we had most cruelly punished the women who were not it's the most surprising thing i ever heard of she said and you bred and trained plenty of animals to say nothing of knowing the wild ones is there any case in nature of a species with such a totally opposite traits in the two sexes there wasn't not that i knew of outside of their special distinctions of course 
all these side issues she continually swept aside all the minor points and discussable questions returning again and again to the duty of women as soon as the women take the right ground men will have to follow suit she said as soon as women are free independent and conscientious they have the power in their own hands by natural law what is going to rouse them to make them see it i asked a number of things seem to be doing that she said meditatively from my point of view i should think the sense of maternal duty would be the strongest thing but there seem to be many forces at work here the economic change is the most imperative more so even than the political and both are going on fast there is the war too that is doing wonders for women it is opening the eyes of men millions of men at once as no arguments ever could have aren't you pleased to see the women working for peace i asked immensely of course all over europe they are at it that's what i mean but i meant the peace movement oh that talking for peace you mean and writing and telegraphing yes that's useful too anything that brings women out into social relation into a sense of social responsibility is good but all that they say and write and urge will not count as much as what they do your women will surely have more sense than the men about economics she suggested it does not seem to me possible for business women to mishandle food as men do or to build such houses it is also unreasonable to make people eat what is not good or live in dark cramped little rooms you don't think they show much sense in their own clothes i offered mischievously no they don't but that is women as they are the kind of women you men have been so long manufacturing i'm speaking of real ones the kind that are there underneath and sure to come out as soon as they have a chance and what a glorious time they will have cleaning up the world i'd almost like to stay and help a little gradually it dawned on me that elidor did not mean to stay even in america i wanted to be sure like to stay do you mean that you want to go back for good it is not absolutely clear to me yet she answered but one thing i am certain about if i live here i will not have a child I thought for a moment that she meant the distress about her would have some deleterious effect and prevent it. But when I looked at her, saw the folded arms, the steady mouth, the fixed determination in her eyes, I knew that she meant will not when she said it. It would not be right, she added simply. There is no place in all your world that I have seen or read of where I should be willing to raise a child we could go to some lovely place alone i urged some island clean and beautiful but we would be alone there that is no place for a child you could teach it as they do in her land i still urged i teach it what am i to teach a child you would be its mother i answered and what is a mother to teach a solitary little outcast thing, as you suggest? Children need the teaching of many women, and the society of many children, for right growth. Also, they need a social environment, not an island. You see, dear, she went on after a little, in her land everything teaches. The child sees love and order and peace and comfort and wisdom everywhere no child alone could grow up so so richly endowed and as to these countries i have seen these cities of abomination i would die childless rather than to bear a child in this world of yours in her land to say i would die childless is somewhat equivalent to our saying i would suffer eternal damnation it is the worst deprivation they can think of you are going to leave me, I cried. It burst upon me with sudden bitterness. She was not mine. She was a woman of her land, and her heavenly country, her still clear hope of motherhood, 
were more to her than life in our land with me. What had I to offer her that was comparable to that upland paradise? She came to me then and took me in her arms, strong, tender, loving arms, and gave me one of her rare kisses. I'm going to stay with you, my husband, as long as I live, if you want me. Is there anything to prevent your coming back to her land? As a matter of fact, there was really nothing to prevent it, nothing I might leave behind which would cost me the pain her exile was costing her, and especially nothing which could compensate for losing my wife. We began to discuss it with eager interest. I don't mean to forsake this poor world, she assured me. We can come back again. Later, much later. My mind is full of great things that can be done here, and I want to get all the wisdom of her land at work to help. But let us go back now, while we are young, and before this black, stupid confusion has, has hurt me any worse. Perhaps it is no harm that I have suffered so. Perhaps our child will have a heart that aches for all the world, and will do more than any of us to help it especially if it is a boy. Do you want a boy, darling? Oh, do I not? Just think, none of us ever in these two thousand years has had one. If we in her land can begin a new kind of men. What do you want of them, I said, teasingly. Surely you women alone have accomplished all that the world needs, haven't you? Indeed, no, Van, we haven't begun. Ours is only a, a sample, a little bit of a local exhibit. If what we have done is the right thing, then it becomes our clearest duty to spread it to all the world. Such a new life as you have opened to us, Van, you splendid man. Splendid man. Splendid. I thought you thought we were to blame for all the misery in the world. Just look at the harm we've done. Just look at the good you've done, too. Why, my darling, the harm you have done is merely the result of your misunderstanding and misuse of sex. And the good you have done is the result of the humanness of you, the big noble humanness that has grown and grown, that has built and lifted and taught the world in spite of all the dragging evil. Why, dear, when I see the courage, the perseverance, the persistent growth you men have shown, cumbered as you have been from the beginning by the fruits of your mistakes, it seems as if you were almost more than human. I was rather stunned by this. No man who had seen her land and then come back to our tangled foolishness, waste and pain, could be proud of his man-made world. No man who had solidly grasped the biological facts as to the initial use of his sex and his incredible misuse of it, could help the further shame for the anomalous position of the human male, completely mistaken and producing a constant train of evils. I could see it all plainly enough, and now to have her talk like this. Remember, dear, that men never meant to do it, or any part of it, she tenderly explained. The trouble evidently began when nobody knew much. It became an ironclad custom, even before religion took it up, and law. Remember, too, that the women haven't died. They are here yet in equal numbers. Also, even the unjust restrictions have saved them from a great deal of suffering which the men met, and then nothing could rob them of their inheritance. Every step the men really made upward lifted the women, too. And don't forget love, ever. That has lived and triumphed even through all the lust and slavery and shame. I felt comforted, relieved. Besides, she went on, you men ought to feel proud of the real world work you have done, even crippled as you were by your own excessive sex and by those poor dragging dead weights of women you had manufactured. In spite of it all, you have invented and discovered and built and adorned the world. You have things as far along as we have, even some things better, and many sciences and crafts we know nothing about. And you've done it alone, just men. It's wonderful. 
In spite of all the kindness and honest recognition she showed, I could not help a feeling of inner resentment at this tone. Of course, we three men had been constantly impressed with all that they had done in her land, just women alone. But that she thought it equally wonderful for men to do it was not wholly gratifying. She went on serenely. We had such advantages, you see. Being women, we had all the constructive and organizing tendencies of motherhood to urge us on, and having no men, we missed all that greediness and quarreling your history is so sadly full of. Also, being isolated, we could just grow, like a sequoia in a sheltered mountain glade. But you men in this mixed big world of yours, in horrid confusion of mind and long ignorance, with all those awful religions to mix you up and hold you back, and with so little real happiness. Still, you have built the world. Man, dear, it shows how much stronger humanity is than sex, even in men. All that I have had to learn, you see, for we make no distinction at home. Women are people, and people are women. At first I thought of men just as males. A Herlander would, you know. Now I know that men are people too, just as much as women are. And it is as one person to another that I feel this big love for you, Van. You are so nice to live with. You are such good company. I never get tired of you. I like to play with you and to work with you. I admire and enjoy the way you do things. And when we sit down quietly near together, it makes me so happy, Van. There were still a few big rubies in that once fat little bag she so wisely brought with her. We made careful plans, which included my taking a set of thorough lessons in aviation and mechanics. There must be no accidents on this trip. By a previous steamer, we sent the well-fitted motorboat that should carry us and our dissembled aeroplane up that long river. Of baggage, little could be carried, and that little on Elidor's part consisted largely of her mass of notes, all most carefully compressed, and done on the finest and lightest paper. She also urged that we take with us the lightest and newest of encyclopedias. We can leave it in the boat if necessary, and make a separate trip, she suggested. Also photographs she took, and a moving picture outfit with well-selected films. We can make them, I'm sure, she said, but this one will do to illustrate. It did. After all, her requirements did not weigh more than the third passenger whom we might have carried. The river trip was a growing joy. Day after day of swift gliding through those dark, drooping forests and wide, reedy flats, and when at last we shot out upon that shining silver of that hidden lake, and she saw above her the heights of her land, my calm goddess trembled and cried, stretching her arms to it like a child to its mother. But we set swiftly to work on our aeroplane, putting it all soundly together and fastening in the baggage, and then sealed up the tight-sheathed boat like a trim cocoon. Then the purr of our propeller, the long skating slide on the water, and up and up, in a widening spiral, Elidor breathless, holding fast to the supports, till we topped the rocky rim, rose above the forest, her forest, and sailed out over the serene expanse of that fair land. Oh, let's look, she begged, let's look at the whole of it first. It's the whole of it that I love. So we swept in a great circle above, as one might sweep over Holland, the green fields, blossoming gardens, and dark woods, spread like a model of heaven below us, and the cities, the villages, how well I remembered them in their scattered loveliness, rich in color, beautiful in design, everywhere fringed and shaded by clean trees, lit and cheered by bright water, radiant with flowers. She leaned forward like a young mother over her sleeping child, tender, proud, gloating. No smoke, she murmured, no brutal noise, no wickedness, no disease. Almost no accidents or sickness. Almost none. This in a whisper, as if she were apologizing for some faint blemish on the child. Beauty, she breathed. Beauty, beauty everywhere. 
Oh, I had forgotten how beautiful it was. So had I. When I first saw it, I was still too accustomed to our common ugliness to really appreciate this loveliness. When we had swung back to the town where we had lived most, and made our smooth descent in a daisied meadow, there were many to meet us with my well-remembered Somal, and first and most eager Jeff and Celis with their baby. Elidor seized upon it as eagerly as her gentle tenderness would allow, with reverent kisses for the little hands, the rosy feet. She caught Celis to her arms and held her close. She even kissed Jeff, which he apparently liked, and nobody else minded. And then, well, if you live in a country of about three million inhabitants and love them all, if you have been an envoy extraordinary, very extraordinary indeed, to a far-off, unknown world, and have come back unexpectedly, why, your hands are pretty full for a while. We settled back into the smooth-running herland life without a ripple. No trouble about housing, they had always a certain percentage of vacancies to allow for freedom of movement. No trouble about clothes, those perfect garments were to be had everywhere, always lovely and suitable. No trouble about food, that smooth, well-adjusted food supply was available wherever we went. No appeals for deserving charity, no need of them, nothing to annoy and depress, everything to give comfort and strength. And under all, more perceptible to me now than before, that vast, steady, on-moving current of definite purpose, planning and working to make good, better, and better, best. The atmosphere in the world behind us is that of a thousand mixed currents, pushing and pulling in every direction, controverting and opposing one another. Here was peace, and power, with accomplishment. Eagerly, she returned to her people. With passionate enthusiasm, she poured out in wide tours of lecturing and in print her report of world conditions. She saw it taken up, studied, discussed by those great-minded overmothers of the land. She saw the young women, earnest-eyed, of boundless hope and high purpose, planning, as eager missionaries plan, what they could do to spread to all the world their proven gains. Reprints of that encyclopedia were scattered to every corner of the land and read swiftly, eagerly, to crowding groups of listeners. There began to stir in her land a new spirit, pushing, seeking a new sense of responsibility, a larger duty. It is not enough, they said, that we should be so happy. Here is the whole round world, millions and hundreds of millions of people, and all their babies. Not in a thousand years will we rest till the world is happy. And to this end, they began to plan, slowly, wisely, calmly, making no haste, sure above all that they must preserve their own integrity and peace if they were to help others. When Elidor had done her utmost, given all that she had gathered and seen the great work growing, she turned to me with a long, happy sigh. Let's go to the forest, she said, and we went. We went to the rock where I had first landed, and she showed me where three laughing girls had been hidden. We went to the tree where they had slipped away like quicksilver. We went to a far-off, quiet place she knew, a place of huge trees heavy with good fruit, of smooth, mossy banks, of quiet pools and tinkling fountains. Here, unexpected, was a little forester house, still and clean, with tall flowers looking in at the windows. I used to love this best of all, she said. Look, you can see both ways. It was on a high knoll, and through the great boughs a long vista opened up to a bright sunlight in the fields below. The other side was a surprise. The land dropped suddenly, fell to a rocky brink, and ended. Dark and mysterious, far beyond, in a horizon-sweeping gloom of crowding jungle, lay the world. I always wanted to see, to know, to help, she said. Dear, you have brought me so much. Not only love, but the great new spread of life, of work to do for all humanity. 
And then, the other new hope, too. Perhaps, perhaps a son. And in due time, a son was born to us. The End End of chapter 12 End of With Her in Our Land by Charlotte Perkins Gilman